Section One of Stories from the Detectives Album. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirsty. Stories from the Detectives Album by Wife Wonder, also known as Mary Fortune. The Window Among the Willows. I was going down Swanston Street the other day in rather a meditative mood when I fell in with two of my mates, whose names it is unnecessary to particularise, for two very good reasons. One of them being that not one out of five hundred readers of this journal cares a jot about either detectives or their appellations, and the other that the odd few who do care can easily pick out the individuals from the conversation I am about to record. Hello, here he is himself, cried a small dark chap with a jockey-like appearance about him and his sentiments were echoed by a fair customer with the air of an exquisite, and a drawl, the very man, which showed that I had been forming the topic of conversation between them at no distant date. Well, is there anything wonderful in that fact? I growled sulkily, for I am a suspicious-minded individual, and I could see that the gentleman had something disagreeable to say, that is to say, something they thought would be disagreeable to me, and that they consequently enjoyed in anticipation oh no only we happen to have a little argument about you just now is it true that you have sent in your resignation sinclair quite true i replied was it about that fact you were arguing no it was about the reasons of your doing it some of the chaps say that you didn't resign at all said the free and easy looking little jockey chap i may as well call connell but that you were uh sapped in short put in the exquisite with an inane grin that he meant as a smile, to show some fearful big teeth, of which he is notoriously proud, God help him. "'It's not true, is it?' persisted Connell. "'What isn't true?' I asked. "'That you got the... uh... that you were recommended to send in your resignation.' "'Will you kindly inform me, gentlemen,' I inquired, with my grandest air, "'what I was supposed to have got, what long jaws there elegantly terms the sack.' oh put in connell quickly for he saw i was getting riled nothing to your discredit sinclair only you know they found out that you are the chap that's writing the d stories for a certain journal and you know it's against the rules of the service policemen are not allowed to have anything to do with the press policemen be blowed said i emphatically and i'm blessed glad i'm nearly done with it and now to satisfy your kindly curiosity of course all on my behalf let me inform you that I have not got the sack, that I resign entirely of my own behalf, and, to go a little further, as it will save me advertising, I'll tell you what I'm resigning for. I'm resigning because I'm quite independent, and because I think it's high time for me to try and get into decent society. Oh, bother, said, after all, good-natured Connell. Don't be so sarcastic, Mark. I'm sure we all wish you well. But we're not aristocratic enough for him, sneered the man with the teeth as he wrapped his left arm with his short cane and turned his ring finger out as he was doing it the fact of it is connell that sinclair is afraid he'll lose his laurels we're getting too literary for him he doesn't like opposition on his own benches if yours is a specimen of the ability in opposition to me i said turning round on him sharply little wonder i'd be afraid of it but let me advise you to shut your big mouth as far as i'm concerned for I know a grand receipt for wearing down big teeth, and that is, to set em chewing words, and by George I'll make you eat yours, ay, and swallow them, if I hear them in any way reflecting on either me or my business. Connell, I wish you'd drop down to my place this evening. I want to speak to you. You see how tetchy I'm getting in my old days, but I was always a little inclined that way. In this case I had, however, a reasonable excuse. This exquisite you will know as Slayton, had been a perfect nuisance to me ever since he, by some not-to-be-understood means, got into the force. His small mind was capable of little else than an idea of his own unapproachable personal appearance and the extraordinary value it gave him in the eyes of the fair and foolish sex. But the little else it was capable of seemed to be a jealousy of my superior position in the service, and any success I might have had as a contributor to the detective's album. He lost no occasion of trying to sneer at me, and being so stupid as to be nearly impenetrable, he never knew when he was insulted, 
and so went on his way rejoicing however matters might end however i was vexed at myself for having permitted my temper to get the better of me on this occasion not on his account but on connell's i needed his advice or assistance as it happened and was afraid he might have taken offence enough not to come as i had requested him on leaving abruptly connell did come however but before i go any farther i had better tell you what the affair i had in hand was my private residence at the time i speak of which is not very long ago after all was a suburban cottage in which my bedroom was at a back corner with one window looking into a little plot of garden and the other at right angles with it toward the yard from both of these windows combined i had if i so wished an excellent opportunity of watching the doings of a goodly number of my neighbours but as curiosity is not my failing they might have been all dead without my being one bit the wiser unless indeed there had been something wrong about the manner of decease when i might have been called on professionally but as i lay in bed there was one tenement that forced itself on me as it were since it loomed up to three stories in height within about sixty yards of me and had a splendid willow tree growing and flourishing so beautifully close to its back windows that i could not look out without being attracted by the greenery and gracefulness of the said willow i used to lie and watch that tree on a breezy morning or evening with inexpressible delight and with greater still when a strong wind tossed its pendant branches about in wild confusion then it was that i was so reminded of swinburne's as the wings and tresses of the wind are scattered and shaken as well as began to take an interest in the only window that i could see among the quiescent branches and that was hidden or exposed alternately when the tresses of the wind were scattered and shaken this window was on the second story and had a green venetian blind on the inside as i said before it would in all probability have remained unnoticed by me only for the big willow tree but once my attention was drawn to it it was kept there by several unusual circumstances in the first place the venetian blind was sometimes drawn up to the very top and sometimes half mast high only then again it would remain down altogether for days together i observed too that the window was never clear or bright looking and hence concluded that the room was not occupied by a person of particular habits beginning to think more about this window than was good for me i got to lying awake at nights to watch if its light made its appearance at abnormal hours the movements of the light were the same as those of the blind erratic it would at times shine in dim lines through the lowered venetians and sometimes when all was darkness and at midnight the light would appear at the as suddenly uncovered window and only remain long enough to be seen ere it was again extinguished in short a perfect code of signals appeared to be established with that light and that blind well when connell came that evening i told him all i have told you and he said of course they're signals and i'm sure you didn't leave it at that i should say from the look of the window it was a servant's room and of course she's making signals to her bloke don't be so coarse i said it's nothing of the kind i found out that the house is a sort of private boarding place and the room is one of dr ammon's what that disreputable old villain there you are again the man drinks more than is good for him i suppose but no one denies his ability in his profession now sinclair what is the use of talking like that just out of simple contradiction you know well that he's been in some dirty cases that would have been bad for him only he managed to wriggle out of them somehow if he's in the room you may depend there's some devilment abroad but i'd like to know one thing what are you getting me into it for you used to be rather over fond of working out your own cases single-handed well i'll tell you the plain fact if i enter on this it will drag me into the thing again and i don't want it i expect my discharge now in a few days and i don't want to get into any fresh cases if i can help it oh you want to shake the dust off your feet at once and cut the connection entirely well all right i'll do anything you think best but have you found out who annan's making these signals to no we don't know if it's annan at all confound you and without going up to the window we cannot be certain what windows are within view of it you see that tree is so abominably in the way the tree is delightful i could climb up that tree and see in that window with the greatest ease in life and i'll do it too why the top of the wall is right under it send i may live mark but you're getting too old for a debt 
or you would have been up in that tree before now. But, at all events, now I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll stop here with you all night and have a look at old Annan's window. And I only hope I'll catch him at something that will hang him, for he richly deserves it. Come on and have a stroll, Connell, said I. There's an old friend of mine a bit up the road there that I make a point to inquire for every night. We used to have pleasant evenings before he was laid up. I think he is one of the best chess players I ever played with. What's the matter with him? asked Connell, as he lit a cigar when we were fairly out of my gate. None of the doctors can tell. They've had seven or eight, but it seems that the symptoms baffle them all, being something quite out of the common line. They ought to have it Annan, Connell remarked, with a laugh. He'd settle it in five minutes. He has attended Mr. Leland, I replied, but was quite as puzzled as the rest. Leland? Did you say Leland? Yes, that's my friend's name. Poor old man, I fear our last game of chess is played. Is there a place called Edenthorpe Cottage? Yes. Why? Why, that's the identical place where Slayton is hanging up his hat. There's an only daughter there, isn't there? And she's bound to have the old chap's sugar, eh? Of all the fellows to talk slang, Connell, I'll give the palm to you, I replied. But indeed, in this instance, you're wrong. Minnie Leland is scarcely more than a child. Why, I don't believe she's sixteen. At all events, she's old enough to fancy herself spoony on Slayton. I tell you it's true. You needn't be opening your eyes at me that way. I thought you knew Slayton better than to believe half of what he says, was my remark. And I can tell you he's been lying in this instance. It would be impossible for Slayton to be visiting there without me knowing it. Leland would tell me at once, especially as the fellow is one of us. How can the man tell you when he doesn't know himself? They're doing it on the sly. Slayton did speak to the old man some time ago, I believe, but he was dead set against him, and now he's made it all right with the girl. They're to be married as soon as the governor croaks. It was useless to try and keep Connell off the slang. Besides, I was too deeply cut up to try. I knew that poor Leland was deeply anxious about his girl, but that he had the fullest belief in her innocence and obedience. What a blow this would be to him in his last hours should I feel it my duty to disclose it. Connell read my thoughts pretty well, for before I had time to think, he burst out with, Look here now, Sinclair. If you go splitting on me about this, I'll never forgive you. See what a row you'll get me into with Slayton, and hang it, no decent chap would go splitting on a mate. No decent chap would have a mate who could be guilty of such dirty action as you tell me Slayton's planning. To take advantage of a poor, silly, motherless child, with no one to watch over her save a dying father, is a vile act. Oh, well, cried my excitable mate, as he tossed away the remains of his cigar. I'm sorry I spoke at all, but you'll get me no farther into it, I'll tell you. And so, so long. And without more to do, he turned on his heel and left me to manage my own affairs as pleased myself. We were just in front of Leland's cottage as I stood and looked after Connell, with some intention of calling him back and promising not to tell about Slayton. But, remembering poor Leland's illness and helplessness, and the perfect trust I was aware he had in me, I felt I should be doing both him and the girl a grievous wrong by making any such promise, and so I stood and saw the last of Connell as he turned the corner just under my interesting willow tree, and then I noticed that from where I was the window among the branches was also visible. At the moment the fact made little impression on me, however, and I turned into the little garden and knocked at the door. It was opened by an elderly woman, who had been working housekeeper for Leland ever since his wife's death. She was a woman I had never liked, yet I had no reason for my down on her, save that she had a treacherous expression of countenance, and, at times, a disagreeable manner. She was called Mrs. Knox, and I understood her to be a widow, and a childless one. To my inquiries about her master, she replied that he was much better, and that he wished to see me when I called. Of course I went in and found my old friend propped up in bed with pillows, and looking so ghastly that I believed the woman had lied in saying he was better. His own words, however, confirmed hers, as I pressed his thin hand in mine. "'I've been longing to see you, Sinclair,' he said. "'I am so very much better that I feel able to discuss some matters I am anxious about with you. I shall cheat those rascally doctors yet.' He said it with a smile, but my heart sank for he looked like death as he said it. "'I hope so,' I replied. "'Which of them have you had to-day?' "'Dr. Annan. 
I hate that man, he added with such energy that a faint flush appeared in his hollow cheeks. I know I should not feel so, but I almost fear I shall never forgive him his detestable proposal about a month ago. What was that? I asked. I didn't tell you, for the subject was so utterly hateful to me. You know how long he has been attending in conjunction with T. Well, I requested that his bill might be made out, as he acknowledged he did not at all understand my case. He told me very coolly that the bill would be a heavy one, but that he would entirely forego payment if I would agree to a proposal he was about to make me. And that was? And that was that my body should be handed over to him for an investigation in what he was pleased to call the interests of medical science after my death. Now, Sinclair, if there has been during all my life one thing I have had more horror of than I can explain, it was the idea of a post-mortem, the idea of being cut up by the careless knife of an unfeeling wretch who must one day become a corpse himself has something so horrible to me in it that I believe I should not lie in my grave if it were desecrated with my body being placed in it after being disgraced with the saw and scalpel. He shuddered as he contemplated his own picture, and looked so faint that I hastened to try and compose his mind. If you had told me this long ago, Lelland, I said, I could have relieved your mind. You may be sure that while I live, no such fear need affect you. Thank God you are better. But should anything happen in my time, I promise to you that no rough hand shall touch your body. I will see to that. Thank you, my dear fellow. I have been afraid to speak of the foolish feeling. I thought you would laugh at me. Not I. There are many who have the same feeling, and don't care to acknowledge it. I stopped a good while with my friend, and among other things, he told me that he had made a will some time previous, and that he had appointed me one of the trustees as well as Minnie's guardian during her minority. That information decided me on leaving him in ignorance of the girl's folly, for in any case I would be able to prevent Slayton's plan from being a success. As it happened, however, I met the girl herself entering the gate just as I was leaving it, and determined not to lose the opportunity of giving her a hint. Minnie Lelland was a pretty, silly girl, with the usual girl's opinion of herself, yet a real affection for her father. She ran to me at once and took my hand. "'How do you think Papa is to-night, Mr. Sinclair? He was so much better this morning that he wanted to get up. Only the doctor wouldn't hear of it.' "'He says himself he's much better, Minnie. But I don't think he is. I never saw him look so bad. But he's in excellent spirits. I'm glad I met you, as I have something very particular to say to you. I dare say the girl read something accusing in my eyes, for her own fell and her face flushed up to her hat. "'Are you aware, Minnie, that your father has made me your guardian in the event of his death?' "'Yes. Pa told me,' she replied in a low voice, but without raising her eyes. "'Well, I didn't know until a little ago, and I'm glad he has told you, for I do not want to distress your poor father, for whom I have always had a sincere friendship, and who has been such a good father to you. Now that I know, and you know that I have some sort of right. I must warn you that you are doing a very foolish thing in keeping up any clandestine intercourse with Slayton. I never. I didn't. Now, don't tell a lie about it, Minnie, for it will do no good. I know all about it, and I'll put a stop to it. Slayton is quite unworthy of you, and wouldn't look at, much less speak to you, only that he thinks you will have money. He would throw you over tomorrow if he did not believe that your poor father's death would leave you well off. "'I think you wrong him, Mr. Sinclair,' she said, plucking up courage in defence of her own charms. "'I know I don't, Minnie, but now I've said all I have to say, and I can prove what I've said, unfortunately. For indeed, my girl, I am sorry to say your father's position, as regards money matters, is very far from being as comfortable a one as people fancy.' And then I went away and left her. I had only told the girl the truth about my poor friend's affairs. His long and strange illness had cost a small fortune, and he himself feared that when affairs were wound up there would be but a small provision for his child should he be taken away from her. I thought of it a good deal when I got home, and, between Lelland's affairs and my mate Connell's desertion, 
I was so upset that the idea of sleep was quite out of the question. It was a still and warm night, so I sat long at the open window of my room, until I saw the light make its appearance at that other window in which I was so much interested. All at once it struck me that I had noticed that window among the willows from Leland's place, and goodness knows what idea came into my head to go out again and see if by any possibility there was any communication between my friend's and Dr. Annan's window. Some horrible recollection of what Leland had told me about Annan's proposal put some thoughts into my head that kept there in spite of me, and I got up and put on my hat, determined to have a spy around on my own account, in default of Connell's help. I had smoked and read and thought away a few hours, and it was late when I slipped open my private door and gained the right of way at the back. As I neared Leland's, I heard the whistle of the last train just coming into the station, and to my astonishment, right under the street lamp, a man vaulted over the low garden fence and dashed down the lane like a madman, evidently on the run to catch the return train to town. I saw his face full in the light and recognised Slayton, so you may guess my annoyance at discovering that at such an hour he paid clandestine visits, doubtless to the silly child Minnie. I went round the premises, but not a chink of light was to be seen anywhere. Had it not been for the evidence of my own eyes, I might have believed that every inmate of the house was buried in the most profound and innocent repose. I had half a mind to seek an entrance at the instant, but when I remembered that much might depend on my poor friend's undisturbed rest, I turned my back and went home. The first thing I do in the morning is to tell Leland, I thought. The girl is not to be trusted, but surely a decided command from her father, and he in a dying condition too, would have a decided effect. And so I went to bed at last, leaving still the light burning in that window up among the willows. As soon as I rose on the following morning, and without waiting for any breakfast, I went over again to Leland's. I made my way round by the back, and was early enough to find the woman, Mrs. Knox, only just kindling the kitchen fire as I stood on the threshold. The first strange observation I made was that a lamp with a clear glass globe was burning close against the little window, and involuntarily I looked back toward the willow window to find it was really within view of Leland's kitchen, and, of course, of the light in the window of it. Some little noise I made had attracted the woman, and as I turned toward her again, she had raised herself from the fire, and was making a grab at the lamp. "'You're an early visitor, sir,' she said, in no pleasant tones, and as if she resented the intrusion on her premises. "'Of course there's no one up yet but myself.' "'I came to see you especially, my good woman,' I said, "'and as soon as you put out that lamp, which you are burning at a very strange time, I'll trouble you to attend to me for a minute or two. "'I had a job with the fire this morning.' she observed sulkily, as she blew out the flames, and thought I wouldn't have a match left, so I lit the lamp. Ah, was it by any chance in here that Miss Minnie had the interview with a young man near midnight last night? She stared at me, and her face grew red and angry, but I'd give her a chance to say a word. I saw a man I am acquainted with jumping over that fence last night, and I'm quite certain that he couldn't have had an interview with your master's daughter unknown to you. I'm certain you're conniving at this, and I came here especially this morning to tell you that you ought to be ashamed of yourself, and you, the only woman the girl has about her. I mean to tell my friend Lelan this morning all about it, and if it is as I suspect, I promise you that your place here will be empty before tonight. The woman's face grew red with anger, and if she had followed her inclination, she would doubtless have abused me soundly. As it was, she knew where her interests lay and controlled herself. "'It would be very hard on me, sir, to put me out of work, of making an honest living. It's not my fault that Miss Minnie is headstrong and unbiddable. Besides, she is mistress here, and I am only the servant. I would not condescend to bandy words with the creature, and not wishing to disturb my poor friend so early, I turned on my heel and went out, and then I took it into my head to speak to Slayton himself.' I had such a poor opinion of his character as firmly believed that, the instant he believed the girl Minnie penniless, he would drop her, though it should break the silly girl's heart. So when I had transacted some necessary business of my own, I went into town. It was about ten o'clock when I reached the office, 
and the first man I encountered was Slayton himself. He looked at me rather strangely, and consciously, I thought. Of course, I concluded that Connell had confessed to having told on him. Slayton, I have a word to say to you, I said. All right, old fellow, he replied, with an attempt at his usual drawl. But he was evidently ill at ease. He was going to the city court, and I walked with him, beginning to say what I had to say at once, and without circumlocution. I have become aware of your conduct as regards Minnie Leland, and saw you leaving the place last night at nearly midnight. Now, Slayton, my opinion of you is so poor that I believe if you were aware of the girl's position you would drop it at once. What position? he asked, turning round quickly and looking at me with uncommon sharpness for him. You fancy she will be her father's heiress at his death. So she will, but she will not inherit fifty pounds. Mr. Lelland is deeply involved in consequence of his long illness, and should he unhappily succumb to it, which there is, I am sorry to say, every probability that he will, there will not be more for the girl than will pay a premium for apprenticing her to some trade. How do you know all this so very particularly? he inquired with a sneer. You haven't by any chance a sneaking regard that way yourself. One more word in that style and I'll knock you down, I said between my teeth but I have an object to accomplish in giving you the information you asked for. I know all this because I have gone over Mr. Lelland's accounts with him, because I have seen his will, because I am appointed the girl's guardian and one of the trustees to the will. Slayton muttered an oath loud enough to attract the attention of the passers-by, and then, turning on his tracks, evidently to rid himself of me, he left me to go on my way alone. I had no duty on hand, and returned with the purpose of seeing how Lelland was. I went to his cottage straight, without waiting to go home, and entered by the back way with the double purpose of sparing my friend the noise of an application at the front door, and of seeing what Mrs. Knox was about. Picture to yourself my dismay and distress, when I was met by the woman rushing out with a startling intelligence that Mr. Lelland was dead, and that his wretched daughter had disappeared from her house. Oh, Mr. Sinclair, when I went into the room with his tea this morning, he was dead, and Miss Minnie had never been in bed. She must have gone in the night. I went down to your place, sir, for I didn't know what to do, but you were not at home. Without a word I passed her, and entered the chamber of my lost friend. It was still darkened, as when he had closed his eyes in his last sleep. I had to draw up the blind before I could trace the outline of the faded form lying stilly in his bed. He lay like a sleeping child, one hand under his white, sunken cheek, and a contented smile on his thin lips. Thank God for that at least, I thought. If he had known of his miserable girl's folly, he would have died in bitterness of heart instead of with the pleasant smile of content and peace. I drew the sheet over the dead face and went out. Under the circumstances, I could not blame the woman Knox for not having interfered, but I immediately took all necessary steps, uneasy as I was about the unhappy child Minnie. Remembering my poor old friend's horror of his body being interfered with, I would not leave him until he lay in his coffin. When that was accomplished, I went away to search for the poor child, to look her last upon her father's dead face. And where should I search for her? Where, but by watching or threatening that villain Slayton? But fortune favoured me. I took a short cut through the gardens, and, not sorry to have a quiet opportunity of thinking in the coolness and quiet, I sat down on a seat under a tree and filled my pipe. It was now evening, and pleasant shadows were lying on the grass under the great old trees, for ours is no highly cultivated and carefully tented gardens, but an enclosure from the original bush, with the young plantation springing among the rough grass. I had not been many moments sitting there when voices seemed nearing me, and I started to my feet, for I fancied I had recognised Slayton's drawl. Drawing back behind the bowl of the tree, I stood and listened. Presently, along the untended walk came two figures, Minnie Leland leaning on the arm of Slayton. Even as I looked, he stopped, and drawing his arm from the clinging clasp of the poor girl, assumed a sharp manner I had not deemed him capable of. "'Now, I've got something to say to you, Miss Leland,' he began, without the suspicion of a drawl. "'I've brought you out here where none of the women at that house could hear. 
and, besides, the landlady decidedly refuses to harbour you. I could see the poor child's face grow white in the fading light as she stared at Slayton with eyes distended with horror. "'What do you mean, Charles? Oh, what are you saying?' "'I'll soon tell you what I mean. I mean you to go straight home to your dad again, and no blessed fuss about it. I've been most abominably taken in, miss. You led me to believe that you'd have a pot of money when your father died, and instead of that I understand he'll die a pauper.' Minnie's breath came in gasping sobs as she clasped her trembling hands and fell against the tree behind which I stood. "'You said—oh, Charles, you said we were to be married to-day.' "'It's a lucky job for me that we were not. Perhaps your friend Sinclair will take you in hand. And now, clear out.' The words were hardly out of his mouth when he was felled by a blow from my fist. "'Lie there, you cowardly villain,' I cried. "'And if you should never rise again, the world would be all the better of the loss, and then, taking Minnie by the arm, I led her sobbing home. For some time I let her shed her tears unrestrainedly, but at last, remembering how much greater cause she had to weep than she herself was aware of, I spoke to her. "'Minnie, stop crying,' I said. "'If you do not, you'll have no tears left to shed for a more bitter sorrow than the desertion of a scoundrel.' She dried her eyes and looked at me with terror. Doubtless a suspicion of the truth made the uncertainty terrible to her. "'Prepare yourself for a shock, girl,' I hastened to add. "'Your poor father lies in his coffin, and will never know how his child has disobeyed and dishonoured him.' Her wild outburst of remorse and grief at this intelligence was pitiful to witness, for, as I have said before, the unfortunate child really loved her father, nor had she ceased to sob and cry when we reached her home. No sooner had she, however, entered the house than the solemn silence that always seems to tell of the presence of death awed and silenced her, and it was with great reluctance that she followed me to her father's room. I, however, insisted upon her looking at the calm dead face, as I thought the sight might have a better effect upon the silly girl's future than twenty sermons. So, leaving her kneeling by the coffin which lay upon chairs, I closed the door behind me and went to see the undertaker. In order to fulfil my promise to the dead, I had determined to watch the body all night, and even to have the coffin closed before dark. I had got the doctor's certificate and taken every precaution, but man does not dispose of the events he plans. The full moon was just making her appearance as I hastened home for a snack, and when I returned, in, say, twenty minutes after, I saw emerging from the gate in a hurried and disordered manner, Minnie Leland. It was impossible not to see that the girl was almost wild, and full of some terrible purpose. What that purpose was, was only too evident. As soon as she reached the road, she turned down the path that led to the not distant Yarra, and with uncovered and dishevelled hair, flew down the moonlit road like a hunted fawn. As I sped after her, the thought presented itself to my mind of that detestable woman Knox, having said something to drive the girl to distraction and I thought a day of reckoning would occur between her and me before long. The thought did not lessen my speed, but the girl's speed far outstripped mine. Once I gained so on her that I could hear her hard panting breath, but as she doubtless also heard my pursuing footsteps, and seemed to gain fresh strength for her flight, she reached the river long before me, and disappeared from my sight. At that part of the Yarra the banks are steep, but worn into the descending paths by the feats of boys going to fish or bathe. The water here lay in the shadow of the bank, while in the centre of the stream patches of moonlight flickered on the moving water. I peered all around the margin of the river, but could see no moving object. I listened, but could hear no sound. What could I do? The poor girl could scarcely have flung herself from the bank without me hearing the sound, and she might have darted to the left to escape me, and seek a less steep part of the bank from which to take the fatal leap. As I skirted the river, in hopes of overtaking her, ere it was too late, I saw a little boat fastened to a stake on the bank, with, fortunately, a pair of skulls lying in the bottom. Under the circumstances, I felt no hesitation in making use of it, and rowed up and down until I had abandoned all hopes of saving the girl. Once I fancied I saw a floating garment, but it was only a patch of moonlight among the rushes so there was nothing for it but to report the matter to the police, and return to poor Leland. I did so, and when I reached the cottage once more, it was a late hour at night, or rather an early one in the morning. 
To my astonishment, the place was in utter darkness, and I had to grope my way into the kitchen and strike a match to examine into the state of matters. Fortunately, the lamp to which I had such an objection was still standing in the window, and lighting it, I set to examining the premises. There was no appearance of the woman Knox anywhere. Even in the room where she had slept, off the kitchen, not a vestige of her clothing remained. She had evidently cleared out for good. For what reason, it was easy to suspect. She had either driven poor Minnie to distraction and feared the consequences, or was guilty of some other heinous offence, the consequences of which she dreaded. What other offence had she been guilty of? Carrying the lamp in my hand, I went into the chamber of the dead. My first glance rested on the coffin, my next on some damp spots on the floor near it, which had evidently been lately scoured. What did this mean? My blood boiled as I feared that the circumstances had obliged me to be unfaithful to my promise to my dead friend. I had not been able to keep guard over his sacred remains. I was almost afraid to look into the coffin, dreading I knew not what. When I did raise the lamp over the dead face, I saw that it was covered with the linen face-cloth, just as it had been when I uncovered it for Minnie to see once more her father's face, and that everything around the corpse looked as I had left it. My professional instincts were not, however, to be deceived, and perhaps the old Highland superstitious training was, as I grew older, asserting itself. At all events, as I uncovered my dead friend's face, I saw that the peaceful smile with which he had stepped into death was gone, and that in its place was an expression of intense pain, as though of an agony too great for endurance. I flashed the light to and fro over the dead face in hopes that the shadows were deceiving me, but no, the pained look was in the dead face yet. But as I drew the lamp back, the light flashed upon something that sparkled and shimmered like a diamond. It was a diamond. In the folds of the winding sheet lay a gold sleeve link, with a rose diamond sparkling in its centre. I examined it closely, and found upon the plain back of the stud the initials S.A. With a sudden impulse of suspicion, I drew back the linen sheet that shrouded the rigid form, and then the white shirt that lay so quietly over the still breast. The still breast! There was down the quiet bosom the mark of the sore and scalpel, a livid mark and a great wheel, where horrid stitches, coarsely and carelessly put in, made my heart sore as I looked. I had seen many post-mortems, and assisted at them, ay, and used sore and scalpel myself when a drunken doctor was too nervous to use them himself. But it was not upon the body of a friend whom I had loved as a father. What was it that made me suspect more of evil? It was that the poor dead chest lay lower than it ought to do, and that a large cloth had been laid over it to fill up the space. I felt like a man demented for the moment, and seizing the undertaker's screwdriver and screws, which lay on the mantelpiece, I hastily screwed down the coffin lid, and locking all the doors, went in search of Dr. Annan. I knew that his name was Samuel. He had been in too many police cases in which I had been engaged for me to make a mistake about that. What was I to do? It was too late to get out a search warrant, but on the track of Dr. Annan I must go. As I left the death-stricken premises, I could not help thinking of the once happy girl who used to make the cottage merry with her lively and loving ways, and of the old friend in whose society I took such infinite pleasure. One was now, in all probability, lying in the cold waters of the Yarra, and the other lay in his coffin, desecrated by a fiend in human form, and deserted by the very woman whom he had rescued from poverty and disgrace. It seemed hard to leave him there alone in the deserted home, but my errand was to avenge him. I wonder if, as we grow old, we grow more hardened and yet more impressible. I wonder if, as our years accumulate, we feel the griefs we would have felt in our youth less acutely, and yet resent them more. Even at that hour in the night a subdued light gleamed in Dr. Annan's window. I saw the great willow tree waving its drooping branches in the night breeze, and with the now dipping moon laying flickering light upon its tremulous leaves, and a sudden remembrance of Connell's suggestion to climb up to that window presented itself. Well, it was true. I was not very young. Rheumatics and various troubles that remind us we have lost our youth afflicted me. But if I knew my own capabilities, I could climb that tree yet. 
Before ten minutes had elapsed, I was on the top of the wall. Before ten more, I was lodged in the branches of the willow. At first I dreaded that a dog might be on the premises and betray my presence, but after I had mounted to the level of Annan's window, I was satisfied that I had nothing to fear on that score. I presume that at his elevation the doctor had no fear of a spile. At all events, his window was uncurtained, and the Venetian blinds drawn up. Not only that, but it being a warm night, or perhaps from some other reason, the window-sash was partially lifted. My position was rather a precarious one, but I managed to secure it while I looked into the room in which I was interested. Dr. Annan was lying back in an armchair with his eyes closed and an unmistakable snore emanating from his open mouth and dilated nostrils. On the table at his hand was a bottle of brandy, nearly empty, and a glass with the remains of a cigar dropped into it. It was impossible not to see that the man had been following his usual course of self-indulgence and left the remains of his orgy upon the table. There was, however, the remains of something else upon the table that made my blood run cold, thinking, as I did, of the silent tenant of the deserted cottage at a little distance. It would ill become me to reveal to you the secrets of the dissecting room, but there were red spots upon the cuff of the shirt that covered an unclean hand hanging over the back of a chair where the drunken scientist sat. Nothing could have kept me out of that room after what I had seen. At the risk of my neck, I raised the sash and crawled in. Then I had a regular inspection of the room. My heart beat with the old professional ardour, and I was a detective once more. Nor had I, in this case, much trouble to sheet home an illegal offence, for on the stained cuff of Dr. Annan's shirt-sleeve glittered the fellow of the diamond stud I had found in Leland's coffin. I took him by the shoulder and shook him soundly. It was no easy matter to arouse him but when I had done so, he staggered to his feet, and casting one glance at the table, confronted me. "'Who the deuce are you?' he said hoarsely, for I dare say he was afraid of arousing the house, and bringing more witnesses of his crime. "'How did you get into my private apartments, and what do you want?' "'I got him by the window,' I answered, "'and I want you.' "'You impudent burglar,' he said. "'I have a good mind to—' to make a slash through my breastbone, otherwise my sternum, with that discoloured sore I see on the table there, and steal my heart out to examine it. He looked stunned for an instant, and seized the bottle, as if to throw it at me, but changing his mind, he raised it to his lips, and gurgled the contents down his throat. "'Now I'm ready for you,' he observed, with a chuckle of enjoyment. "'What do you want? And who the... blank... are you?' I have answered both these questions before, I replied, but as you are in a state of muddle, I will answer them again. I am Detective Sinclair, and I am here to arrest you for mutilating illegally and stealing portions of the body of George Lelland. Show me your authority, he said quickly, and trying to fasten the cuff from which he had lost the stud. Of course, if you have any right in such a matter, I will not dispute it. I held my detective card before him as I spoke. That is my authority, and now, Dr. Annan, I'll trouble you to come to the police office without any fuss. You are such a slippery eel, and have so often wriggled out of trouble before, that you may reasonably hope to do the same this time. Sinclair, I remember you now. Cannot this be condoned? was his next question. I am open to any arrangement. Will you give me the mate of this stud? I asked. I see you have it in your sleeve. Or will you bribe me by offering the return of my dead friend's mutilated remains? By the heavens above us, if I didn't hope to give you ten years, I'd pitch you out of that window like a dead dog. He saw I was in earnest then, and grew slightly pale. I beg of you not to expose me to the people of the house, he pleaded. I will go quietly with you. I can get out of the house without disturbing anyone. All right, I said. Proceed me, and I will lock the room until the police take it in charge. Meanwhile, give me that sleeve link. What sleeve link? I looked at his cuff, and lo, the stud had disappeared like magic. What had he done with it? He had never moved from the spot where he had first stood. Had he swallowed the convicting stud, or flung it out of the open window by which I had entered? All at once I saw the gleam of a diamond at the bottom of the glass bottle, and pounced upon it with delight. Ah, doctor, I said. 
the bottle has always been the ruin of you and in this instance i sincerely pray it may complete its work go on he said no more but went sulkily on before me down the staircase casting as we passed the bar door a longing look in that direction he made not a few appeals to me on the way to the police office but i need not say in vain of course this phase of affairs sadly interfered with poor Leland's burial and as some technicalities prevented annan's case being dealt with until a day had intervened i devoted the interim to tracing the woman knox Leland had taken her in almost a state of pauperism some two years before on the recommendation of a mrs gerald who lived in the neighbourhood to mrs gerald i first applied i know no more of the woman than you do mr sinclair she said in answer to my questions she used to come washing to my place and out of a charity i am now ashamed of i recommended her to mr Leland during mr Leland's illness and why are you now ashamed of it i inquired because i have heard something of her doings lately she has kept up an intimacy with a disreputable woman with whom she once lodged and has been so free with money that i think she cannot honestly have acquired it where is this woman you speak of now the woman knox lodged with strange to say she and her husband shifted hurriedly last evening some of the children stated they were going up country at all events they went along the camperdown road with their few household goods in a dray for i saw them from my window as they went you might have seen me flying along the camperdown road an hour after this conversation on the back of the best horse i could obtain i had little doubt but that knox was with these friends of hers and that all arrangements had been previously made between them doubtless they had a good start of me but i knew the habits of the class well once fancy themselves secure and they would in all probability camp and have a regular orgy my predictions were fulfilled sooner than I anticipated. I had started at about nine o'clock. At twelve I reached the Bringwood Hotel, near the crossing at Monk's Creek. I alighted and entered the bar, where a great disturbance was going on, which disturbance was caused by a rowdy-looking man with a face inflamed by drink and passion, refusing to be ejected. "'Who is that chap?' I asked the landlord, when he had succeeded in turning his troublesome customer out. Is he a regular customer of yours? Lord, bless you, no, sir. I'd never go for to treat a regular customer that way. They came here in a dray in the middle of the night and rousted me up for drink. They were free with their money and took a lot away with them. But all this morning he's been tormenting the very life out of me. They can't be far away, then. They're camped down about half a mile on the creek, my cowboy tells me, the man said. But that rowdy chap didn't seem disposed to give any information about it and how many were on the dray there were two women and two children and the man himself this was my party no doubt but i did not hurry myself to pursue them there was small probability indeed that they would make any further move while the man was in that condition and my horse wanted a rest and a feed in about an hour however i mounted again and rode toward the indicated spot near the creek some time before i reached it i saw the tilted dray and heard the bitter crying of children there was no other sound save the pleasant ones of running water and chattering birds and the rustling of summer dried grasses and i concluded that they were asleep and overcome by the liquor in which they had indulged while probably neglecting the poor terrified children on coming closer i dismounted to examine such a scene of disorder as my pen cannot adequately describe the tilted dray lay within a few yards of the creek with both shafts broken and a litter of boxes wearing apparel and household debris of all sorts scattered around it at a little distance where against a log a fire had evidently been made there were plates and tin billies and various remains of food and several broken and empty bottles it was here that two poor little children were sitting on the grass huddled together and crying bitterly the eldest was about eight and the other a couple of years younger they ceased sobbing on my approach and stared at me with wondering and terrified eyes most pitiful to see but there was only one other living being on the spot leaning against the log in a helpless sort of way was a woman she sat upon the grass with her hands lying on her lap and her back propped against the log her hair hung tangled and disordered on her neck and some stray locks were now and then blown across her face which was now pale and expressionless her eyes were fixed on the bank of the creek before her in a horrid stare 
without calculation or meaning. This frightful-looking object was the woman I was in search of, Mrs. Knox. I spoke to her, but received no reply. I shook her, but she took no notice. Her form swayed to and fro under my touch as helplessly as a lay figure. The woman was evidently an idiot. What could have occasioned this state of affairs? Drawing the eldest child toward me, I tried to gain the information from her. "'Where is your father?' I asked. "'Gone away with the horse, that way,' said the child, and the child pointed to the right of their camp. "'And what has become of your mother?' "'I don't know.' And here the poor thing burst into a fresh flood of tears. "'Father beat her last night, and we haven't seen her since.' "'Where did you sleep?' "'In the dray, and when we came out, Mrs. Knox wouldn't speak to us. She won't speak to us at all.' I looked into the dray, but there was nothing living there. A sort of lair among the household rubbish showed where the children had slept. What had become of the woman? What terrible tragedy had been enacted by this shady creek in the still hours of the night, during an orgy that might have been that of fiends? At this juncture, I saw a mounted policeman approaching. Having called at the hotel where I had rested, the landlord's information sent him on my track. This was a most fortunate circumstance for me, as it left me at liberty to return to my own case. My object in following this wretched woman was entirely frustrated by the condition in which I found her. She was quite incapable of giving evidence against Annan, whose accomplice she evidently was. I had hoped to terrify her into a confession, but I was disappointed. So, leaving her and the children to the constable in whose district they were, I rode back to town. It was dusk before I reached home, and I had called on passing the police station to inquire if anything had been discovered of poor Minnie Leland. There were no tidings of any kind, and quite jaded I went home for a little rest and refreshment. Dr. Annan's case was to be brought before the court on the following day, and I was very anxious about it. Leland's place containing the corpse was in charge of the police, and as I passed it I saw the constable pacing up and down in front. Having partially refreshed myself, I went up once more to Leland's cottage. As I approached the back door, I struck a match for the purpose of lighting a candle in the kitchen, and when I had done so, I saw a sight that actually made me fancy for a few moments that I dreamt. Lying upon the threshold of the door, with her arms under her head, as it lay despairingly against the unfeeling wood, was a female form. I knew at a glance that it was Minnie. "'Good heavens, Minnie!' I exclaimed. "'Is this really you?' She lifted herself up and looked at me with such a pitiful face as I never wish to again see on the face of youth. "'Yes, I've come home,' she said, "'and I want to get in.' "'You can't get in there, my poor girl,' I replied. "'Get up and come home with me. My housekeeper will take charge of you.' She obeyed listlessly, yet with a trembling lip, looking at the window of her father's room. She was afraid to ask the question, hovering on her lips and I thought it better she should not know. So she came home with me, and when she had been attended to by my old housekeeper, she told me her story. "'As soon as you had gone and left me with poor papa, Mrs. Knox came in and abused me. She told me that I had killed my father, and that she wondered how I dared stop there and look upon his dead face. I don't remember what else she said, but I knew she drove me mad, and I ran down to throw myself in the Yarra but when I got near the water, I thought of poor papa and how he had loved me, and how it would have grieved him to think his poor Minnie should do so wrong, and I sat down on the grass, far away from the water, so that I could not see it. I think I must have fallen asleep, but when I wakened, I felt that I must go home, no matter what Mrs. Knox would say. I thought I would tell you, and that you would send her away and look after me. I went in softly by the back gate, and seeing a light in Papa's window, and shadows upon the blind, I was afraid to go in. But I peeped under, where a bit of the window was open, and, oh, Mr. Sinclair, what I saw! It was some minutes before she was able to proceed, so overcome was the child by the memory of the scene. At last she collected herself, and went on. Dr. Annan was giving Mrs. Knox money, and they were laughing about the way they had managed some signals in the windows, it appeared that as soon as Papa died, Mrs. Knox was to let Dr. Annan know, 
oh mr sinclair i can't tell you dr annan had a parcel in his hand and oh 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 i could understand it all there was no need for the miserable girl to tell me more my heart was jubilant my case was assured the trial came on the following day the court was crowded the strange circumstances had become known and was loudly commented on i need not enter into technical particulars minnie's evidence was conclusive annan was sentenced to five years imprisonment the woman knox is at the present moment an inmate of the lunatic asylum a hopeless idiot she scarcely ever speaks and when she does it is to mutter the word murder there is no doubt that the man murdered his wife on that night they camped by the creek but the deep water keeps its secret well and the body has not been discovered the poor little ones were sent to the industrial schools and some weeks after a wandering horse near camperdown caused inquiry and search on part of the police it resulted in the discovery of the body of a man camped in a half-burned mia mia with his limbs charred and his clothes destroyed it was proved to be the man i had seen at the roadside hotel who had accidentally set himself on fire while in a drunken sleep slayton is no longer in our force his valuable services were dispensed with in consequence of his behaviour in the matter of minnie leland as well as other misdemeanours proved against him we do not miss him much I have now only to tell you of my ward. I am glad to say that there is every prospect of her turning out a good and useful woman. I have placed her at a highly recommended school, and look forward to her making a respectable and sensible match, the terrible lesson of her father's death having thoroughly sobered her. I often look up at the window among the willows, and while admiring the swaying foliage, recall the events I have just related to you. I have not yet received the discharge I applied for, and mounting pressure is being used to induce me to remain in the force after all it is a pleasant thing to have one's services appreciated i have been a long time in the force so i don't know how it may end end of story section two of stories from the detectives album this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirsty. Stories from the Detectives Album by Waif Wanda, also known as Mary Fortune. The Murder at the Creek. They sat in the cool shade of a broad limbed tree, in front of a pleasant homestead, a pair of as pretty maidens as Australia could produce each occupied a comfortable garden chair and each held between pretty delicate fingers some fragile feminine work i cannot do it marion cried the younger as she dropped the work to her lap and pushed a wealth of lovely hair back from her rosy cheeks with both plump hands it's all very well for a staid sober old maid like you cousin to sit quietly there after hearing such good news but i want to dance and the petite figure commenced a series of graceful gyrations on the soft grass while her pure muslin draperies floated around her pretty form like foam. Marion Ellingworth smiled as she lifted her soft brown eyes from her work and watched her gay cousin. With all of your delight at the prospect of a visit to town, Elsie dear, I doubt if the contemplation would be so pleasant had not Harry Lamborn also been going. What a tease you are, Marion. Of course I'm glad Harry's going. Why should I not? We've known Harry ever since we were children. Perhaps it was the exercise that flushed hotly fair Elsie's face as she ceased her waltz and tried to hide her face under a dainty bit of cambric in a feint of wiping her face. And then, catching a glimpse of Mr. Ellingworth riding toward the stables, she darted off to meet him, leaving her cousin alone. But Marion was not long alone. Scarcely was Elsie out of sight when a firm, elastic and well-known footstep on the gravel walk behind her brought the blood into sweet Marion Ellingworth's cheeks. She did not turn her head, but her heart beat quick, and her trembling fingers ill-performed their pretended office. "'How fortunate I am, dearest Marion, to find you alone!' The speaker was a tall and handsome young man, of fair complexion and a delicate cast of features. His tawny brown beard hid a throat white as snow, but, as he lifted his hat, 
you could see how fair was the complexion from the sunburned line across his forehead leaving as it did his brow under the wavy hair pure as a girl's there was a sweetness in his eyes seldom met with in those of a man and altogether percy cheltham impressed you as a young man of noble soul and handsome appearance yet with all of a delicacy of constitution in reality inherited from his english-born mother cousin elsie has just gone marion replied are you well percy you do not look well i am worried darling and was most anxious to see you he sat down beside her as he spoke and possessed himself of the small hand yielded so willingly to him and then he went on i have heard that mr ellingworth is going to take you all to town for a couple of months is this true marion my love quite true percy but who could have told you papa only told us this morning at breakfast it was john odgers he said i am sadly afraid my darling that mr ellingworth's sympathies are enlisted against me what indeed am i a poor struggling farmer that i should dare to compete with the wealthy melbourne merchant he said it bitterly yet as he gazed into the sympathetic eyes of fair marion his own filled with tears marion's gentle heart felt for the self-humiliation of the man of her choice and her hand fondly clasped his i will not allow you to depreciate yourself dear percy she said my father himself has sanctioned our affection and nothing can ever change my feelings towards you god bless you my marion but it drives me wild to see that odgers here and so trusted by mr ellingworth it is impossible for me not to see the great difference between us as it must appear in your father's eyes and i dread the temptation of wealth not for me percy no dear but for your father i have told you i will be faithful to you percy can you not trust me yes darling to death at this moment mr ellingworth himself came towards them with laughing elsie hanging on her uncle's arm and feeling that their private interview was over the lovers rose with one parting pressure of the hand and went to meet the others what a lovely evening cheltham you are going to join us at dinner i trust not this evening mr ellingworth i am sorry to deny myself the pleasure but i am on my way to cherry's where i have some little business to transact for my father well girls it is time for you to dress you do not look well my dear marion i do not think sitting so much out of doors is good for you after a few parting compliments had been exchanged percy walked down the grassy lawn toward the open road he was bitterly speculating if mr ellingworth had not rather objected to his daughter's companion in the open air than to the pleasant air of chesterton itself he had often felt his own poverty but never more than at that moment and the moment was not consequently a favourable one for an encounter with the rich melbourne merchant in whom he already descried a formidable rival mr odgers was sauntering by the creek with his hands in his pockets and the air of a man fully assured of himself and his position he was perhaps thirty had a dark olive complexion and sharply cut features his beard was trimmed within fashionable bounds and his attire immaculate he was apparently contemplating the reeds near the bank of the lonely creek and jingling the loose silver in his pocket as percy neared him what a contrast between the conventional and perfectly dressed town gent and the wild tangle of grass and reed at his feet as he paused just then young cheltham approached odgers there was a crossing place a little higher up the creek and the young man was making his way toward it hello is this you cheltham what brings you down this way i have been at chesterton the young man replied and my business leads me across the creek i might rather ask why mr odgers should seek so lonely a spot lonely indeed did you ever see such a devil of a place i'm bored to death how any young chap like you can be content to spend his life in such a hole beats me why don't you come down to town i like the country mr odgers but were i ever so much inclined to leave it i could not do so i am only a farmer working pretty hard for a living was it unconsciously that the rich man jingled louder the silver among his hidden fingers ah so i've heard and yet you aspire to the hand of miss ellingworth this was more than percy cheltham could stand from the man of whose underhanded rivalry he was assured his fine form was drawn up his eyes flashed and his right hand was clenched how dare you mention that lady's name to me in such sneering terms sir yes i have aspired to miss ellingworth's hand and thank god i have won her heart unworthy as i am the hand will come after please god Odgers smiled insultingly 
you have a good opinion of yourself young man and if mr ellingworth knew what you had just said he would thrash you like the cur you are for the lady's sake i shall not however tell him how you presume with his daughter's name tell him and add that cried the young man now thoroughly roused and ere the words were well concluded Odgers lay upon the grass and his silver jingled as he fell percy Cheltham walked away and left the merchant lying where he fell his blood was boiling with resentment yet he was possessed of a deep feeling of dissatisfaction with himself in the heat of his anger he had forgotten himself so far as to strike a guest at chesterton what would mr ellingworth whom he deeply respected and above all what would marion think of him as for odgers he rose from the ground and shook himself if any one had seen the expression of his face as he looked after percy Cheltham, they must have had some provision of evil his face was pale as ashes his dark eyes literally flashed and his lips trembled whitely under the cared for moustache he spoke no word however even to himself but turned his back to the creek and walked quickly toward chesterton at the distance of perhaps two hundred yards from the house a man was working among some evergreens lazily hoeing the weeds from the soil round their roots he was younger than mr odgers tall fair and thin his clothes were ragged but had evidently been originally the attire of one in a good position and the young man's whole figure bore evident traces of dissipation and neglect he lifted himself up as odgers paused near him and looked the merchant rather anxiously in the face you do not find this pleasant work wyatt odgers said it is something different to being a bank clerk in collins street eh wyatt returned sulkily to his pretence of hoeing however it is good and you owe it to me if i had not lied on your behalf mr ellingworth would not have taken you a hungry and dirty tramp off the road to what end do you tell me this wyatt cried angrily raising himself once more tell me something i don't know or leave me to my misery i tell you because i want to remind you that one word of mine could put you in jail for forgery and that i have not said the word and i tell you because i have something better to offer you wyatt's haggard countenance brightened what is it oh odgers if you could get me out of this wretched position and give me a chance once more among my own set i will do anything in the whole world i will do both i will give you a desk in my own office put decent clothes on your back and more i will give you fifty guineas to make a fair start with and what am i to do for this the young man asked dubiously for he knew the unscrupulous nature of the man who was addressing him you mean me to earn all this some way i do listen to me attentively half an hour ago a young man struck me down with a blow i will never forgive but he is in my way otherwise that young man must be put out of my way for ever killed call it anything you like wyatt so that you understand me in about two hours from now he will be returning across the creek from cherries the moon is nearly a week old and you will have plenty of light do it any way you think most safe for yourself only do it effectually i will meet you on this spot at midnight if it is done you shall have your fifty pounds and a letter to my manager in town it is murder half whispered wyatt with trembling lips and blanched face even so it is not much worse than forgery remember your miserable position here and all you will regain you can take all precautions and the creek is deep who will suspect you what about the bill asked the young man you mean your forgery i shall keep it for a check over your tongue and for my own safety was the reply there was a pause and then wyatt said determinedly i will do it all right i shall be here at twelve wyatt looked after the merchant as he went with a smile of strange meaning on his lips and then he tossed down the hoe and walked rapidly toward a hut that stood upon the bank of the creek out of sight of chesterton homestead as he neared the hut he saw a dark low-sized man in tidy bush clothing sitting by the door busily engaged in something appertaining to the tanning of skins this man's name was bill tyndall and he was supposed to earn his living by providing the skins of kangaroo possum and such for the melbourne market hello wyatt is this you what's in the wind now something you'll never guess bill and then he went on to relate about odger's proposal to him what a lucky thing it is that i fell in with you that time i got into trouble for i couldn't have managed this without you and a long conversation about the affair ensued do you see through it now bill that distillery of yours is the very place no one has ever suspected you of having a still 
no one will suspect him of being there. Odgers only wants to marry the girl, and when he has married her we can split on him without danger to ourselves. I shall get back comfortably to town, and twenty pounds will do you no harm. Agreed, cried Bill. And now we've no time to lose. Night is falling, and the moon is up. I know exactly where the crossing is, and I know, too, exactly where to strike. Come on. It was at about the same hour that Percy Chalfham left Cherry's, where he had been detained longer than he had anticipated. His spirits were still very low in contemplation of his injudicious quarrel with Odgers, and an unaccountable weight seemed to oppress his mind. He ascribed it to his fears of having displeased his beloved Marion, yet again remembered how assured he was of her perfect trust in him. Was this feeling, then, an instinctive premonition of the fate that awaited him at the shadowed creek? He had crossed it on the fallen tree which served as a bridge, and taken half a dozen steps on the grass beyond, when a blow from a heavy piece of wood fell upon his head and struck him to the earth. There, said Bill, as he tossed away his bludgeon, that'll do it. I know the touch. Poor young chap, it's a pity. But it'll be all right for him hereafter. Would it be all right for the speaker hereafter? The deep silence of the lonely bush near the creek, as they lifted the body and carried it quickly away from the scene of murder, might have suggested the question to Dark Bill. Mr. Odgers was late for dinner, and he was profuse in his apologies. The truth was, he had encountered our young friend Cheltham in his walk, and had conversed so long with him about country affairs that the hour escaped him. How deeply absorbed the young man seemed to be in his farming affairs, to be sure. Marion lifted up her soft eyes and looked at him suspiciously. She knew that Odgers aspired to her hand, and was aware of her predilection for the young farmer. What object had he in bringing up his name in such a tone? "'There is not a finer fellow than Percy in the colonies,' cried Harry Lamborn, the son of a neighbouring squatter, and a wealthy one. "'He and I have been fast friends ever since our school days, and I am afraid I should rather lose my brother than Percy.' Marion looked at him gratefully, while pretty, vivacious Elsie frowned at the very unconscious Odgers. "'I wish Percy was going to town with us,' she cried. "'I don't know anyone in the whole world I love so much as Percy Chalfham. And then Harry Lamborn looked slyly at the speaker, and Elsie blushed, red as any rose. What a handsome young fellow was Harry Lamborn, to be sure, twenty-three and fair, with kindly grey eyes and soft curly light brown hair. He was the happiest and merriest fellow in the world. He was tender-hearted as a girl, yet strong as a young ox, and had, with his six feet of height, a chest deep as a greyhound's. "'It is pleasant to see young people appreciate each other,' said Mr. Odgers, sententiously. "'The mind of any one, young or old, who did not appreciate Percy Chelfer must be ignorant and warped to a degree,' retorted Harry with rising anger, for he knew and resented Odgers' rivalry of his friend in Marion's affections. "'He is known and loved as well as respected by the whole neighbourhood. "'What is this about Chelfer?' inquired Mr. Ellingworth, just waking from his after-dinner nap, and only half aroused. "'The finest young fellow in the country. "'I don't care who knows I said it. "'Where is Odgers? Has he returned yet?' "'Yes, Odgers had returned, but felt thoroughly discomfited. "'He tried to resume his suave manner and keep his rage to himself, "'but nothing comforted him save the hope that by that very hour "'his rival was stiff and cold and no longer able to excite the love of man or woman. "'I wonder what Wyatt has done with him,' he soliloquised as when all the household at Chesterton had retired, he hastened in the darkness to keep his appointment with the ex-clerk. "'I don't think he will fail me. I hope, I hope he has succeeded.' The young moon had sunk below the horizon when Odgers stood at the place of tryst. There was no one there, but as he trod upon the hoe Wyatt had left, and it bounded up and struck him on the arm, he almost cried out, fancying he had been struck a blow, and his heart beat with fear, cowardly wretch that he was. So terrified was he, that he was starting back toward the house when Wyatt spoke at his side. "'Is that you, Odgers? I thought I heard someone moving.' "'Yes, it is I. Speak lower. You don't know who may be listening. Is it done?' "'It is done. Thoroughly?' "'Ay. Rest assured, we did the work well.' "'We?' cried Odgers. "'Whatever do you mean? Surely you were not such a cursed fool as to get anyone to help you?' "'No, no,' Wyatt returned hastily for he had nearly committed himself. I am not such a fool. But don't you count yourself as an accomplice, Odgers? Don't talk such rot. Where did you leave the body? Are you sure it's safe? Mind, I don't want to know any particulars, only that it is done and done safely. 
He was shaking from head to foot like a man with a gue, and fancied he saw the face of his dead rival gleaming through the darkness in proximity to his own. "'There is no danger, save from the fact that I am afraid there will be some blood where he fell,' Wyatt whispered. "'It was dark, or nearly so, and I dared not wait or strike a match, nor would it be safe to go in the morning. But it is all right. No one will suspect, as I shall be here at work as usual in the morning.' "'Where do you sleep?' asked Rogers. "'In the old hut at the back of the stables. I am quite alone, so no one knows or cares when I come or when I go. I shall give notice of leaving in a week.' not before. Well, there is your fifty, and a slight chink of gold was heard, and there is your note to dread, my manager in town. It is not dated, and it will secure you the deal I promised you. A few words more, and the accomplices parted, or just to return to his bedroom by the French window on the veranda, and Wyatt to his hut behind the stables. The hut was an old tumble-down concern, and you could put your hand between every one of the slabs which formed it. There was, however, an old chimney of rough stones and plenty of firewood, and Wyatt began to make a fire and prepare his supper, acting all the time as if he was under observation, as indeed he might have been through the openings in the rough walls. But every now and then the young man, who looked of a superior class in spite of his ragged attire, sat down on his rough stool and laughed aloud. This, you will allow, was strange conduct for a murderer fresh from his crime. He must have been hardened indeed although he had not certainly struck the death-blow, he had been, to all intents and purposes, as guilty as Bill. Had he not helped and suggested, and were not his hands red with the innocent blood of poor Percy Cheltham? Every now and then he put his hand into his pocket, when his mutton was frying, to drown the noise of chinking gold, and lovingly felt the sovereigns Odgers had given him. He had all his plans made for hiding it in the floor of the hut, but not until the fire was out, so that the light could not betray his occupation through the open slabs. A murderer must be very hardened indeed, whose heart does not beat hard at the sound of a step approaching his lonely dwelling at one o'clock in the morning. Wyatt's heart did beat hard, and harder still at the sharp knock, which summoned admittance. He went, however, and opened it. Picture to yourself his entire astonishment on seeing, standing in the light of the fire, the young squatter, Harry Lamborn. "'I beg you will excuse me,' the handsome young fellow said, as he stooped his tall head to enter the old hut. "'I should be the last man in the world to intrude on your privacy. But being unable to sleep, and going out to smoke a cigar, I saw your light. As you were cooking, I did not think I should disturb you, and I want to have a talk with you.' "'With me? But you are quite welcome, Mr. Lamborn. Pray be seated.' Wyatt offered his visitor the one rough stool, and Harry accepted it as gracefully as though it had been a velvet-covered chair. "'But I am depriving you of your only seat,' young Lamborn said. But Wyatt smiled as he lifted off his frying-pan and seated himself on the ground with his back against the wall. "'I have learned in the school of misfortune, sir, to do without even the conveniences of life. I have at least one satisfaction. I cannot sit much lower.' Harry Lamborn looked deeply pained. Doubtless, the strong contrast between his own position and that of the young man before him presented itself strongly, and, besides, the instinctive sympathy between young men made him feel the difference more deeply. "'I am glad you have alluded to your misfortunes,' he said, as he handed Wyatt his cigar-case, "'for you have broken the ice on the very subject I wish to speak to you about.' Wyatt selected a cigar and lit it, but he made no reply. "'My friend Percy Chaltham has interested me very much on your behalf,' Harry went on. "'He had heard somewhat of your story, and appealed to me on your behalf. "'He told me that you were educated, and had held a responsible position in town, "'and his heart was sore to see you so reduced as this.' "'Even then Wyatt made no reply. "'Was it a wonder he was speechless when he heard that the poor fellow "'they had lain in wait for at the creek, and stricken down like an ox, "'had pitied and interceded for him?' "'You doubtless know that Mr. Chaltham has not much opportunity of being able to assist anyone, no matter how great his inclination to do so. That was the reason he appealed to me, whom he looks on as a brother. Wyatt, what can I do for you?' The young man addressed was almost incapable of speech, and his voice sounded as one far away, for his face was bidden in his hands as he replied. "'You can do nothing for me, Mr. Lamborn.' "'Why?' The fire, which was a bush one, and full of glow and light, fell upon the figure of the young squatter, as, with cigar in fingers, he bent anxiously towards the drooping figure of young Wyatt. 
Harry's face was full of an infinite compassion, and, had he followed the instincts of his affectionate nature, he would have laid his arm around the shoulders of Wyatt, as of a brother, and tried to solace his evident distress. "'Why can I not do anything for you, Wyatt, when I am so willing and anxious to help?' "'If you knew all,' Wyatt half-sobbed, "'you would turn from me in disgust. Why should I impose on you by accepting an assistance I do not deserve?' There is no man in this world who has not made grievous mistakes in life, Wyatt. If each of us received only what we deserved, our comforts would be even less than those which surround you at this moment. Come, cheer up, old fellow. The world is still before you. For you are young, and I willingly help you back into the straight road. Who could withstand the genial voice and the friendly hand at last laid on the drooping shoulder? Not George Wyatt. Bad as he was, and worse as you believe him to be, he raised himself suddenly and grasped the hand of his new friend. "'God forgive me, as you have done, and if I prove unworthy of your kindness, I pray that he may forget me. There, calm yourself, Wyatt, and listen to me. I have a station of my own at Kaya. It would be the better of a super, I mean an overseer. Suppose you accept that billet in the meantime till something turns up. It will, at least, remove you into a better position at once.' Wyatt hurriedly considered the offer, ere he replied. Bad as he had been, he was deeply touched at the generosity of young Lambourne, yet he could not wholly lose sight of his own interests. Should he accept this offer of Harry's, it would render him independent of Odgers. Still, there was the forged bill to be considered. If he could only obtain possession of that. "'I accept your offer, sir, with the deepest gratitude,' he said in reply. "'If you will give me one week in town.' When I tell you that my anxiety to go down has something to do with the evil I have done, which threw me out of my own set, you will excuse me. Certainly, my dear fellow, go to-morrow, and I will take responsibility with Mr. Ellingworth, who, indeed, already knows of my intentions toward you. If you want any money, let me be your banker for the present. Harry's hand was in his pocket as he rose to go, but Wyatt decidedly refused this further assistance. How could he accept it with the price of blood in his breast at the moment? All the kindly Lambourne could do was to persuade him to accept some clothing in order to make a presentable appearance in town, and then, with a grasp of the hand, the young men parted. "'And so there are such men in the world after all,' Wyatt soliloquised, as he coiled himself in his bunk. "'I would not have believed it had I not seen this. God bless the boy. And he loved that poor fellow we buried in Bill's distillery. Well, he shall never forget it. Strange thoughts these for a man red-handed from crime. What a different night was passed by Mr. Odgers, the wealthy man who had not laid one finger in the blood of his enemy, but who had only sold his young life for some of the gold he valued so highly. His light burned the whole night through, and even then he saw the white face of a dead man gibbering at him from the dark corners of his chamber. Over and over he pictured to himself how the bloody deed had been done, and far better for him would it have been had he known the real facts of poor Cheltham's murder, for, in his ignorance, he pictured for him a hundred deaths. Had Wyatt waylaid and shot him? Had he stabbed and buried the body under some old log that would soon reveal its dread secret to the horrified world? Had he watched his chance, and in the darkness pushed the doomed man from the crossing log into the deep dark creek, he could not answer one of the terrible questions he put to himself, but he pictured to himself every one of these murder scenes, and saw the handsome face of Percy Cheltham amid them all as he had looked when he died. No wonder, then, that when Mr. Odgers stepped from his room to the cool morning air under the vine-wreathed veranda, he looked haggard and worn, or that, as he saw quickly approaching him Harry Lambourne and a strange station hand, he should start and grow paler still. He had no time, however, to indulge his fears, for Lambourne was addressing him in evident agitation. "'Good morning, Mr. Odgers. Pray, excuse my abruptness. Would you kindly tell me when and where you saw Percy Cheltham last evening?' The merchant tried to look surprised at the question. "'When I saw Mr. Cheltham down at the creek, he had just left Chesterton. At least he told me so. And he said he was on his way to Cherry's to transact some business. May I ask why you make the inquiry? I trust nothing is wrong.' "'I am sorry to say my friend Percy is missing. "'This man, one of Cheltham's farmhands, "'has just come to inquire if he was here. 
Cheltham was at Cherry's, and left it to return home. He was seen coming toward the crossing about ten o'clock, and there all trace is lost. You will excuse me, my horse is being saddled, for of course I must organise a complete search. Odger's feelings were far from enviable at breakfast, where nothing was discussed save the strange disappearance of Cheltham. The tidings, incautiously communicated, had so alarmed and distressed Marion that she was unable to join them at breakfast. But the distress of Mr. Ellingworth was gall and wormwood to the heart of Odgers. Now that Percy was lost, the real affection and respect the squatter had always felt for the honest, straightforward young farmer evinced itself plainly. For a time, this feeling had been overpowered by the chink of Odgers' scold. But now, Ellingworth would have given— not only his beloved daughter to Percy, could he see his handsome, open, living face once again, but all the gold of Odgers into the bargain, had he been possessed of it. "'The finest fellow in the country,' he said, as he pushed away his almost untouched plate. "'I do not believe he had one fault. The best master, the best son, the best friend that man or woman could have, and true as steel.' "'You speak of our young friend in the past tense, my dear sir.' Mr. Odgers said, with his eyes fixed upon the piece of toast he was cutting into very useless bits. "'Surely you are alarming yourself unnecessarily. It is not an unprecedented case for a young man to stay away for one night.' "'Quite unprecedented for Percy Cheltham to do so,' the squatter answered shortly, as he rose from the table. "'Pray, excuse me, Odgers. I must go and be doing something in the matter. The police will by this time have been communicated within the matter, and as the only J.P. within ten miles, I may momentarily expect some of them. Even as Mr. Ellingworth spoke, a servant announced that Constable Slattery was waiting to see him, and in twenty minutes the miserable Odgers was watching the forms of his host and the trooper disappearing toward the creek. Both were mounted, and they were conversing eagerly as they rode. Odgers sank into a chair and wiped his damp face with his soft cambric handkerchief. It was certainly whiter than the rich man's face, for it was as sallow as the pith of a dead sassafras tree in a Canadian fall. Would they find him? Would Wyatt be suspected? Would he tell tales of his employer, and of the money he paid to secure his young and beloved rival's death? Would he, the respected merchant of Melbourne, be openly branded in a court of justice as the hirer of an assassin to spill innocent blood? He rose, and once again looked after the horseman, and he saw only a gleam of police accoutrements through the distant trees. "'Sleuth hounds!' he cried bitterly and half aloud. "'I had rather twenty squatters been on the track than one of your breed.' He might well be afraid. A more intelligent officer than Constable Slattery was not paid by an inappreciative government. "'You see, sir,' he said to Mr. Ellingworth, "'if anything has gone wrong, it must have been near the crossing place. Jack Brown, the splitter, who had been at Cherry's for some stores, saw him just where the road branches off to Kelly's station. Mr. Lamborn has gone there. If Mr. Cheltham did not go to Kelly's, he must have crossed the creek. They alighted and tied up their horses to one of the many fallen logs near the spot, and went carefully over the brush bridge. The fallen tree had lain for years over the deep, narrow creek, and green moss flourished adown its old sides. But along the top were the footsteps of people who, though rarely, occasionally passed that way, a smooth path was worn on the erstwhile rugged bark. "'There is the place Jack Brown saw him,' said Slattery. "'And there is not a sign of him on this side of the creek. We had better go back.' And they went back. Mr. Ellingworth so thoroughly upset and excited that he would have slipped from the log had not the trooper caught and saved his balance. When they reached the opposite side once more, Slattery's horse was showing signs of impatience, and— while snorting loudly, was tugging at his bridle fiercely. Slattery hastened to soothe him. If he had been an ordinary civilian, he would have cried out at what he saw, but being an intelligent policeman of rare article in our year of grace, 1880, he simply untied the horse and removed them to another tree at some distance. Then he returned to the spot where the horses had exhibited such uneasiness and knelt down upon the grass. A pool of blood as large as a man's two hands was lying there among the grass blades, coagulated with the cool night air, and trampled with one horrified horse's foot, yet still of that terrible hue that strikes horror into most human hearts. Not far from it was lying a felt hat, which the trooper lifted and examined carefully. It had not been a soft felt, but one of those round helmet hats, 
and there was a great dint in it, and a significant stain in the inside. Slattery looked round. Mr. Ellingworth, unaccustomed to anxiety or excitement of any kind, had sat down upon a log and was wiping his face with his handkerchief. He was not a sensitive man, but he was entirely sympathetic. He could pity and assist the very poorest and most worthless tramp that ever begged a night's shelter at his door, yet did not trouble, though his overseer reported a torrent of abuse from station hands who fancied themselves wronged. If a man had worked for him for even one year, and done his duty faithfully, he would not have considered the wages paid, but the duty performed to the employer's benefit, and forgiven even abuse for the sake of the past. How, then, did he feel when he sat upon that log near the spot where he believed Percy Cheltham had died? He had given his happy consent to Marion's union with this good and generous young man, whom she loved, believing that he was thereby ensuring a happiness dearer to him than his own. Marion loved him, he knew that, and his own honest convictions assured him that Percy Cheltham's last thought was of the money such a marriage would bring to his home. How had he repaid the poor young man's honest trust and confidence, by yielding to the temptation of Odger's gold and position? If Ellingworth had been a woman, he would have wept. Being a man, he groaned, and sat down to contemplate the creek, and wonder if Percy Cheltham was lying beneath its deep waters, dead. How should he face Marion, his dear girl, if Percy Cheltham had been murdered? And, strange to say, even then, some hint of Odger's possible complicity was making its way through his bewildered brain. "'I am sorry, sir, but I am afraid there is no doubt of Mr. Cheltham's murder. I have just found this, and there is a pool of blood lying over yonder, as big as my hat.' This was the hat he had picked up with the dark stain on its lining. Mr. Ellingworth recognised it at once, by its peculiar shape, as helmet hats were the exception in that neighbourhood and when he went to look at that clotted pool among the long green grass stalks, he turned to his horse and mounted. "'I can't stand it, Slattery. Whatever turns up, you will let me know.' And he was off to Chesterton, carrying a sore and heavy heart in his bosom. Scarcely had he left the creek when Harry Lambourne rode to the crossing, and, seeing Slattery, dismounted. Slattery was still holding the broken hat in his hand and staring at the red pool when Lambourne crossed the road and joined him. As soon as his eyes fell upon the hat and followed those of the constable to the green grass, he felt his warm heart sink to the very depths of despair and fell against a near tree for support. "'You have found him, Slattery. It is quite true, then. My schoolfellow has been murdered.' "'I am sorry, sir. Very sorry.' It looks very like it, but we have not found the body. This is undoubtedly Mr. Cheltham's hat, and these evidences are only too plain. He has been waylaid and murdered, but for what I can't suppose. He had not money to carry on him and tempt a tramp. He has been murdered, Slattery, and if it was my last shilling I should offer a heavy reward. See to it, Slattery, and get the creek dragged. Offer a hundred pounds for any information, and leave me here. I wish to be alone. Hurrying to regain his horse, Slattery stumbled among the long grass against the short heavy stick with which Bill had struck the fatal blow. He said nothing of his find, but having exchanged a few words with Mr. Lambourne, rode away in the direction of Cherry's. And Harry Lambourne still held Percy's battered and blood-stained hat, and leaned heavily against the trunk of the old box. He knew that in the eyes of the matter-of-fact constable, he must seem a sentimental and effeminate fool, yet little he cared. Was he not standing upon the spot, or near it, where the man he had known and loved since his very earliest years had met a violent death? There was his blood upon the ground, here the hat which had a few short hours ago crowned and covered the soft short curls he had so admired. Would God not spare his life to avenge the death of Percy Cheltham? He sat down upon the grass, so near to his friend's blood, that he could have touched it, and he wept aloud. What did he care? There was nothing to hear him, save the screaming parrot or the lonely curlew, that, dreaming of coming rain, cried mournfully from her lair. But he was not alone. Even in the midst of his sobs a hand was laid upon his shoulder. Harry presented a picture that must have gone to the heart of any feeling man, as he sat there with his head bowed upon one hand, and the tears dropping upon the other that clutched the hat to his breast. "'I'm so sorry, Mr. Lambourne. Speak to me. 
I am going. Harry looked up angrily and started to his feet. I thought I was alone, he said. What do you want? Oh, Wyatt, is it you? Yes, sir, it is I. In consequence of your kindness, I am going to catch the coach at Cherry's. I want to say something to you, Mr. Lambourne. Pray, have patience with me. Do not grieve so much for your lost friend. In reply, Harry held forth the hat which was now stained with tears as well as blood. Never mind, sir. Fretting won't bring the dead to life. But other things will ease the heart. Please, Mr. Lambourne, come over the creek with me. I have something to say to you which I don't want the police to hear. They may be lurking round. You may trust me. I have your clothes on my back and your hand in mine. Yes, the young squatter had clutched Wyatt's hand, as if he felt he had only him left to sympathise with him. And, as Wyatt spoke, he rose and followed him across the dangerous log. I'm going to Melbourne, Wyatt said when they reached the opposite bank, and you gave me a week's leave. Dear sir, will you trust me for that week? What do you mean? I have no reason to distrust you. I mean this, said Wyatt, and Wyatt bent forward and whispered in Harry's ear. Good-bye, and, mind, I leave myself and my interests in your hands. They are safe, cried Harry, as he stood up and looked after his new acquaintance in a bewildered sort of way. Let us follow the said new acquaintance, and leave the police of Cherries to drag the creek for Chelfham's body, which was never found. The holes are deep in Chesterton Creek and a dozen dead men might have been hidden among the slimy snags in their dark depths. Day passed after day, but nothing more was discovered. Who can picture the sorrow of disconsolate parents who have not even looked their last on their beloved dead? Who can tell the grief of the darling girl who had loved the murdered youth with all her soul? Wyatt caught the daily coach at Cherry's, and it landed him in Melbourne at half-past three. He was not now afraid to face the town, who would be with twenty pounds in his pocket and a good suit of clothes on his back? He had a snack at the hotel, and went straight to Mr. Odger's place of business in Flinders Lane. The manager, Mr. Dredd, was in his office, and to him, on admission, Wyatt presented his letter. Hum, ah, I see. Mr. Odgers has given me orders to provide you with a desk in this office. My dear young man, there is not a desk vacant, but I shall have great pleasure in giving you a desk in my own office. I certainly have no necessity for a private clerk, but since Mr. Odgers puts it so strongly, he can have no objection to my putting you over arranging his private papers, which he left in a terrible muddle. And Mr. Dredd waved his hand toward the door and dropped his eyes upon the documents that lay before him. Be here at nine sharp tomorrow. Wyatt went away well satisfied. He had secured, without trouble, the very post he wished for where more likely to find the bill he had forged than in the private office of Mr. Odgers. He secured a lodging where he was well known, and had been respected in former days, and lay down to rest, longing for the morning. It came, and with it, strong sympathetic memories of his benefactor, Harry Lambourne, as he had seen him sitting at the creek, with the hat of his dead schoolmate in his hand. What a strange thing it was that the memory of that scene should awaken a broad smile in the face of the man who had taken Odger's blood money. Yet the truth is that he not only smiled, but laughed aloud as he entered Odger's private office in Flinders Lane. The fellow's mad, declared the envious clerks, who were not permitted to cross the threshold of Mr. Odger's room. But if Wyatt was mad, there certainly was a method in his madness. The manager Dredd had not yet arrived, but upon his desk Wyatt found the keys of Mr. Odger's room. He guessed such to be the case as soon as he saw them, and, on applying one to the lock of the inner door, he found he had guessed correctly, and opened it wide. How the young man's heart beat with anxiety, and yet delight! It may not have been a very honest action he contemplated, but he only sought his own, obtained from him in a moment of folly. And who could think of honour in connection with a man who had paid him to commit a fearful crime? The memory of his good friend, Harry Lambourne, sitting at the lonely creek, was strong upon him as he shut the door and turned hastily to examine the office. It was a room of ordinary size, carpeted, and with two or three handsome Morocco-covered armchairs. Instead of a desk, there was a broad writing-table, with a litter of documents in file, and some japanned boxes thereon. He would not keep it so openly, 
soliloquised Wyatt, and then he looked at his bunch of keys and at a small iron safe close to the chair at the writing table. You should have seen his eyes flash and brighten as he opened the safe and saw among some other papers a paper which had consigned him to poverty and the fear of the law. He seized, opened, and scanned the paper, and having secured it in his pocket and locked up the safe, sat down at the table and laughed loud and long. "'I told you he was mad,' said one chap in the outside office. And he was not far wrong. George Wyatt was mad with joy. Let us go back to Chesterton Creek. When he parted from Wyatt, Harry Lamborn sat down once more on the grass, but in a bewildered sort of way that had not a suspicion of tears in it. He had sought out the very spot on which Wyatt had found him, and, with the hat still in his hand, was staring at the terrible bloodstains on the grass when he was again disturbed. Not by a policeman this time, nor yet by a friend like Wyatt. A fair face under a broad hat, a face with an infinite pity and tenderness in it, was stooped down to a level with that of Harry Lamborn. It was the sweet fair face of Elsie Gard. "'Harry, don't fret. I'll never believe it. You, you to murder our darling Percy. Oh, Harry, come home. They are going to arrest you.' "'Me? Elsie, my darling girl. What are you talking about?' "'Oh, Harry, they are coming to arrest you for the murder of Percy. I heard Uncle issuing the warrant. Oh, Harry, Harry, what shall we do?' Young Lamborn started to his feet and caught the fair trembling girl to his breast. Was he dreaming? Was that Chesterton Creek and this Elsie Gard? Was that Percy Chelfham's hat he had dropped at his feet? Had George Wyatt told him anything a few hours ago or not? Was the pretty child on his bosom dreaming? Or could it be true that he, Harry Lamborn, was going to be arrested for the murder of his friend? "'My darling, you are fancying things,' he said. "'No one could suspect me of murdering my friend. "'Elsie, darling, what made you fancy such horrible things?' "'It is no fancy. "'Oh, Harry, I was standing on the veranda near Uncle's room, "'and I heard Sergeant Colville apply for a warrant against you, "'and Uncle laid his head down on the table before he granted it. "'And he did grant it, my darling.' "'Oh, yes, Harry, what could he do?' "'Colville said he had proofs that you were out of your room half the night "'and that you had been heard quarrelling. "'I? Quarrel with Harry?' "'Yes, about a gun. Don't you remember? "'It seems that one of our men heard you and told the police. "'Oh, that was merely a schoolboy disagreement "'about the merits of a new breech-loader, darling. "'Believe me, you have quite misunderstood the conversation "'between your uncle and the sergeant. "'Let us go home, and you will find that it is so.' Only half reassured, Elsie took her lover's arm, and they turned their faces toward Chesterton. The dear girl was much puzzled at Harry's manner, too, for instead of grieving over the death of his much-prized friend, he appeared quite merry and gay. "'How did you find out where I was, Elsie, dear?' he asked. "'Constable Slattery told Sergeant Colville where he had left you, and I ran all the way, and—oh, Harry, here they are, both riding down the avenue.' Yes, they were indeed approaching, and both dismounted as the young people neared them. Elsie trembled like a leaf and clung closer to the young squatter, but Harry only smiled as the sergeant approached them with a blue-tinted paper in his hand. "'I am very sorry, Mr. Lamborn, but I have a warrant here for your arrest and must do my duty. A warrant to arrest you on a charge of the suspected murder of Percy Chelfham, sir. If it is correct, you may well say suspected, sergeant, since the body of my friend has not been found. Let me see the warrant, if you please. You will find it all right, sir, the man said as he handed the young gentleman the document, which Harry perused and returned. I see it is quite formal, and, of course, I must place myself in your hands, but let me here assure you that you have made such a mistake in applying for this warrant as will overwhelm you with ridicule when the matter is inquired into. Mr. Chelfham's body has not been found, and i may add for your information that it never will be found miss gard i beg of you to return home and calm yourself for i am in no danger elsie returned harry's loving look while her soft lips quivered in an agony of grief and terror and then she flew up the avenue weeping as she went the policeman slattery resigned his horse to mr lamborn 
returning to the station for another horse. Let us return to Wyatt in Odger's office in town. He only awaited the manager's arrival to announce that he preferred to wait Mr. Odger's arrival before entering on his duties, and the clerks once again chuckled at his madness when they discovered the news. Before Wyatt had done some little business in the way of purchasing clothing and recovering some of his nearly forfeited property, the evening paper was issued, and, to his entire dismay, he read the telegraphic announcement of Mr. Lambourne's arrest for the murder of Percy Chatham. It had been his intention to return to Cherry's by the evening coach, but this news changed his plan, and instead he wrote to Dark Bill. He was aware that the criminal sessions would be on in a few days, and that young Lambourne would be only committed at Cherry's, and then forwarded to Melbourne for trial. How different was the visit of Elsie Gard to town from what she had expected? Mr. Ellingworth now came to attend the trial of his young friend, for, although he had been compelled to issue the warrant for Harry's arrest, he had not for one moment believed him guilty, and Elsie was the promised wife of the accused man, and she asserted her right to go also. Even Marian, gentle Marian Ellingworth, so far from believing in Harry's guilt, asserted his innocence loudly, and went to prison to visit him, of course accompanied by Mr. Ellingworth. Mr. Odgers was also of the party, but with far different feelings to the others, for he was quite willing to sacrifice half a score of young squatters to secure his own safety. Only one thing now made him doubtful of securing that precious safety. He could discover no traces of Wyatt, no sooner did he hear from his manager of the young man's strange refusal to attend than he suspected evil, and an examination of his safe discovered the loss of his forged bill. He hoped, however, that the young man had feared to remain in the country, and fled from the consequences of his crime. At last the day of trial came, and the court was crowded. Neither Marion nor Elsie was there, for Mr. Ellingworth insisted on their absence but Odgers, as a witness, was obliged to be there. The witnesses called for the Crown were not many. There was the man who had heard the prisoner quarrelling with Cheltham, some people from Cherries, the man who had last seen the deceased near the creek, the hand who had chanced to see Harry re-entering the room after his late visit to Wyatt, and the police as to finding the hat, etc. It created some astonishment to observe the calm and rather amused air of the prisoner, and the fact of his counsel not having once exercised his right of cross-examination. At last that gentleman's opportunity came, and he rose to address the bench and jury in very few words indeed. My client has pleaded not guilty. I have one witness to call which will prove finally the truth of that pleading. Let my readers picture to themselves the astonishment of all in court, and the utter dismay of Odgers, when Percy Cheltham was called, and in a few minutes stood in the witness-box. He was rather pale, and looked agitatedly toward his friends. His evidence was plainly given, and was to the effect that he had fallen heavily from the crossing log toward a stump on the bank of the creek. He had been discovered by two men in a state of insensibility, and carried to a hut on the Chesterton estate. As soon as he recovered, he had sent a message home to relieve their minds, requesting them, however, not to say anything of his condition, as he did not wish to alarm other dear friends. He had remained ill for three days, and was utterly confounded to hear, on his return home, of the arrest of his best friend for his murder. Had he been kindly treated? Yes, his rough friend, who was somewhere in court, had been as kind as a father to him. Yes, Darkville was in court, and grinned with his tongue in his cheek as he heard the young man repeating his well-taught lesson. Now you must not suppose that Percy was repeating what he thought was a lie. The fact was that he did not remember one iota about the attack at the creek, and told the story as it had been told to him, ere he had fairly regained his senses. A happy party returned to Chesterton, and a few months after a double wedding was celebrated there. Wyatt is still super at Harry Lambourne Station, and Dark Bill tans skins and makes whisky near the creek. Remembering how often the undeserving prosper in the world, we may regret, but need not feel astonished at this fact. Let us console ourselves with the knowledge of Odger's disappointment and unhappy mind. He lives in continual fear that Wyatt will disclose his secret. Wyatt has not yet done so, for his own sake. End of story
Section three of Stories from the Detectives Album by Wife Wanda, also known as Mary Fortune. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsty. Checkmate and Revenge. The events I am about to relate to you happened in one of the sister colonies, and so long ago that I need feel no hesitation in relating them, and my connection with the affair was purely the result of accident. It is not at all an unfrequent occurrence for a wife to take out a warrant against an absconding husband, but for a husband to move heaven and earth in search of a runaway wife is, indeed, a rare fact. Mr. Barnsley did not, indeed, at first, take out a warrant against his missing partner, for he was one of those asses in the shape of men who believe in a woman when her folly is patent to every one else, but he came to our office and offered no end of tin if we could manage to trace her. The case was put into my hands. Barnsley furnished me with some of the following particulars, the rest I found out for myself. He was a rather wealthy squatter, of a soft and easy disposition, and had married a girl of whom little was known, save that she had come out from England two or three years previous, with a widowed mother since dead. She was educated and talented, and had taught music and singing successfully in the aristocratic suburbs of Melbourne, until she fell in with Barnsley at the home of one of her pupils, and played her cards so well as to become Mrs. Barnsley after a very short courtship. They had been married eighteen months, and now she had left him. "'Did Mrs. Barnsley give you no hint whatever of her intention?' I asked of the anxious and worn-looking man. "'No, not a word. I had not the least, the most distant idea that she even contemplated the possibility of such a step.' "'You had no quarrel, no dispute in the matrimonial way?' "'None.' We parted in the morning as usual, my wife being going on a shopping expedition as I understood. The carriage returned without her, and I have not seen or heard of her since. Perhaps she has gone to visit some friends. No, no, I have telegraphed everywhere. She has taken all her jewels and something like a thousand pounds in cash. How did she procure so large a sum? She has had carte blanche, said the soft simpleton, ever since our marriage. Only the morning she left I gave her a signed cheque to fill up as she wished. She filled it up and received at the Bank of Victoria for one thousand pounds. Now you know, it was utterly impossible for a man of my calibre to respect such an uxorious fool as this, and I was glad to get rid of him after having obtained a photo of the missing dame. I confess to you that I was surprised at the pictured form I saw before me, and began to make some excuses for the man I had just been branding as a simpleton of the first water. Let me see if I can describe Mrs. Barnsley to you. The photo represented a girl of apparently not more than twenty-one or two, though I discovered afterwards that she was a few years older. A more fascinating and bewitching countenance I have never looked upon, and it was what it is the fashion to call beauté du diable that evinced itself in the expression of the almost perfect face. A slender and beautifully moulded figure was attired in a Spanish costume, and the rich lace mantilla fell upon snowy shoulders over a high gilt comb, and encircled gracefully a lovely face, with lips like coral and eyes like jet. A most magnificent head of hair was half hidden by the lace, and it was black as coal and glossy as satin. In a perfectly formed hand she held, coquettishly, an open fan of black and gold, with which she half shaded the lovely face, and from behind which she peeped in the most bewitching way possible. Well, I ruminated, your appearance is prononcé enough. There ought to be no difficulty in tracing you. Whether you are worth the trouble or not is another question. I was, however, wrong. For several weeks passed, and no trace of Mrs. Barnsley could be discovered. I had, in ways of our own, which you are well aware are not overly cleanly ways, found out a good deal of the private habits of the lady in question. She had quite abandoned herself to the life of pleasure open to her by her fortunate marriage, and attended opera, theatre, and all sorts of amusements to her heart's content. It was patent to every one but Barnsley himself that she simply tolerated her doting husband as a machine for signing cheques, and her jewellery was stated to have been of an almost unbelievable value for a person in her position in life. She had been rather a favourite in her own particular set, being liberal and open-handed at her husband's expense, but she made few intimate acquaintances. She had encouraged talent too, and one of the most frequent visitors at her St Kilda villa was the talented tragedian Smeldon, who had played for some months in Melbourne during the previous season. Well, we could not find her, and we gave up the search. Mr Barnsley retired to one of his favourite stations to indulge his growing melancholy, 
and the affair of Mrs. Barnsley's disappearance had ceased to be a nine days' wonder when I was sent on duty to Dunedin in New Zealand. In transacting the business I had in hand, I observed the walls posted with huge bills notifying the appearance in Hamlet of the well-known Smeldon under the management of my old friend, Dan Westerfield, at the Royal. I had almost forgotten the Barnsley episode when the name of Smeldon recalled it to me, and when I had my own business fully on train, I determined to call on Westerfield with a view to getting something out of him about Smeldon that might possibly throw a light on the Barnsley affair. I found my old friend, the manager, up to his eyes in business in his own room at the theatre, but he welcomed me very heartily nevertheless, and, after supplying wine and cigars, began to question me about our Melbourne theatrical affairs. His natural curiosity satisfied on that point, it was easy to lead the conversation toward his own doings and prospects in Dunedin. "'I've had a very fair season so far,' he said, "'but I'm in a heap of trouble now with some of my people.' "'As how?' I inquired. "'You know I have Smeldon. "'Yes, I noticed his name in the posters. "'And did you observe the name of the lady who plays Lady Macbeth? "'No, I did not. "'Well, before I explain any further, read that.' "'And he pushed an open letter toward me. "'It was written in a bold feminine hand "'and dated about a fortnight previous. "'Westerfield, Esquire. "'Manager, Theatre Royal, Dunedin. "'Sir, the writer of this is a young lady "'of a good and wealthy family.' whose friends, as well as her own convictions, have assured her that she is possessed of a considerable natural talent as a dramatic actress. She is aware that business gentlemen have no patience or time to bestow on long epistles, so comes to the point at once. If you are disposed to bring out, under your management, on the boards of the Royal at Dunedin, the young lady whom you and the public will know as Miss Elena Chatteris, her friends will furnish her with a valuable wardrobe and real jewels, and, in addition, pay you fifty pounds bonus for instruction in the technicalities of your art. Address, Post Office Wellington. Yours, etc., Helena Chatteris. Well, said Westfield, as I finished reading this odd communication, and by way of an Irishman's reply, I said, Well, also. I've engaged her, he went on. Oh, you have? And is she here? "'Yes, and was at rehearsal yesterday, and the day previous. "'What is she like? "'A splendid-looking girl, with the air and wardrobe of a princess. "'She will be here presently. "'You must stop and see her. "'And talent. "'Has she any? "'Hum, um, not much. "'But with such a face and figure, and with such dress and jewels, "'she is sure to take for a while at least. "'But it is through her I am in the mess I told you of. "'Smeldon has refused, or almost refused, to act with her. I don't know what the deuce to do. Have you signed any agreement with the Lady Fair? No, it was settled that none should be signed until after her first appearance. Send her about her business, then. Ah, wait till you see her, Sinclair, and then ask me to lose such an attraction for my stage. And the fifty pounds, I added with a laugh, just as the door opened, and Smeldon himself walked into the room. Although I was not personally acquainted with this well-known actor of that day, I had of necessity seen him frequently, but, as you, my valued readers, may not have been so fortunate, I must describe him to you. He was, at that time, about thirty-five, and one of the handsomest men I have ever seen, but with an expression and air of cunning and self-conceit that destroyed the effect of his personal beauty. He was dark, and had a magnificent pair of black eyes, and had the reputation of bewitching most of the fair sex, who were unlucky enough to be considered worthy of his fascinating attention. "'Good morning, Mr. Westerfield. I hope I do not disturb you.' "'Not at all. Pray be seated, Smeldon. You need not mind the presence of Mr. Smith, a very old friend of mine. Mr. Smeldon, Mr. Smith. And we were introduced, Westerfield being too wide awake to introduce me to anyone as Detective Sinclair. I bowed, and so did Smeldon, of course and then I moved toward a window to permit of the manager and actor transacting their business more freely. The window was not, however, so far away as to prevent me from hearing the gist of their conversation, though my eyes were bent upon the newspaper I held in my hands. I heard that Smeldon was reiterating his objection to play with Miss Chatteris, and that had not an unimpeachable agreement been signed between them, he would have gone off and left Westerfield to do the best he could without his star. 
'I think you are unreasonable, Smeldon,' Westerfield said, after a wordy argument had been carried on. 'Miss Chatteris will do you no discredit, and have I not pledged my word that if she does on her first night, I shall not engage her permanently? Just think of the expense I have been at, and now certainly disappointing the public at this time, when they have been worked up with advertisements and puffs, would irretrievably ruin me. And think of my reputation as an actor, which is of more value to me than yours to you as a manager, playing with a conceited amateur such as Miss Chatteris, who has considerably less talent than some of your ballet girls. I decidedly object to playing with her. I decidedly object to it. So do I, most decidedly, Mr. Smeldon, and it will be necessary for Mr. Westerfield to choose between you and me. I will not appear with you. The voice was a woman's, and guessing it to be that of Miss Chatteris, I turned around. She was standing just inside the door in a robe and jacket of black velvet trimmed with fur, and a dark Spanish hat drooping its handsome plumes over her brow and shoulder. She was certainly a beautiful woman, but appeared much older than I had fancied her to be. She looked thirty at least, and the hair which peeped from under the broad hat was a beautiful bright brown. Her eyes were dark and large, her parted lips showed teeth like pearl. I had certainly not seen her before as Miss Chatteris, yet somehow her face, or its expression, seemed too familiar to me. It was not a good face, and as I looked at it, it exhibited a will and a temper not pleasing in the face of a woman, whether feigned or real. I beg your pardon, Mr. Westerfield, but I knocked. You were so much engaged in hearing this fine gentleman abuse me that you did not hear me. I assure you, Miss Chatteris, don't take the trouble to assure me of anything, sir. I am obliged to you for taking my part. But having heard Mr. Smeldon's decided objection to playing with me, and his opinion of my talent, I repeat, you can choose between us. I refuse to appear with him." How fiendishly beautiful she looked as her temper got fairly the mastery, and her splendid eyes flashed like meteors. Mr. Westerfield felt particularly awkward, and looked so, while even Smeldon fidgeted on his seat, and at last rose to his feet. "'I cannot break my signed agreement with Mr. Smeldon,' the manager said, at least without such a forfeit as I cannot afford. Nor indeed do I wish to do so. I trust you and Mr. Smeldon will come to some better understanding and then things will go on smoothly enough. I am answered, sir, she returned haughtily. You have treated me most shamefully, but I shall profit by the lesson in dealing with some other gentleman of your profession. Pray provide yourself with some other lady who may be more acceptable to Mr. Smeldon. I shall go and pack up my wardrobe. And with a cool bow she turned toward the door and disappeared, leaving consternation behind her. "'You see what a mess I'm in,' said Westerfield, as Smeldon took his hat, and with a few words of adieu hastened out also. "'Who would be a theatrical manager, eh, Sinclair? What the deuce am I to do?' And the fine diamond on my friend's little finger gleamed among his dark curls as he scratched his head, by way, I presume, of getting some new idea out of it. "'If you had confined yourself to legitimate business, this would not have happened,' was my comforting rejoinder. Whatever possessed you to introduce this handsome adventuress as your leading lady is more than I can tell. Adventuress? How do you know Miss Chatteris is an adventuress? he cried. What adventuress would offer herself on such terms, and with the jewels of a queen? It is precisely because she has done so that I doubt the fair lady, I replied. She must have some ulterior motive, and as I am likely to be detained here for some time, I'll try if I cannot discover what that motive is. I wouldn't be a suspicious policeman for Miss Chatteris's fifty pounds, he retorted sulkily. Miss Chatteris's promised fifty pounds, I said, which you have not got and never will get. Well, old chap, all this recrimination will not help me out of my difficulty. Try if you cannot suggest something. My suggestion would be that you consult Mr. Smeldon and take his advice. It is to his interest to help you in procuring a competent lady for the part. I believe you are right. I have no doubt he is still in the theatre. I will go and look him up. But before he had time to rise, another knock was heard at the door, and Miss Chatteris once again made her appearance. She carried in both hands a Morocco-covered casket, mounted with silver, which she set upon Mr. Westerfield's table, as she inquired if he had any objection to give it a place in his safe, until she called again for it. "'You see, it is my jewel-case,' she explained, as she unlocked the casket and threw back the lid. 
and you are aware they are too valuable to be carried about in a cab while I make my arrangements for procuring another theatrical engagement. I could scarcely forbear an exclamation at the beauty and value of the gems so exhibited. On the upper tray lay a parure and tiara of diamonds, fit, as the manager had said, for a queen, with rings, earrings, and bracelet to match. Lifting the first tray, Miss Chatteris exposed a set of lovely pearls and emeralds in their velvet nests, and, lower down, a third with a magnificent suite of rubies. Wherever could this woman have procured such handsome jewels, I wondered to myself. Had she been an established and famous actress, it would not so surprise one, but an amateur. There is something which does not meet the eye in this. "'Will you take temporary charge of them, Mr. Westerfield?' "'Certainly, with pleasure, Miss Chatteris. I am only sorry that such a necessity has arisen. Is there no hope that you and Smeldon may yet agree to act together?' "'None whatever.' And the lady once more bowed herself out. She must have met the object of her aversion in the passage, as Smeldon entered instantly, requesting Westerfield's presence in the green room for a few moments, and the manager went out with him, motioning with his hand toward the jewel-case as he looked toward me, as much as to tell me to have an eye on the valuable deposit until his return. I sat for a few moments puzzling my brains over the strange fact of such valuable jewellery being in the possession of such a woman as I concluded Miss Chatteris to be, when, once again, to my great annoyance, the lady herself made her entrance. "'I have overlooked this brooch,' she observed, as she laid a handsome cameo on the table, and unlocked the casket again, and laid it in the upper tray. "'Will you kindly hand the key to Mr. Westerfield on his return?' And having relocked the case, she tendered me the peculiar little key, which, of course, I took from her hand. I watched her graceful figure as she carried the box nearer to Mr. Westerfield's desk. She had enveloped her form in a handsome velvet mantle, fur-trimmed to match her dress, and her back being toward me, I had a fine opportunity of admiring the graceful pose of her shapely head, and, as she turned her face a little, the most perfect profile imaginable but it was not until she turned to address a few parting words to me that I again caught the wonderful resemblance of whom I could not recall, which had struck me at first sight of Miss Chatteris. On Westerfield's return I delivered to him the precious key, and saw him lock both it and the casket in his private safe, the key of which he always carried about his person, and shortly after I made my adieu, having appointed a meeting for the following day. It is a tedious thing to wait for anything but hanging round in a strange town where you have no acquaintances would try the patience of a saint. Under the circumstances, it was, perhaps, fortunate for me that I had fallen in with Westerfield and the Chatteris affair. It gave me something to think about, and as it eventuated, something also to do. In a late Melbourne daily, I saw the recommendation of a correspondent that a certain, to him, obnoxious individual should be sent to Captain Standish for the detective force, as no respectable firm would employ him in his obnoxious capacity as a spy. Now this is rather hard on us, and on Captain Standish, but I am afraid there is a considerable soupçon of truth in it. We do a good deal of dirty work, which no man of sensitive and honourable feelings would think of putting a hand to. But que voulez-vous? All ranks and grades of society must be filled, and some of our chaps work with a will. I did in the Chatteris business, and I was never sorry for it. In the billiard-room of the hotel I had put up at, I encountered, rather to my surprise, Smeldon the actor himself, and rather more to my surprise still, he displayed an evident inclination to make friends with me. He had been, to say the least of it, rather cool at our introduction in the afternoon at my friend Westerfield's, and at first I fought rather shy of him. But business is business, and remembering that I might glean some information concerning the chatteris from him, I met his advances half-way. We had a game or two, and I waited until he was warmed with the wine we had played for, when I ventured to ask him if he had made it up with Miss Chatteris. No, he returned, and although I had no such intention at the time, I am glad she overheard my opinion of her. It settled the matter. I understand she has left the theatre. Yes, she left before I did. Do you know anything of the lady's antecedents? I know nothing whatever of her, save that she has a handsome face and an intolerable conceit of herself and no more dramatic talent than that Q. But jewels fit for an empress, eh? Oh, we heard enough about them, no doubt they're paste. That they are not, I've seen them. She left her jewel-case with Westerfield for safety, until she is settled somewhere. 
What arrangement can Westerfield make to supply her place? He has, at my instigation, written to engage Madame Y. She is sure to accept, and will be here in time. She and I have played together before. That was all that passed between us on that subject, and shortly after Smeldon bade me good night and went his way. I followed him out onto the veranda, cigar in mouth, and was startled to find a woman's hand laid suddenly on my shoulder. Under the light of the door lamp, a haggard looking woman in shabby black attire was standing and had darted forward and addressed me before Smeldon was quite out of sight. What did you call that gentleman? Is he not Smeldon, the tragedian? Yes, Mr. Smeldon has just left. Curse him! she cried vehemently. When I am a ragged and homeless outcast. Curse him, I say. Curse him! I thought the woman was crazy as she shook her fist after the actor's retreating form and I was interested. "'What has he done to you?' I asked. "'What has he done to me, eh? Never you mind. You'll not have to ask what I have done to him before long. You'll see it. Watch him, Mr. Sinclair. Watch Smeldon. Ha! I know you, far as you are from Melbourne. Watch Smeldon, and then call yourself a D.' With these words the speaker darted off, apparently in pursuit of Smeldon, and left me overwhelmed with astonishment. I had never seen the woman before to my knowledge, yet she seemed to know me quite well, and she had told me to watch Smeldon. What on earth was I to watch Smeldon for? Or what did she mean by casting such a slur on my detective abilities in connection with the watch she recommended? But wondering did not help me, and my first question, when I went to Westerfield next day, was if he knew anything of Smeldon's private character. I related my interview with the woman and her strange remarks, and my friend looked grave at once. "'I've heard that Smeldon is a married man,' he replied, "'and that his wife was the inmate of a private asylum in New South Wales. "'Could the woman you speak of possibly be her?' "'She certainly looked and acted like a lunatic,' I said. "'But how could she recognise me if she has been so long in confinement? "'You will recollect I am only retailing hearsay, Sinclair, "'for, of course, one would not touch on so delicate a subject to Smeldon himself. "'But I did hear that Mrs. Smeldon was at one time an inmate of a Melbourne private asylum,' she may have seen you there she might have i have visited there but if it is as you think would it not be as well to warn smeldon as she seems a desperate character and threatened him roundly i should not like to have a mad woman dogging my steps in the dark it is such a delicate subject westerfield repeated what a fortunate thing that s did not take to miss chatteris that is to say if his wife is in dunedin it was jealousy that drove her crazy at least so they say there was no farther opportunity of discussing the actor's private affairs, for, in reply to a tap at the door, Westerfield's, "'Come in,' threw it back to admit the irrepressible Miss Chatteris. She looked exquisitely lovely, and was evidently dressed to kill. Instead of black velvet, she wore a handsome blue silk, richly embroidered in white satin stitch, and a bewitching blue satin bonnet encircled by a snow-white ostrich plume. Having bowed gracefully, and greeted both mr westerfield and mr smith she seated herself in the chair placed for her by the manager and stated that she had called for her jewel case i have decided to place them in the bank in the interim she said and have a cab waiting at the door i am much obliged to you mr westerfield for giving them a night's lodging and shall now relieve you of the responsibility with a few words of ordinary courtesy westerfield unlocked the safe and placed the case before her on the table and then the key which he had laid on the shelf of the safe beside the casket. "'Shall I carry it to the cab for you, Miss Chatteris?' he asked. "'Although not heavy, it is bulky for a lady's hands.' "'Thank you. It is a pleasant burden,' she replied, laughing so as to show her lovely white teeth. "'But before I go, I wish to get out a brooch for ordinary wear.' And she placed the key in the ornamental silver lock, and threw back the lid of the casket. The open lid was between me and the jewels, so I did not at first understand the look of surprise that seemed to flash into the widely open Chatteris's eyes, and was reflected in my friend the manager's visage in a stare of horror and consternation. From the casket, Miss Chatteris turned her eyes on Mr. Westerfield, who moved his to my face as if seeking inspiration or assistance. With much wonder, I rose and looked over the open lid and then I saw that the upper tray, at least, which had held the diamonds, was empty. Before a word was spoken, the beautiful woman lifted the first tray, and exposed the second, also empty, then the second, to find the same emptiness in the third. 
diamonds pearls and emeralds and rubies had all disappeared what does this mean mr westerfield she asked as she laid down the empty trays on the table and fixed her grand eyes steadily on the manager if it is a joke it is a very cruel one joke i assure you i know no more about it than you do i have never seen the interior of the casket since you locked it yourself i gave the key to mr smith she went on as she turned her gaze on me and he gave it to me i put both casket and key in the safe in my friend's presence and i have not seen either until now i believe you are aware of the value of my jewels she said so coolly as to raise my private suspicions for a woman does not usually lose her gems even when of simple value without making a fuss about it but perhaps mr smith is not aware that the property i left in your charge and of which i gave the key to him for you represented over a thousand pounds in value for which i can produce jewellers receipts the emphasis she placed upon the mr smith and the insolent and suspicious look which accompanied it raised my dander i know nothing and care less about the value of your jewellery madam i retorted shortly though i may have my own opinions about it but i tell you what i do know that you had better not cast any insinuations at me my name is not smith i am a melbourne detective and my character is of more value to me than a cartload of imitation jewels you are beneath the notice of any lady sir she said as her handsome face grew almost crimson with anger and perhaps some other feeling i have nothing to say to you it is to you mr westerfield i look for the restitution of my property for it was in his charge i left them no you didn't i interrupted for you yourself again opened your box after you had given it in charge to my friend and you will please to remember that neither he or i saw the contents after the last time you manipulated them miss chatteris's cheeks lost every particle of colour as i said this and she lifted one white and beringed hand partly before her face as if to ward off a blow it was then that in spite of the changed hue of hair and the different style of attire i recognised the likeness i could not previously locate it was to the portrait of mrs barnsley like a flash of light the whole thing was plain to me and i saw a way to get my friend out of his distressing position something he saw in my air probably gave him heart for he had been completely dumbfounded before miss chatteris had time to open her angry lips in reply to my abrupt accusation he pushed the casket toward the lady and opened the door of his room please take yourself and your property out of my room madam and if you have any charge to make against me make it through your solicitor i shall make it through the police she cried as she rose and pushed the chair back so roughly that it fell with a loud clatter if i were you madam i should try to keep out of the hands of the police as long as possible i retorted and i shall report you sir to your superior officers in melbourne a la bonne heure miss chatteris take care my report is not in before yours as the fair dame banged the door behind her in a very unladylike manner westerfield turned a face of consternation towards me here's a pretty go he said and she's left that cursed box behind her shall i run and send it after her by no means i'm delighted at the chance of having a look at it and i drew the handsome casket towards me as well as the empty velvet-lined trays scattered on the table as miss chatteris had left them what do you think of it sinclair he asked anxiously i think it's a swindle of some sort which i mean to find out in the meantime pass me a telegraph form like a good fellow and get a messenger to take a telegram to the office at once westerfield did as i requested and this is the telegram i dispatched without delay to victoria come at once to dunedin your wife is here need i add that it was addressed to mr barnsley as soon as this telegram was dispatched i commenced a close examination of the jewel case i had seen it consigned to the safe myself and of course never for one instant suspected westerfield of abstracting the jewellery he himself assured me that the key of the safe never left his own person so there was but one conclusion to come to miss chatteris as she chose to call herself must have managed to empty the box herself when she had come in during my friend's absence ostensibly to place in the casket a brooch she had forgotten but how had the feat been accomplished i carefully examined each tray as i replaced it without any satisfactory result until i came to the upper one which did not seem to take kindly to its position 
Pressing it down pretty sharply, there was a click, and the whole front of the box fell down upon the table. This was the secret, then. The front worked upon a hinge and a spring, and the three trays were easily drawn out together. Miss Chatteris had a double set of trays for that casket, and she had doubtless replaced the full ones by empty trays before delivering me the key on the previous day. "'But what good will this discovery do me?' questioned Westerfield ruefully. "'I am still responsible for the jewellery which disappeared while in my possession. "'The formation of this casket is sufficient evidence of intended trickery,' I replied. "'But we'll have more evidence than that before I'm done with Miss Chatteris. "'Meanwhile, lock up this valuable box and keep it safely.' I did not say a word to Westerfield as to my suspicions of the identity of the so-called Miss Chatteris, nor was it until I had got back to my hotel and put on my considering cap in the company of a good cigar only that the full meaning of the strange woman's words struck me. Watch Smeldon. Of course. What an ass I was. Was it not Smeldon who was such a favoured visitor of the fascinating Mrs. Barnsley in Melbourne? Was there a doubt that in spite of their pretended enmity they were accomplices in the swindle which sought my friend, the manager, as a victim? If there was, let me set my wits to work in order to elucidate it. I wanted to see that woman, whom I had set down as Mrs. Smeldon again, and I watched about the hotel door that evening, after having set the Dunedin police to find out where Miss Chatteris had taken up her abode. I had some hopes of Smeldon turning up again for his revenge at billiards, but he did not put in an appearance. In spite of that fact, however, I was not disappointed in seeing the woman. It was about half-past eleven, and I was about returning, after a short turn down the street, in the direction she had taken on the previous night, when a dark shadow appeared at my elbow, and the same voice addressed me. "'Well, Detective Sinclair, were you wishing to see me tonight?' "'You have guessed it, Mrs. Smeldon. I was.' "'Ha! Huh, you know me, then. Well, that shows that you have not been idle today, and as I also wanted to see you, I am here.' If you have anything private to say, we had better go over into the gardens. This is rather too public a spot for telling secrets. And I led the way to a public reserve at a little distance. I want you to go a little farther than that, she said. That is to say, if you want to find Mrs. Barnsley. I have found her. Ah, oh, you're not so stupid as I thought, she cried with a harsh laugh. But there is, maybe, some other reason for your wishing to see that lady at home. There is. But I am puzzled to know how you found out so much about my private business. It is connected with my private business, and I can't attend to the one without being mixed up with the other. Are you not afraid that Smeldon will find out you are here, and put you in the place you escaped from again? I asked. And with the question was aroused the slumbering devil in the poor, distraught woman's breast. If she almost shouted as she stopped suddenly and gesticulated violently in the street if he finds out it will be all the worse for himself i am ready for him ay and willing seeing we had reached to the garden railings i paused to question her before going any farther i can't go with you i said unless you tell me why you want me where is it that you wish me to go haven't i told you that i am taking you to the private residence of mrs barnsley why you have a warrant for her arrest in your pocket-book now this was quite true though in what inexplicable manner this poor creature had become acquainted with the fact that i kept a profound secret was far beyond my comprehension it was with the greatest difficulty that i had persuaded mr barnsley to take out a warrant i had boldly tried to make the too confiding squatter see his wife's flight and extravagant use of his name to an unfilled cheque in the light all disinterested persons saw it and I had so far succeeded that I carried the warrant in my pocket truly. But how did this woman know it? You wonder, she said with one of her wild laughs. But you will wonder more before you have done with me. Here we are. Prepare yourself to interview the fascinating Mrs. Barnsley. Now I had no intention of interfering with Mrs. Barnsley at present, but I was curious to know what connection my guide had with the fair deceiver so I followed her to the back door of a pretty detached cottage, which we reached by a right of way and a door on the latch in a brick wall. At the back all was darkness and silence, but my guide drew me into a small chamber which appeared to be a sort of lean-to against the back wall of the cottage itself, and here, when she had closed the door, she began to chuckle to herself as if in the height of enjoyment. I didn't at all like it, 
and I began to feel precious uncomfortable. What if I had allowed myself to be led into a trap by a mad woman? I say, my good woman, this won't do, you know, I remonstrated. Where have you brought me, and what have you brought me here for? Mind, I am not without both revolver and handcuffs, the use of which I am fully acquainted with. Are you afraid? she whispered with a sneering hiss. Where have I brought you, eh? Well, I'll tell you more than you ask. I have brought you to the residence of Miss Chatteris, with whom I engage to-day as general servant, and I brought you that you might see a favoured visitor of hers. There is a mark for your revolver, and a use for your handcuffs. As she uttered the words, she opened the door of a sort of closet, and pointed to a streak of light that appeared to permeate the wall from an inner chamber. The hint was not lost on me. Stepping forward, I placed my eye to the aperture, and there I saw a scene which, had it not been for the woman's words of preparation, would have astonished me. The room I looked into, in that most surreptitious manner, was, though small, handsomely furnished. A pleasant fire burned in a low grate, and upon a crimson-covered table lay a delightful little impromptu supper, or rather, the remains of one. More than one decanter, too, sparkled palely or redly in the lamplight. In a luxurious chair at one side of the fire lounged Miss Chatteris, in all the glory of full evening dress, and sparkling with gems, and on the other, with a cigar between his lips, and a half-full glass in his hand, sat no other than Smeldon himself. Now all this was very pleasant to me, as confirmatory of my own suspicion regarding the identity of Miss Chatteris with Mrs. Barnsley, but on the table among the glasses and decanters, but a little nearer to the lady's hand, lay an object that interested me far more than anything else in the room. You will understand the interest when I tell you that the object was a facsimile of the jewel case in Westerfield's safe. They were evidently conversing about it too, for he pointed towards it with his cigar, and, I fancy, looked angry and excited, while her fair brow was corrugated into unbecoming wrinkles. The woman did not, however, give me much time to examine their several expressions of countenance more closely, for she dragged me impatiently by the sleeve and whispered eagerly, "'Well, what are you going to do? Are you going to arrest her?' "'Arrest her? No, I'm not ready for that step yet.' "'What did I bring you here for, then?' she cried. "'On a fool's errand, as far as your object is concerned, but it was a lucky errand for me, as it has turned out.' Do you see that box on the table with the silver mounting? Yes. What of it? Only that if you can get hold of that box between this and tomorrow night, and let me have it in my hand for only five minutes, you will get Miss Chatteris into as fine a mess as you could wish. Miss Chatteris? she repeated with a sneer. Never mind the name. Can you get the box? Easily, tomorrow night. She told me she was going to spend the evening out. But I can't get the key. She carries it at her watch-chain. It doesn't at all matter about the key, was my response, for, of course, I concluded that the key in Westerfield's possession would fit the counterfeit casket. If you don't help me to my revenge on that woman, I'll do nothing for you, she said vehemently as we emerged from the yard and gained the vicinity of a lamp-post. I can manage my own matters with him, curse him, but the woman you can punish more than I can. You may safely leave her to me, I replied, and if you take my advice, you will let your husband alone. What can you do against a man with the reputation of a great actor, and hosts of friends around him, while the law gives him the power to again consign you to a living death in the place you have escaped from? I defy him, she shouted in one of her paroxysms. I defy you too, and the whole world. What can I do against him, eh? You will see. You will see! You will see! And waving her thin arms wildly above her head, she rushed away into the darkness of the street. I was annoyed at not having come to a more decided understanding with her about getting my hands on the coveted casket, but my annoyance was almost overpowered by the memory of the mad woman's terrible face when she spoke of her husband. I began to question my right to keep the secret of this woman's escape from her husband, as, if she should be guilty of any rash act, I should be morally responsible for it. Thinking thus, as I returned to the hotel, I decided on informing Smeldon first thing in the morning, and trust to the chapter of accidents which had so often befriended me for the possession of the jewel case. 
I was disappointed in this, for I found on inquiry that Smeldon had left town on a pleasure trip with some friends, and Miss Chatteris was most likely one of the party. At least she was not at home, for I walked to the cottage boldly, and knocked at the door. It was opened by the demented and deceived wife, who laughed loudly as she recognised me. "'Ha, ha! Did you come for the box? Well, I don't mind letting you see it, for then you won't come back again. I don't want you here to-night. He's coming to supper again, and I have orders from my mistress, ha, 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 to prepare a lot of dainties for him.' I was too glad of the chance to balk her, as, to be prepared, I had provided myself with the key of the casket, as well as the empty trays which I carried in a parcel in my hand. The woman ushered me into the lady's private chamber, where, under a looking-glass, and carefully covered with a lace drapery, the poor creature pointed out the object of my search. As I had hoped and anticipated, my key opened the second jewel-case. Deftly I found the same spring which let the front of the box fall and without difficulty I drew out the trays that sparkled with the gems, real or false, I had last seen in our box at Westerfields. Then I opened my parcel and fitted my trays easily into the place of the others, which I folded in my brown paper and consigned to the pocket of my overcoat. The woman looked on in silence, but in evident pleasurable excitement, until the case was restored to its place on the toilet, and then, as we returned to the entrance hall, she laughed so loud and long as to frighten me. Hush, I said. You will arouse the whole neighbourhood, and then there will be suspicions. Mind you say nothing about what I have done, unless you want to lose your revenge on this fair lady. Oh, you may depend on me. I'm no fool. I'll come and tell you all about it some of these nights. You may conceive the delight of Westerfield at my arrival with the full trays in my possession. He had that morning received a communication from Miss Chatteris's solicitor claiming £985, the value of jewellery, herein specified, lost or detained by you after having been given into your care by Helena Chatteris. "'Oh, this is fun!' I cried as I read the letter. "'How stupid they will look when we hand them the full casket! £985 indeed!' I had an opinion from a professional jeweller on my way here, and they are every one paste, not worth twenty pounds. Don't reply to the lawyer until I have the pleasure of bringing the lady here to receive her gems. I troubled no more about the Chatteris affair until the following day. Indeed, I had no time, as the business on which I had gone to Dunedin was reaching a denouement, and I had to attend it. At about eleven o'clock next morning, however, I knocked at the lady's door, and was admitted by a young girl to her presence. The lady, in an elegant morning dish a bell, was reclining in a chair in the same apartment which was overlooked by the crevice in the closet, and that she was not an early riser was evinced by the still steaming coffee-pot on the breakfast tray at her side. "'This is a most unexpected honour, Mr. Uh, Smith,' she said with infinite condescension and without paying her visitor the respect of rising from her seat. "'I think you owe your admission to the fact of my being very curious as to your possible business. Knowing my self-conceit so well as you do, after all those years' acquaintance, my valued public, you will readily believe that this speech riled me not a little, and undoubtedly changed my immediate intentions towards the imprudent speaker. "'Your curiosity shall soon be gratified, Miss Chatteris,' I retorted. I came at the instance of my friend, Mr. Westerfield, to inform you that your Morocco-covered case is in his way, and that he will be glad if you will remove it. In his way? Did ever any one express such audacity? Does Mr. Westerfield think for one moment that I am such a fool as to take out of his possession, empty, a casket I left in his charge, full of valuable gems? no sir my solicitor has received instructions to proceed against mr westerfield for the full value of my jewellery which i lay at nine hundred and eighty five pounds we will see what a jury will say to your friend's breach of trust and with the air of a tragedy queen the speaker rose and haughtily bowed toward the door as though to terminate the interview the case will never go before a jury madam i said coolly seating myself in the most comfortable armchair i could find and if it did, it might puzzle the pseudo Miss Chatteris to account for the duplicate of her jewel case, which has so many convenient trays and springs. The handsome face blanched to a sickly pallor, 
and she laid her pretty hands on the breakfast table for support. You see, Miss Chatteris, that we know too much, and as pretty an attempt at swindling as was ever exposed shall be laid before the public if you do not come instantly with me and forgive Mr. Westerfield a receipt in full for your valuable imitation jewellery. She did not speak, but terror and astonishment were depicted plainly on her white face. "'You will please don your walking attire at once, Miss Chatteris,' I added, as I rose and opened the door. "'I shall wait in the hall for you, and have the pleasure of escorting you to Mr. Westerfield's office, and it will be as well not to keep me too long waiting. There are many who can arrange and carry out a crime that have not the pluck to bravely meet its unanticipated consequences, and Miss Chatteris was one of the number.' The fact of her being unaware of the extent of my knowledge only increased her terror, and the few words in which she attempted to reply to me conveyed little meaning, save an assurance that she only wanted to get her own property, and had no wish to in any way discommode Mr. Westerfield. My reply was the reiteration that I awaited her, and she hastened from the room. I followed her into the hall, and was pleased to encounter, on her way, after her mistress, the girl who had opened the door for me. "'What has become of the woman who was servant here yesterday?' I asked. "'She left this morning, sir. Miss Chatteris said she had some disagreement, and she left at once. She told me she would come back tonight for her clothes. Is there any message for her?' "'Oh, no, thank you. Please tell your mistress I am in a hurry.' In a very short time the lady appeared, and, hailing the first cab I saw, we were very soon deposited on the pavement in front of the Royal. Five minutes more brought us into the presence of Westerfield. He rose as we entered, and silently placed a chair for the lady. "'I really do not know what you require of me, Mr. Westerfield,' she said, as she lifted the veil off her white face. "'Your friend here has threatened me strangely, as if there were anything wrong in a woman wishing to regain possession of her own.' "'There would be nothing wrong whatever in that, madam,' I replied but it is something not only morally but legally wrong for a woman to deliberately try and commit a swindle to the extent of nine hundred and eighty five pounds on a person she well knew to be innocent of the fraud imputed to him well, what do you want of me she asked with a trembling lip we want you to take possession of your so-called casket of jewellery i replied and we want your receipt in full for the delivery of the same mr westerfield will you kindly return to the lady the case she left in your charge Westerfield unlocked the safe and handed the box to me. With the key, which he had tied to it, I opened the affair and pushed it over the table to Miss Chatteris. Her eyes opened with puzzled astonishment as they wandered over the glittering contents of the tray which she lifted, and then, as a suspicion of the truth overwhelmed her, a hot flush burned up into her cheeks. Still, she tried to carry out her affectation of innocent ignorance. "'Why, these are my jewels, Mr. Westerfield,' did you after all only remove them for a lark i am not in the habit of larking madam westerfield returned stiffly though it was doubtless in the perpetration of one that you substituted the empty trays for the full ones after you had left the case in my charge i will trouble you for the receipt my friend mentioned and he pushed writing materials before her she gave me one look of fierce rage and then began to write received from mr westerfield quite safe the casket of jewellery imitation jewellery if you please i interrupted we have submitted your rubbish to a jeweller and there is not value for fifteen pounds in your morocco box she was evidently boiling with suppressed passion but amended the receipt and then rose and lifted her jewellery i will find out who you are she said to me as her fine eyes flashed angrily and threateningly and though you seem to have the best of it now the day may come when I shall pay you with interest for your smart interference. Don't go until I have given you the information you seem anxious for, I retorted, as I placed myself between her and the door. That will inform you who and what I am, Mrs. Barnsley, and for the rest I have a warrant out for your arrest in my pocket, executed at the instance of your unfortunate husband. She fell back into her seat and stared at the detective's card I held before her eyes on the table. All at once, the full force of her position seemed to overwhelm the miserable creature. She did not attempt to deny her identity, but only gasped out as she lifted her terrified eyes to mine. "'What does he want to arrest me for?' "'Perhaps to punish you for swindling him out of a large sum of money. Perhaps to incarcerate you in a lunatic asylum. How should I know? At all events, there is the warrant. You are at liberty to examine it as closely as you like.' 
"'Are you going to arrest me?' she asked, as she tremblingly pushed the paper from her and rose from her seat. "'Not at present,' I replied. "'I have sent for your husband and expect him in a day or two. You may go home, but mind and stop there, for there is no chance of escape. The police have strict orders to watch you, and your cottage will be under the strictest supervision until I receive Mr. Barnsley's personal instructions.' Without a word she turned to the door which I opened for her. She still held the Morocco case against her side, and as she passed the door the box struck violently against the post and staggered her. She did not seem to feel it, however, but went on blindly, like one struck numb, until she disappeared from my view. "'There goes as completely checkmated villainy as ever lived,' I said as I closed the door. "'And not a bit too soon for you, Westerfield. You look like a ghost.' "'I feel ill,' he replied. It is sickening to see a woman place herself in such a position, and that fool of a Smeldon to be in league with such a swindler. I was told today that Smeldon was a confirmed gambler, I said, but I am more concerned about the danger he is in from the escaped wife. I am going to hunt him up now and tell him plainly that she is in Dunedin. Having ascertained where the actor was staying, I made my way there just in time to catch him at lunch. Of course he had not had time to see Miss Chatteris, as I may still continue to call her, since my late interview with her, so that he was quite ignorant of my acquaintance with his private affairs. I found him in the billiard-room knocking about the balls, disconsolate for someone to stake a crown against him, and his gloomy face lighted up as I entered. "'By George! Smith! You're a perfect godsend! I'm regularly tripped. Have a game?' "'I'm sorry. I have not time, Smeldon, but I have a few words to say to you in private. Will you step out on the veranda with me?' He laid down the cue and looked at me with some curiosity. "'Something about Westerfield,' he inquired. "'You and he seem to be very thick. Has Madame come?' "'No. My business concerns yourself alone,' I replied, as we gained the open air. "'And before I tell it, I must assure you that it is no wish to interfere in your private affairs, but a real anxiety for your safety that makes me give you the hint I am about to do.' "'My private affairs! Anxiety for my safety!' he repeated, looking suspiciously into my face. Doubtless he fancied I had become acquainted with his connection with Miss Chatteris, and feared I might know more of it than would be good for his character to divulge. Yes, by mere accident I have discovered that your wife has escaped from Cremorne Asylum and is here in Dunedin. I strongly advise you to see that she is again put in confinement, for the poor woman is decidedly mad, and, from her feelings toward you, I consider your life is not safe while she is at large. Smeldon's face flushed hotly whether from anger or some less understood feeling, I could not determine from his words. "'I am very much obliged to you,' he said, "'and shall see to it, though I really cannot guess how you have become so intimate with my domestic arrangements.' "'They are the subject of gossip, even in Dunedin,' I replied. "'But I think you ought to know that my name is not Smith. I am a member of the Melbourne Detective Force. And now, let me beg of you to put your affair into the hands of the police. I have heard the woman threaten you, and she is dangerous.' "'I am not afraid of her,' he returned rather sulkily, "'and I cannot help thinking you are mistaken. "'If the person you allude to had been watching or following me, "'I must have seen her. "'You have seen and spoken to her. "'She was engaged by the person known as Miss Chatteris as general servant, "'and only left her cottage and service this morning. "'Now, however, that I have warned you, my business is done. "'And with a salutation I walked away and left him. "'Little I guessed how and when I should next look upon his face.' I was beginning to be very anxious for Mr. Barnsley's arrival. He had replied instantly to my telegram with the information that he should be with me as soon as the boat could cross. I knew, however, that it would be, at least, two days ere he could possibly arrive, and during those two days all the responsibility of Miss Chatteris's safe-keeping was on my head. My own business, too, was completed, and I was, in duty bound, to return and report myself at Melbourne. I believed I could trust to the vigilance of the Dunedin police during the day, but I determined to watch the Chatteris cottage every night myself until I received personal instructions from Mr. Barnsley. It was a cold dark night as I joined the constable on duty near Miss Chatteris's cottage. The town clock had just struck eleven as I left the hotel, and as that was about the time supper appeared to be usually served, if I might judge from the night I peeped through the closet, I was wondering if Smeldon had again joined the fair impostor at that meal. "'Have you seen any one going in?' I asked the policeman. "'Yes, a gentleman about ten minutes ago. 
there is a light in the dining-room window at the side there even as he spoke a dark figure passed us quickly and silently and entered the back gate through which i had gained admittance something in the movement suggested the crazy wife to me and i had a great mind to follow her but after the warning i had already given snelden i did not feel warranted in again interfering how often i vainly wished afterwards that i had done so an hour or perhaps less afterwards as i was standing at the corner looking at the light in the window and debating with myself if it would not be prudent to try and get a peep at my fair charge through that closet there came to my ears the noise of a great crash and all at once the air was pierced by a succession of the most horrifying shrieks that ever issued from a woman's throat you may be sure i lost no time then in running through the back gate and into the lighted kitchen there was nothing in this apartment to account for the noise which had now entirely ceased mrs smeldon was seated quietly at the table eating her supper and the girl who had opened the door for me in the morning was lying on an old colonial sofa sound asleep what is the matter i asked what was the cause of those shrieks oh the loving couple are having a bit of a row she returned carelessly there's been too much drink flying about even the girl there is drunk it was a lucky thing i returned for my shawl for she nearly set the place on fire after she took in their supper this did not satisfy me and i hastened into the house on opening the door of the dining-room a scene presented itself that i have never yet been able to recall without a shudder of horror the table with its glittering contents of plate and crystal lay overturned upon the floor while the full light of a triple gas burner fell upon the awful face of miss chatteris crouching in a corner opposite the door the fallen table and chairs being between me and the floor i did not at first see the object from which every nerve of the terrified being seemed to recoil and on which her eyes glared with the fascinated horror making my way nearer among the debris i saw grovelling or rather writhing at her feet in the agonies of a terrible death that actor smeldon a horrible death indeed he had clutched his accomplice's dress and was in the short intervals of mortal agony trying to drag himself up by it while his glaring eyes sought hers in a most terror-stricken and desperate entreaty he could not utter in words foam gathered thickly on his lips in his strong but fruitless effort to speak and then again would come one of his awful fits of convulsion in which his back was elevated into an arch while his feet and head alone touched the floor a fearful death by poison i had seen the effects of strychnine before and recognized them now the wretched woman who seemed paralyzed with terror took no notice of my presence even as i dragged the body from her vicinity and raised his head on one of the cushions of the sofa her horrified eyes only followed it as a strong shiver passed over her frame and she sank in a huddled sitting posture on the carpet but as i heard the sound of the mad woman's voice behind me her eyes were lifted to the face of smeldon's wife and a succession of shrieks again burst from her lips ha ah, she knows me the handsome darling how nice she looks there in her silks and laces he's been telling her who his wife was eh she knows that i am mrs smeldon the pretty dear does and the poor fellow's supper has disagreed with him do send for the doctor if it's not too late ha ha i'm afraid it is too late what a pity he could not live long enough to put her into the asylum i went mad at good-bye my love get out of this you fiend i cried as an awful and last convulsion seized the dying man i believe in my heart you have poisoned the man and by heaven if you have you shall hang for it clever detective sinclair she returned in her still mocking tones i leave my dear husband and his new mad woman in your care may ye all be happy and she disappeared at the door with a mocking curtsey by this time the constable on duty had found his way to the scene and i dispatched him instantly for a doctor though i knew smeldon would be dead long before the services of one could be procured and seeing that nothing could be done for the poor fellow i turned my attention to the woman she was still crouched in the corner with glaring eyes and rigid features but as i began to lift the overturned furniture and lay some of the broken articles again on the table in order to make room for reseating the miserable-looking creature in a chair her eye caught one glittering object and the whole expression of her countenance changed as she recognized it without any assistance she struggled to her feet with a joyful exclamation and 
Seizing the article, she sat down on her chair with it on her lap, and with the delight of a child on the recovery of a favourite toy, opened it. Need I add that it was her jewel case the woman had regained possession of? I have witnessed many terrible scenes during my long professional connection, but one more humiliating to human nature than this I fail to recall. There lay the corpse on the sofa, stiffening in the fearful contortion of an agonised death, and there, opposite, but seemingly unconscious of the dread object, reclined the silken-robed, beautiful woman, decking herself with all the glittering contents of her casket. She had placed the tiara of imitation diamonds in her hair. The white shoulders were wreathed with sparkling gems. Wrists and fingers and bosom were loaded with glittering colours, and with a satisfied smile on her pale lips, Mrs. Barnsley sat proudly in her seat, and muttered words to herself, evidently of condescension and congratulation. The wretched murderess was right. Her rival was mad. Let us charitably hope that she had been mad from the beginning, and her wicked conduct but the result of a diseased brain. Of course there was an inquest on Smeldon, which resulted in finding of, died from the effects of strychnine, administered by some person or persons unknown though more than suspicion pointed strongly to the dead man's wife. Vainly, however, was she searched for by the police of all the colonies. The mad woman seemed to have disappeared, as she had appeared, like a shadow. Poor Barnsley carried his miserable wife back to Victoria, and for the few remaining years of her life devoted one of his homesteads to the sole use of herself and suitable attendants. She was quite harmless so long as she was permitted to wear her jewels and adorn herself with new and showy attire. This was years ago, and I am glad to tell you that in a second marriage Mr. Barnsley found the happiness he had only dreamed of in his first. The failure of his anticipated season in Dunedin nearly ruined my friend Westerfield, but the fact that he is now a wealthy and successful manager in London may assure you of his eventual success. End of story Section 4 of Stories from the Detectives Album by Waif Wanda, also known as Mary Fortune. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsty. Tom Doyle's Dream. How often have I had occasion, in the pages of the Australian Journal, to regretfully revert to my old evoker experience as a mounted man? If I had such a thing as a heart, I should fancy a voker printed on it indelibly as Queen Mary said that hers would be found branded with Calais when the English lost that too dear French town. But as I have long since used up that useless commodity, I mean a heart, I must be content to see the word often printed on paper as I recall my many happy or exciting experiences in that well-known district. We were riding toward Corong, now Wedderburn, Tom Doyle and I, one day in November, some twenty years ago, he going with dispatches, I, to attend the court, when we came to an old track that once led to Sinnott's. Tom pulled up, and of course I followed suit. I'm quite a new chum here now, he said, but isn't that the old Sinnott's track? It is, I replied. Why? Let me think. It's four years since I was stationed at Old Kingower now. Well, in a shanty on that track, I had one of the most awful experiences of my life. I was younger, of course, and it made a terrible impression on me at the time, but when I left the district, I half forgot it. Now, however, the sight of the old track brought it all before me again. I should like to go and see if there is any remains of that shanty. We haven't time today, Tom, but on our way back tomorrow we can take a cut round in that direction. Meantime, you can beguile the time by telling me the story. We rode on abreast, at a foot-pace, for the track, though level, was slanting up a steep incline through a belt of tea-tree scrub, that pushes itself out from old Sinnott's into the very confines of the bush through which the Corong Road goes. And so, with an accompaniment of many-toned birds, and the jingling of our own accoutrements, Tom Doyle told his story. I was stationed at Old Kingoa, as you know, and had been round to Red Bank on duty. As I reached Old Sinnott's, one of the heaviest storms I ever saw in the country broke over us, and before I reached the shanty I have told you of, I was drenched. Finding the utter impossibility of proceeding, I pulled up, determined to stop there until it was over. I knew the place well. It was kept by a man and wife named Blake. 
a sort of house of entertainment for swagmen it professed to be but of course there was a bottle in the corner or more likely a barrel i took my horse round to the slab stable and made him as comfortable as i could the thunder was by this time so heavy and the lightning so vivid as almost to deafen and blind one it was about five o'clock but on account of the storm nearly dark when i opened the back door and entered the shanty my appearance evidently created no pleasurable surprise the noise of the storm preventing my arrival having been heard blake himself a stout dark-complexioned englishman and two other men were gambling with dice at a side table on which a candle was already burning while mrs blake was preparing supper at the fire in the wide chimney of course i was greeted with great apparent welcome policemen in those days being always persons to pay court to especially where there was any sly grog selling going on mrs blake more particularly insisting on my sitting by the fire when i had taken off my jacket to dry and blake supplying me with a coat of his own for the time being of course i'm not selling you this constable dear mrs blake said with an insinuating cunning twinkle of a very bright dark eye as she handed me a smoking jorum of hot punch you know i would not do the like it's only to keep out the cold of course mrs blake i answered i know all about that well here's your health at all events my pipe was once lighted i sat and watched the progress of the gambling and the appearance of the two men they were both strangers to me one was a low-sized man with i think the heaviest black beard i ever saw he looked like a sailor and the other man called him bob the second was tall and fair with the air of as they say a broken-down swell bob called him bart and i gathered from their talk that they had been mates for some months on the then paying goldfield at reynolds creek bob was an eager ill-tempered gambler and as his losses increased he grew absolutely furious bart on the contrary was cool and sarcastic and had not the supper been ready they would i think have come to blows before long meanwhile the storm increased in violence until i was persuaded of the impossibility of reaching the station that night and decided on turning in a sort of sofa in the front room was placed at my disposal and having accepted another glass of hot stuff from mrs blake i curled myself up in the blankets after having looked after my horse and fell asleep i had a most terrible dream i thought that i was wakened by a peal of thunder that shook the hut to its foundations and that in the midst of its rolling detonations came to my ears shrieks and cries for mercy i tried to get up but could not my limbs seemed of lead and not to belong to me it seemed to me that i fell asleep again in spite of myself in the very midst of terrible calls to me personally for help help constable help they are murdering me oh god spare my life spare my life i was really aroused by a sound shaking and starting up found both blake and the wife bending over me she a candle in her hand and in night gear he in the same attire and shaking me roughly by the shoulder thank god cried the trembling woman as i sat up i thought he was in a fit what's the matter i asked feeling at the same time very queer a nightmare i guess constable blake replied you have been shouting and carrying on so that you nearly frightened the missus out of her life i've had a terrible dream blake i thought murder was going on are you sure those two men are all right all right he said what would hinder them to be all right they went to bed shortly after you did yourself as they mean to start for town at daybreak i can't believe it was a dream i said go and see if they are all right for the love of heaven come and see for yourself mr doyle the woman said and that'll maybe satisfy your mind the suggestion was good and easy acted upon i had not undressed and had only to get out on the floor and follow the woman with the light still in her hand she and blake led me to a room off the kitchen where we had had supper and where upon the ground simply rolled in their blankets lay the two men bob was nearest the wall bart nearest the door the thunder still rolled and grumbled as it passed into the distance but above it i could hear the heavy snores of the sleeping men your punch was too strong mrs blake i said i am sorry to have disturbed you and i went back to bed when i got up in the morning the men were gone now you've got my story sinclair what do you think of it i think you are hocused i answered i have often thought so myself since mark and that it was no dream at all but an awful reality 
I was moved the next day to Carisbrook, and the incident was partially forgotten. But strange to say, I saw that Bart today in Kingower, and the sight of him brought the whole thing before me again. Isn't this somewhere around where the mail cart was struck up a month ago? Yes, passing this scrub. But Revenon, if I was you, I'd look after that Bart and investigate that business of the shanty. I mean to. I've quite made up my mind. That's why I'm so anxious to see if Blake is still at that shanty. Even as the words were leaving his lips, there was a sharp report, and then another, and a couple of bullets barely escaped Doyle, grazing my left hand, and buried themselves in a tree at the right of the track. Bush Rangers was, of course, the first idea with both of us, and instinctively our revolvers were emptied into the scrub. Crack, 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 crack. If any man or men were hidden in the almost impenetrable tea-tree, they would have been riddled had they remained where the light, lifting smoke told of the discharged firearm, from the effects of which we so narrowly escaped. While Tom was discharging his last chamber, I was rapidly reloading, but there was no sign of a return shot, and what could we do? To search that scrub, or rather, to attempt searching it, would be a folly. A regiment might hide there and defy us. The best part of valour was discretion. "'We'd better get past the scrub, Doyle,' I suggested. "'There's no use stopping here to be made targets of. "'I'll have the bullets at all events.' And Tom coolly dismounted and cut the bullets from the tree, in which they were not deeply embedded. "'Rifle,' he observed, as he popped them into his pocket and remounted, when we soon left the scrub far behind. We made an early return start next morning, and reached the old Sinnet's Road by ten o'clock. As soon as we came within sight of the shanty so memorable to Tom Doyle, and saw the smoke ascending, he began to evince so strange an anxiety, as was evidence how deep an impression his dream of four years previous had made upon him. "'I wonder if the Blakes are still there,' he said. "'If they are, I shall take it as proof that my dream was really a dream. Surely no woman could stop in such a lonely place all these years if she had been an accessory to so foul a midnight murder.' The shanty was a shanty in the original meaning of the word, a wretched tenement, seemingly falling to pieces from sheer neglect. One side was propped up with some old slabs, as the building was yielding to its own weight and inclining from the perpendicular. The sheds, once used as stables, had fallen altogether, and lay, a rotting heap, upon the ground. Together it would be difficult to imagine or picture a more desolate abode. As we drew rein in front of the door, a woman came to it, a woman thin to emaciation, and with great dark eyes flashing feverishly in her white sunken face. Her attire was tattered and neglected, her hair thickly sprinkled with grey, and hanging about her shoulders. "'Good heavens! Can this possibly be you, Mrs. Blake?' Tom Doyle cried, staring at her in the utmost astonishment. She came out and looked doubtfully in his face, but at last her own brightened as she recognised him. Quickly moving close to his horse, she said in an eager but subdued tone, "'You remember Bob? He rambles about the place every night. Somehow he seems never to sleep. What Bob? Don't you remember Bob? Bart's mate. Don't you remember the night of the storm and the dream you had? Ha, ha, the dream you had?' Tom looked at me and shook his head. It was only too evident the poor woman was not quite sane. "'Don't tell him,' she whispered, pointing over her shoulder. "'But he knows that Bob never sleeps. "'He is always rambling about the place.' At this moment the figure of a man appeared at the door. I guessed instantly it was Blake. "'Come inside and don't be making an ass of yourself out there,' he cried angrily to his wife, who slunk past him like a scolded child. "'Why, is this yourself, Mr. Doyle? "'Have you come back to these parts again?' "'Yes,' Doyle answered. "'I'm sorry to see the missus looking so bad, Blake.' "'Yes, she's been pining now for a couple of years, "'and worse, her mind's giving way. "'She has some of the strangest fancies you ever knew, "'especially her nights. "'If she don't get better, "'I'll have to send her to an asylum, I'm afraid.' "'That's bad. "'Do you know there's another old acquaintance "'come to Kingower lately? "'Have you seen Bart yet?' "'Bart? "'Yes, Bob's mate, you know. "'I think he was at your place that very night I was here.' The man's face had flushed up hotly, and then grown deathly white. At first he seemed incapable of speech, but looked behind him, as if to assure himself of his wife being out of earshot. "'You recollect Bart, don't you?' 
doyle persisted recollect him i've good reason to the cursed robber and so he's in kingower is he the day i meet him will be a blank one for him owes you a bill does he well now's your chance he must have money for he's putting up quite a flash place in the main street but we must go i only came round to see if you were in the old spot yet so long and blake went suddenly inside he was not however quick enough if his intention was to prevent his unfortunate wife from having any further communication with us we had barely put our horses in motion when the disordered looking being popped round the end of the shanty and stretching her long thin neck out toward doyle said in a loud whisper don't you mind what he says bob does ramble about at night no matter where you make his bed he can't rest he always rambles about at night and with a confirmatory gesture of her hand the poor woman darted toward the back door again not a word was exchanged for some minutes as we rode toward old king gower but at length tom asked what do you think of it mark i'm afraid that dream of yours was no dream i'm afraid so too well he added excitedly if i live to do it i'll find out the truth and if poor bob was made away with he shall be avenged please god i was getting quite interested myself and as i was stationed at kingower thought it quite possible that i might have a greater opportunity of watching and elucidating than doyle and i told him so i was just going to ask you he replied and i want you to ride round by bart's new place so that i may have an opportunity of introducing you as it were in an unsuspicious manner of course i agreed and we diverged a little from our direct way for the pleasure of seeing bart there is the place and there is the man observed doyle as we neared a new erection of canvas and deal the outside of the building or rather tent was evidently near completion and a tall fair man with a heavy rusty beard was on top of the veranda nailing up a broad strip of calico on which in large black letters was bart's restaurant he was but slightly above our level as tom rode up and accosted him hello bart is that what it's going to be i'll come and board with you the man turned round suddenly and at sight of doyle a visible change came over his face he rallied however and replied lightly yes constable oh is it you mr doyle i thought i knew the face but couldn't recollect it first we've just come from your friend blake on the old sinnets tom went on he didn't seem too well pleased to hear you were so near him i expect he'll be round with an account against you one of these days let him come bart said fiercely as he descended the ladder and stood on terra firma i am ready to square up accounts with him and i'll guess he'll find the balance in my favour how did he know i was here i told him i saw you as i was going up though you did not notice me you'll come inside gentlemen bart invited i hope to do nothing against the law and mean to keep friends with law preservers as far as i can come in and the missus will give us a drop out of my private bottle this was too good a chance to be refused we dismounted and having hooked up our horses entered the large tent it presented the same appearance as most of the ephemeral erections intended for the public accommodation in those days and was a huge barn-like tent on a frame without lining or indeed any break from end to end save the low partition that parted the front from the back apartment in the centre of the former was a long bush table with an oilcloth cover and two rough benches running down either side of it to serve as seats for hungry diggers at each side of the inner apartment a coarse curtain was stretched shielding several rude bunks with blankets and such lodging as well as board was evidently to be provided for the patrons of bart's restaurant we seated ourselves at the table facing the partition and bart called out bab in a few moments a tall girl entered with a dark complexion and low forehead over which her night black hair lay in heavy folds she had full flashing grey eyes a fine figure and the air of a woman who knew her own mind i was surprised truly for I had known this woman as a barmaid about twelve months previous at Casterton, and was so well acquainted with her private history as to have felt a deep interest in her. As soon as her eyes lighted on my face, she slightly flushed, but without further change of countenance, placed her finger significantly on her lips. Taking this sign to mean that I was not to claim any previous acquaintance, I was dumb, as Bart, in a sort of rough way, introduced us to his wife and followed the few words with instructions for the production of that private bottle he had spoken about 
It was produced and its contents considerably reduced as we chatted and feigned to make merry over our glasses. Once or twice Doyle vainly tried to lead the conversation toward the Blakes and the shanty on the old Sinnet's road, and I was glad when at last, with reference to some projected addition to the tent, Bart took Tom out to the back and left me alone with the wife. "'How in the name of mercy did you fall across this match, Barbara?' I asked hastily, as soon as their voices had receded. "'Do you think you have done well?' "'I know I have, though not in the way you mean it,' she promptly replied. "'Are you happy?' "'Happy? No.' A change had come over the whole figure and face of the woman as her husband disappeared. She had been suave and smiling and agreeable. She got rigid as his back turned, and a dark cloud seemed to overshadow her face from the low brow where the black hair lay, to the firm, square chin down which a deep cleft settled, instead of the more womanly dimple. As she replied to my questions, her strong fingers clenched and her lips quivered. "'Have you found your father?' I next asked. "'Not yet, but I am close on his track. And,' she added in a hurried whisper, as voices came in again by the back door, "'I may soon want your help. When I do, I will go to you at the camp.' We left shortly after, and I told Doyle of my previous acquaintance with Bart's wife, as well as of the few sentences that had just passed between us. "'What do you know of her?' asked Tom. "'She was a barmaid at Cleveland's, and somehow or other she told me part of her history. Her father, a widower, and second mate of some ship, had deserted for the diggings after his last voyage to Melbourne, but after some months wrote to this girl whom he had left in Bristol at service. In the letter he stated that he had been fortunate, and got gold enough to keep them both for life. With the money he sent her, Barbara came out and wrote to the address he furnished, but without getting any reply. Then she went herself. It was to Reynolds Creek. But he had left, and traced all tidings she had not got when I saw her last. "'Reynolds Creek!' repeated my mate in a thoughtful way. "'Yes.' "'And now she says she is on his track?' "'Yes.' "'I should say that was a determined woman. Was she fond of her father?' "'So fond that it seemed an infatuation. I have seen her face actually light up when she spoke of him as he used to be, and when the reality of his disappearance again looked her in the face, she would weep like a very child. The separated roads at which we had to part for a time was reached, and Tom Doyle drew rein and looked me in the face. "'As soon as I get to camp, I'm going to tell Brit all about this affair, Mark. I shall ask him for a week here. I think he can spare me, and it'll go hard, but you and I will get to the bottom of it. Do you connect Barbara any way with your dream?' I asked wonderingly. "'Don't you?' "'Oh, you're a fine chap to be looking forward to getting among the D's. "'All at once my light broke through what Tom doubtless considered my stupidity, "'and I saw what he fancied he saw. "'Oh, you mean Bob?' "'Yes, I mean Bob and Bab. "'So long. I think and hope you'll see me up on leave in a day or two. "'In the meantime, cultivate your acquaintance with Mrs. Bart.' I turned my horse's head campward and abandoned myself to a deep consideration of Tom's supposed dream and its apparent present consequences. Could it really be that Barbara had married her father's murderer? Had Sailor Bob been really her lost father, what would be the result of Bart's arrival at King Gower as regarded the elucidation of the mystery at Blake's shanty, since Blake and Bart had evidently some terrible disagreement between themselves? When rogues fell out, should honest men in reality get their own? My mind made various answers to these questions during the afternoon and evening of that day. I felt a strong inclination to return to Bart's restaurant in the evening, but feared it might arouse suspicions, so I determined to wait until the following day, when I should have a legitimate excuse in township patrol. At the time I speak of, there were two of us stationed at Kingower, but on this particular day and night I was alone, my mate, Joyce, having gone with dispatches to Inkerman, so when I was aroused from my sleep at dead of night by a sharp knocking at the door of the barrack room, I was not at all surprised, as it might be Joyce, or indeed it might be that I was wanted in some drunken brawl at the township, a not at all unusual matter in those days of gold and drink. This latter consideration induced me to keep quiet for a moment or two, for I was tired and awfully sleepy. But before I had time to think twice, the knock was repeated at the small window above my head. "'Who's there?' I asked angrily, 
for I thought it a bit of unwarrantable presumption for any one to be so determined to get the ear of a mounted man in so unceremonious a way. Nor do I think you need be surprised at this feeling on my part, seeing there are actually, even at this day of greater enlightenment, policemen who think it a compliment to the public to do, or pretend to do, the duty the said public pay them for doing. Who's there? It's me, Barbara, Mr. Sinclair. Open the door, quick. Barbara, at that time of night. Something had occurred then. You may be sure I lost no time in admitting her, and felt scared at the hurriedly dressed figure and white face that came within the glare of my newly lighted lamp. Don't ask any questions. I have no time, she panted, for her walk had apparently been as hurried as the darkness would permit. I left him asleep, but he might wake at any moment and miss me. You are speaking of Bart? Yes, and I want to tell you, a man he called Blake came to him this evening, and he took him out to the back. But hearing there was some kind of row, I managed to get behind the water barrel, and heard enough to confirm suspicions I have long had. A lot of men came in, and the man Blake went away. But they are to meet tonight, halfway between this and the man Blake's shanty on the old Corong Road. I can't watch or listen there. See that you do. And she turned to the door. Stay, I cried. Tell me what it is that you suspect. Have you found out anything about Bart's old connection with Blake? No need to tell now. I must go. Barbara. Was. Do you think that Sailor Bob was. Hush! she almost shrieked. I cannot bear it. But oh, what can you know about the horror I suspect? More. Far more than you dream of, my poor girl. But go home. We are already on the track of Sailor Bob's disappearance. Go home. He will be avenged. I know he will, for I will avenge him. I have sacrificed my body and my soul for revenge. Do you think I will not accomplish it? And without another word she disappeared in the darkness. When Barbara had gone, I remembered that she had not supplied me with any particulars. I did not even know the time the men were to meet. It would be necessary for me to manage a few words with the woman some time during the day, which was now nearly breaking. How sincerely and selfishly I hoped that Tom Doyle might not come for a day or two, so that I might astonish him with my success in the interpretation of his dream when he did come. On riding up the street about noon on that day, I observed Bart putting gravel under the new veranda so as to raise the ground to the level of the inside flooring. He was wheeling the gravel in a barrow from the bed of the creek, and Barbara was hanging out clothes on a line at the back. She saw me and dropped her basket instantly as I drew bridle and paused. One look to satisfy her that Bart's back was turned and she was at the front door in a jiffy. The time. I forgot to tell you. Half past eleven o'clock. Don't fail. And she disappeared from the doorway while I rode on, having scarcely had time to fairly become stationary. I was full of my anticipated watch all day and longing for the hour to come that I might start. Joyce had returned, so I was at liberty, but I did not think it necessary to trust him with the secret of my expedition. I was in charge at King Gower, and not obliged to ask any man's permission as to my movements. The only precaution I took was to leave a note for Doyle on the table, and to tell Joyce, If I am not home by daylight, open that note, read it, and follow me. I left the camp a little after ten o'clock, and rode leisurely up the old Corong track. It was so dark that I did not fear detection, and I knew there was no danger of encountering Bart, who would be certain to strike across the lead through the bush, which would cut off a mile of the road from his tent. A new chum would have had some difficulty in guiding his horse on the bush track I followed in the darkness, but I was no new chum, and besides, my animal knew the road well, and required little save a loose bridle at my hands. I had planned my procedure during the day, there was an old deserted hut by the side of the road within about a quarter of a mile of the place where the accomplices of four years ago were to meet. I would fasten the horse behind this hut and skirt the bush beside the track for the rest of the way on foot. I was not afraid of the animal being discovered or interfered with, for the hut was a good bit back from the track, surrounded with brush and in ruins. When I reached the hut, I struck a match and saw by my watch that it was nearly eleven o'clock. I had no time to spare. Either of the men might be there before the time, so I hastily fastened up the horse in the shelter of the hut, and moved cautiously toward what I supposed to be the appointed place of meeting. 
there was a spot where the short cut from Kingower lead joined the Corong track, and as it was about half way to Blake's shanty, I determined to watch there. At all events, I should see Bart when he passed the place, which he must pass to gain the road at all. I do not say see unadvisedly, for the moon was at last struggling above the tops of the trees as I reached the fork of the tracks. I could see faintly up the shadowed Corong road, and to a little distance on the Kingower track, so here I paused to select a shelter. I was not at a loss for one in the dense bush that fringed the roads. Close against the bole of a huge box-tree grew a heavy cluster of underwood, rich in its fresh young foliage. Here, between the young wood and the old, I planted myself. Not five minutes too soon. The time appointed had not yet arrived when an apparently noiseless figure appeared moving toward me on the Corong track. I had no doubt that it was Blake, and he was on foot. Of course I could not be certain at first, but who else would be on that lonely bush road at such a time, on foot, save he whom Bart was to meet? It was Blake. As he paused in the middle of the track near the fork, a ray of moonlight fell upon the dark face and the tall figure. I could even trace the scowl that bent low his heavy brows, as, by an impatient stride, he came nearer and bent his ear to listen. He heard something, and so did I. It was the regular, though not hurried, fall of a horse's feet. The sound came nearer and nearer, and at last Bart rode up to the motionless figure opposite to my hiding-place. "'You are late,' Blake said huskily. "'You would have been late, too,' Bart returned sulkily, as he dismounted, "'if you had to come across that old lead in the pitch darkness. I was nearly down a shaft a dozen times.' "'No loss if you had,' Blake said with a sneer. "'It might have been a loss to you, mate,' Bart retorted. "'If you didn't want me alive, what did you bring me here for?' me bring you here that's a good one too and the man laughed an unnatural laugh that sounded strangely in the weird night it was you that proposed the meeting i said all i had to say when i said i want my own that you robbed of me bart sean you said you had a proposal to make here when you say i robbed you dan blake you lie and when you call the money you speak of your own you lie again Blake lifted his clenched right hand, but let it fall again. "'Let me hear your proposal before another word is said,' he said in a hoarse, low tone. "'It's easy said, Dan Blake. My proposal is that you empty your purse into my hand to save your neck.' There was a silence of a few seconds. It seemed as if Blake could not speak for very rage. One hand clenched, the other clutched at his throat as if he was choking. Full in the low moonlight I could see his white face with an awful expression that had murder in it as he glared at the determined-looking man who had just spoken, and who now met his stare steadily as well as with apparent unconcern. "'Did it never strike you, Bart, Sean, that your neck and mine mightn't be far apart in a case of that kind?' at last asked Blake between his teeth. "'No, it never struck me so. It only struck me that I can hang you as easily as I mount this horse.' "'and I will do it, Dan Blake, if you refuse my offer.' The words were spoken fiercely as he seated himself in the saddle, still, however, keeping his face to Blake, and one hand, I noticed, in the bosom of his shirt. "'And see here,' he added, "'I'll give you till to-morrow at noon. If by that time you have not laid fifty guineas in my hand, you know what you have to expect. You have the money, and you needn't try to deny it.' "'I don't deny it.' Blake returned with a singular quietness, but before you shall get another coin of mine to spend, as you spent what you robbed me of, I'll hang. But Bart Sean, you'll hang with me. And turning on his heel, he dived into the bush, so close to me that his elbow rustled the bushes which sheltered me. Mind I give you till noon. Ha ha, was the reply, echoing mockingly through the dark forest. Bart drew his hand from his breast, and something glittered in the moonlight as he stretched out his arm in the direction of the receding laugh. It was the barrel of a revolver, but a second thought lowered the arm as he turned his horse's head, and went back by the way he came. What had I gained by my espionage? I questioned, as, my horse regained, I rode easily homeward under the growing moonlight. The fact certainly that there was some secret of life and death between these two men, a secret which there was a chance of my becoming acquainted with if Bart kept to his threat of informing. But not a word had been said of Sailor Bob at all. Did, then, the secret relate to him? The day passed slowly for me. 
I went round the township in the forenoon, and saw Bart still engaged with his gravel, and I did not see Barbara at all. I returned to camp at noon, and waited uneasily. Was I hoping indeed that Bart Sean, as Blake had called him, would keep his threat of turning informer about a crime in which he himself was implicated? It seemed so. At three o'clock I saw Bart himself making his way up the hill to the camp. His face was pale, his step unsteady. When he reached the step leading up to the open door of the barrack room, he hesitated so long that I feared he would turn back and leave me in ignorance of what I so much wished to know. So I got up and hastened to meet him. "'Hello. Is this you, Mr. Bart? Are you coming in? What a fine day it is!' He put his foot determinedly on the first step, on the second, and crossed the threshold. Even then he hesitated, and looked out the door down toward the lead and the tented street with a longing and troubled gaze, as if he was sorry he had left them. But all at once he turned his back on the door and his face to me as he took off his felt hat. The perspiration was almost dripping from his forehead, and he dashed it off with his hand. "'I've come to report something in the way of your business to you, Constable, and—and I don't like to do it,' he commenced desperately. "'Sit down and take your time,' I returned, as I seated myself on the edge of the table. "'I'm not altogether blameless myself,' he went on, with his elbows on his knees, and his hat drooping in his hands between them. "'I should have told four years ago but when a man's word will hang one he has been friendly with, he is loth to say the word. Hanging, I repeated in feigned surprise. Yes, it is of murder I am going to speak. Constable, what can be done to me for hiding the knowledge so long? He looked at me eagerly as he spoke, and again the big sweat drops swelled on his forehead. That depends, I replied, shirking the question. Had you any hand in it yourself? No, he almost shouted. If I had, do you think I would be here to tell you of it? Well, I should suppose not, seeing that, as an accomplice, you would barely save your neck by turning Queen's evidence. No, I do not think it likely that you would risk imprisonment for life by coming here to tell at this time of day. But what urged you to inform now, after all these years? It happened in this neighbourhood, he replied, and his eyes fell to the floor. And as I have seen the man's right hand in the grip of honest men, it turns me, knowing as I do, that the same right hand was red with blood four short years ago. You'd better begin at the beginning and tell me the whole story. And I seated myself at the table and drew writing materials towards me. And you know, you must be cautious, as every word will be taken down. Every word? Yes, I write shorthand. He looked toward the door and half rose, but I put out my hand and pushed him back to his seat again. You've said too much or too little, Bart. I explained. You have confessed to compounding a felony, and you will only get into the mess by yourself if you don't tell the truth. I thought the man would have fainted, as suddenly the sense of his own danger came upon him with overwhelming force. But he is suddenly rallied, and a fierce determination flushed the pale face as he lifted his eyes and began. I suppose it's a weakness in me, but it is hard to be the cause of taking away a man's life. Still, he don't deserve to live. I can't deny that. The man is Dan Blake of the shanty at Old Sinnet's Road. Your friend, Constable Doyle, knows him well. It happened one stormy night four years ago. Constable Doyle was in the shanty the same night. Storm's dead, though he little guessed what happened under the same roof with him. I had been digging at Reynolds Creek with a mate known as Sailor Bob, an elderly man, and a decent enough mate, only he was always jawing about his daughter at home. Sailor Bob had got gold before, but we got more at Reynolds, and he told me he had sent money to bring his girl out from home. Reynolds got worked out, and we thought to try for nuggets here at Kingower. On the way we stopped at Blake's and got gambling. The old man, Bob, was crusty and bounceable in his drink, and got to blowing about the gold he had to draw on in his belt when he lost, as he somehow nearly always did. This went on for some days, and we were never fairly sober, until at last came the stormy night that Constable Doyle took shelter at Blake's. Bob and I slept on the floor in one of the little back rooms, and to tell the truth, I don't remember lying down. I was drunk, and so was Bob. I was roused by... I don't know what. I thought I had been dreaming of trouble in some shape or other, but fairly awake. I sat up, just as a terrible clap of thunder shook the very ground. I put out my hand to feel for my mate. He was not beside me, and my hand went into something wet and clammy. 
thinks I, the rain has been coming down on Bob and he's cleared out for some dry place. And I was just going to lie down again when a flash of light came across my eyes from a crack in the slabs. I looked out and saw Mrs. Blake standing about twenty yards back in the bush. The light of a lantern she held low near the ground unsteadily flashing up now and then in her face. By the same light I saw Blake with a pick and shovel lying at his feet and in his hand the chamois belt Bob always wore and in which he carried his gold. He was emptying part of its contents into a small canvas shop bag and then he buried the belt near the old log and tossed sticks and branches over it. I lay down, horrified. I was frightened for a bit. They had murdered my mate and the drink had been hocused. I could feel it now in the queer state of my brain. It seemed as if I could not think, but I satisfied myself that my revolver was all right before I lay down and fell, in spite of myself, asleep. He stopped suddenly. I was sitting with my back to the door, with Bart on my left hand. When he ceased his narrative, I ceased my shorthand and looked at him. He was staring wildly toward the door. Tom Doyle was standing there. He had just come in time to hear the interpretation of his dream. "'Don't stop,' Tom said abruptly, as he entered and leaned against the table. "'I've heard the most of it. Go on. What bribe did Blake give you to hide a foul, villainous murder for four long years?' Bart's eyes fell again. "'I didn't want blood money,' he said surlily. "'But when he found I knew all, Blake and the missus begged and prayed so for their lives, and the man was past help. What could I do?' "'You could pocket your murdered mate's gold, and you did,' Tom said with bitter irony. You could dip your hand in his blood as it lay beside you in one bed, and you could then finger his gold with the same hand, and eat it and drink it for four years. That's what you could do by your own telling. But you have not told all, Bart, Sean. If the poor man's cry for mercy and help wakened me in the front room, how is it that you slept through them at his very side? I arrest you as an accomplice in the murder of a man known as Sailor Bob. Tom had risen staggeringly at Tom's first suspicious words and his face grew grey with fear. He laid an outstretched hand on the table to support himself, but ere he was aware, it was handcuffed, snatched toward the other, and coupled to it. The support gone, he toppled back into his seat again, with great beads on his forehead, which he was not now able to wipe off. They gathered big in the momentary silence, these great sweat drops, until, one by one, they began to fall on the bright steel handcuffs. Good heavens! how he shook. What an agony of terror was only half hidden in his pleading eyes. What a coward he was at heart. I didn't do it, he gasped. Don't say anything you don't want to say, Doyle reminded. Every word will be used against you. Mind, I've warned you. I didn't do it, the prisoner repeated doggedly. I came here to turn evidence against Blake, and I had no hand in it. Even if you are right, Tom, I whispered. Let him turn Queen's evidence. Yes, he's an informer. Cut out. Ready made. Tom sneered aloud. If you want to offer yourself as Queen's evidence, you can do it. I didn't do it, I tell you, Bart roared. And now that the man was desperate, you could see the real nature peeping out. A hot flush, that still reddened as he spoke, dried up the sweat on his forehead, that lowered over his fierce eyes like a thundercloud. I'm willing to point out where the corpse was buried. I can't say no more. Only, he shouted as he rose to his feet and raised his handcuffed wrists on high. Only, I wish to God my knife was in your heart this minute. I dare say, replied the threatened Doyle, your remark confirms my opinion of you. Sinclair, you are in charge here. I will sign the charge sheet. Get Joyce to put this prisoner in the lock-up. But it was on our way to Blake's, an hour or so after, that Bart's real nature displayed itself to the greatest disadvantage. We had removed his handcuffs with the information that his first attempt at escape would put a bullet through him, and, mounted on Joyce's horse, he rode with one of us on either side of him. He scarcely spoke until he was more than halfway, and then he pulled up suddenly. "'Look here. My life's in danger facing Blake's. Mind, I look to you for protection.' "'I'll save you for something else if I can,' Doyle replied significantly. "'I'll not go another foot till you promise to protect me. "'Blake will murder me. I know he will.' "'Nonsense,' I said, feeling an unutterable contempt for the white-livered informer. "'Your hands are free. Can't you protect yourself from attack? "'Besides, we are three to one. 
right on he did but with such a white face and wild eyes as made me feel like putting a bullet through him to steady him all the rest of the way he kept muttering to himself and when the shanty came in view he would have dropped behind had i not seized the bridle of the horse and kept it up with my own we reached the shanty and alighted but there was no movement in the open doorway or at the front of the house by previous arrangement i took charge of the informer when our horses were fastened and doyle slipped round to the back it would have been pitiful if it had not been disgusting to see how bart shawn trembled as he watched window and door shrinking meanwhile as close to me as he dared and as tom appeared at the back door and beckoned me to enter i had to seize him by the arm and almost force him to go in wretched being i have often wondered since at that strange instinct of self-preservation that seemed to hold him back as with iron bands from what awaited him within as we crossed the front apartment where tom had slept on the sofa and dreamed his dream four years ago he shuddered as a man mounting the scaffold blake was sitting behind the table tom was moving toward him blake's eyes were fixed in stern expectancy on the door by which we were entering the man had apparently been making some kind of meal for the remains were still on the table i noticed however that only one plate lay there what had become of mrs blake this man has laid an information against you for murder daniel blake said doyle and it is my duty to arrest you on suspicion suspicion's a fine thing blake replied sneeringly but he never took his eyes off the shrinking bart i have my own opinion as to the suspicious being reality i was here on the night of the murder myself you may remember if bart shawn accuses me of murder let him prove it and still his fierce eyes never left bart's white face he has come here to point out where you buried the body said tom you had better come out with us but mind you are my prisoner and there are two revolvers to prevent your escape alive i shall not try to escape till my work is done blake returned as he rose i pushed my man out the back door and followed to place myself between him and blake for there was something so threatening in blake's face that for the first time i shared the informer's fears for his own safety and it would seem that doyle shared my doubts as he placed himself between bart and blake the informer led the way to a fallen and rotten tree about fifty yards from the hut by the side of which a great heap of dead branches were lying there is where he buried the body bart said pointing to the heap close against the log where the branches lie a smile of such intense sarcasm curled blake's lip though only for a second that i watched with some interest my mate's movements he had caught up a shovel as he passed a shed and now directing me to look after both prisoners he began to work actively in tossing the dead boughs from the indicated spot this was soon accomplished and then tom tossed out shovelful after shovelful of the soft black vegetable mould which the rotting branches had hidden you'd better let me have a spell at it tom i said as he paused no not at all it's soft as sand and far lighter but i see no signs of a body here are you sure this was the place he asked of bart quite sure yet even the informer began to watch the deepening hole uneasily while blake actually laughed aloud there's such a thing as bearing false witness mr policeman he said sneeringly and a man may sell his soul to the devil to hang a man he has a down on without succeeding after all i'll pledge my life the body of sailor bob is there bart cried excitedly unless the villain has removed it he's quite capable of it blake laughed aloud again don't stick at trifles bart shawn he said it's hard for a man to die without accomplishing his purpose i'll accomplish mine at all events bart exclaimed with fierce disappointment as he saw tom step out of the excavation and toss down the shovel with a smothered oath you've shifted sailor bob's corpse but i'll find it and hang you before i die you'll do neither blake said you'll die now and before a thought could be spoken the barrel of a pistol flushed in the sun there was a loud report and bart shawn fell on his face on the soft soil tom had just heaped up by the side of his excavation now if i'm hung it will be for ridding the world of a villain cried blake as he tossed the pistol from him thank god at least for revenge oh mark what fools we have been we should have searched him doyle exclaimed as he handcuffed the now quiet blake we are to blame for this man's death i should regret it more if it had been a better man i replied with uncharitable hardness as i raised bart and turned his white earth-soiled face up to the light he was conscious but a stream of blood was welling from his breast 
the murderer's ball having entered his back and penetrated clear through his body. His eyes fastened themselves in a gaze of terror and reproach upon Blake, who stood looking down on him triumphantly with his handcuffed wrists crossed before him. At this instant, just as I was trying to staunch the flowing stream of red that had already found its way to my knees on the ground, I became conscious of a step that was none of ours on the sticks behind me, and looking round saw with astonishment that the dying man's wife was standing almost close to us. She had ridden over, as was evident from the spattered skirt and whip she carried in her hand. Her handsome face looked white and stern under the brim of her dark hat, and terrible, reproaching eyes were fixed on the face of her dying husband. "'So this is what you've come to, Bart Shorn. You are dying. Speak. Where did you bury my murdered father?' "'Your father!' It was a gasp rather than words from Shorn's rigid lips. "'Yes, my father. I knew you had murdered my father before we were married a month. Murderers should never drink or talk in their sleep. Ah, God has avenged my poor father. Bart Shorn, you know you feel that now, but the only atonement you can make now is to point out his grave. Speak. Where does father lie?' He stared at her solemnly with already glazing eyes, and lifting his hand weakly, pointed toward Blake. Then he turned his head as if to hide his face in the soil, and died. Barbara turned quickly to Blake. "'He is dead,' she said firmly, "'and he has referred me to you for the answer. What did you and he do with the man you robbed and murdered, called Sailor Bob?' "'I know nothing of him,' Blake replied sulkily. "'He accused me. He lied. He said I had buried him there. He lied. See, the hole is empty. Bart Chorn was born a liar, I, and a thief,' he added fiercely, as his face grew crimson with some remembered cheatery of the dead man at his feet. "'If you want to know where Bob is resting now, I can show you. He never rests at night, I suppose because his bed is so cold, for he rambles about the place until the day dawns. But he's resting now, and I'll show you.' When our astonished faces were turned toward the speaker, we saw that wretched being, Mrs. Blake. She was standing at a little distance, holding in one hand the end of a rope which was fastened round her waist and which presented the appearance of having been gnawed off. She was, indeed, a miserable and piteous object, with torn clothes and tangled hair, and wild, reason-forsaken eyes flashing like live coals in her hollow face. For a moment surprise held us dumb, and she spoke again with a little piteous giggle. "'You see, Dan was always a bit jealous of the troopers, and he tied me up so I couldn't come before, but I'll show you now.' A spasm of the fiercest rage shot across Dan Blake's face as he saw his unhappy wife free and about to disclose his secret. One quick glance he darted toward his distant revolver, another of ineffectual desperation at his shackled wrists. With a half-stifled oath he lifted his wrists and vainly tried to wrench them apart, and then I was at his side, warning him, for his own sake, to attempt no further violence. "'Come and show me, then.' Barbara replied with sudden softness, as she, with woman's quick eyes, saw the vacancy in the poor reasonless face of Blake's wife. "'Do show me where Bob rests. Do you know? I am his daughter.' "'Bob's daughter? I had a father long ago, a very long time ago. I'm glad you've come. Perhaps he'll sleep better now. Dan took him out of that bed.' And she pointed to the grave-like hole and I thought he might be warmer in his new bed. But he never rests. He comes every night to my bedside, and his teeth chatters. He's so cold. Once I wanted him to take one of my blankets, but he wouldn't. No, he wouldn't. This is unbearable, muttered Doyle, whose face was growing white as he listened to and watched this poor victim to her own and her husband's sin. Show us the place where Sailor Bob is. There's a good soul. Yes, he is here. Call him. Perhaps he will answer his daughter. I have often called him by day, but he never answered me, only once when it thundered. She led the way to one of the old broken sheds, where under a litter of rotting straw we found all that remained of poor sailor Bob. They were buried, after the trial which condemned Blake to death for his double murder, by Barbara, who shortly afterwards left Kingawa, and has not, to my knowledge, been heard of since. Bart, too, was buried on the same day, but no wife wept at his funeral or chose his grave. 
Poor Mrs. Blake was sent to an asylum for the insane, where she was followed, even to her deathbed, by Bob, who would not rest and was always cold. As she was dying, she said that he had taken her blanket at last, for she was cold now, and he was warm. During a ransacking of Blake's shanty, ere we burnt it to the ground, Tom and I discovered, hidden in a wretched old mattress, a well-kept rifle. Ha! Huh, cried my mate, as he took a bullet from his pocket, and fitted it to the bore. This is the rifle that fired at me that day, eh? Well, that relieves the bushrangers of that, at all events. Blake knew me, and wanted me out of the way. I suppose he was afraid I might try and find out the interpretation of my dream. End of story Section 5 of Stories from the Detective's Album by Waif Wanda, also known as Mary Fortune. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsty. I'll be hung for you yet. The girl was perhaps twelve, and she was busily engaged in gathering a great heap of kindling wood on the green hillside. She was barefooted, yet intelligent looking, and every now and then stopped her feet among the tangled grass and undergrowth to look down the hill where the smoke of a cottage ascended. She looked upon a scene of unmitigated Australian beauty. It was in the vicinity of a township, green, in young February, with flushing vines. On the opposite side of the valley, in which the small scattered township lay, a great mountain reared his tree-clad height proudly, and cast his dark shadow on the pretty village when he put on his evening garb. The cottage, toward which the girl's regards were bent, faced the verdurous mountain, and was sheltered by the hill on which she stood. It was a little house of weatherboard and slabs, and had once shone prettily in a robe of pure white paint, but the hard rains of many winters had left the paint scarcely a memory of the past. The small windows were broken and stuffed with rags, and there was, altogether, a desolate and most dreary look about the untidy garden and filthy yard, for which the future paragraphs of this story may certainly account. When a great heap of the dry sticks and leaves, and bits of time-bleached bark, with which the hill abounded, had been collected, the girl sat down, and, clasping her thin, sunburnt arms over her slightly clad, ragged knees, fixed her great grey eyes dreamily on the opposite mountain. "'How I should like to live up there,' she murmured, as she often did when she was alone, far away from noise and quarrelling, and where there were no public houses. Strange wish for one so young, was it not? What could a girl of twelve have to do with noise and quarrelling and public houses? Suddenly the sound of voices below her started the girl to her feet, and you could have seen by the flush that mounted up hotly to the weather-beaten yet handsome face of the child how deeply she was interested in the scene she gazed upon. From the cottage below the figure of a woman had emerged, with a lad clutched in her strong hand. Her voice was loud, her face was red, and her garments untidy. The sound of blows could be heard distinctly, and they seemed to fall on the girl's heart, for she clasped her hands over her ears to dull them. But all at once, as she saw the boy escape the woman's grasp, and, with a little terrier yelping before him, dart up the hill toward her, she fell behind her bundle of kindling wood as if to hide, and listen to the sound of scrambling feet and panting breath that rapidly neared her. "'Oh, Bob!' she cried as the boy fell upon the grass beside her. "'Has she hurt you so badly?' Bob brushed the dripping blood from his broad, intelligent forehead, and drew the little sympathetic terrier to his side with the other brown hand. "'I wish she had killed me,' he cried impetuously. "'I wish I was dead. If it wasn't for Topsy and you, Dolly, I would throw myself down Barker's shaft in an hour. Oh, Bob, don't! And Dolly's hand stole into her brother's as she wiped the blood off his face with her tattered skirt. I can't stand it, Dolly, and I won't no longer. Other girls and boys have fathers and mothers. Look at us. When Baby was bored and we used to come up the hill with him and see his little, funny, winking eyes watching Topsy jumping about, I thought there would be some peace. But you know he was killed too by it. "'Our poor little brother, and I will stand it no longer. "'He was only buried yesterday, and look at that.' "'That was the again-gathering blood "'that he dashed from his flushed face. "'What was it, Bob? 
I was tired waiting for you. Was father home? No. You know he took his dinner with him this morning. What was it, doll? What a stupid you must be to ask. It was beer, of course. She wanted me to go over to Comstock's for more, and I wouldn't. And I never will again. Never. So I tell you I won't stand it. And, Dolly, you'll have to do without me until I'm a big boy and have earned some money, and I can have you to come with me, for I'm going to Bolt this very night. Dolly lifted her tear-stained face and stared at Bob with terror-stricken wonder. Bolt? Run away from father and mother and me and Topsy? Why, Bob, how could you? How could you? And the only half-subdued tears burst forth afresh. You talk of father and mother, the boy replied angrily as he rose to his feet. Do you forget that your father is not mine? Mother? I have no mother. Can you call her mother? I shan't forget you, Dolly. And as for Topsy, poor little Topsy shall go with me. The patient little creature, who, in spite of kicks and cuffs from the elder members of the wretched home, was plump and glossy, jumped proudly round his young master as he heard the well-known name, while Bob went down on his knees to clasp his honest arms around his weeping sister. "'Don't cry me, more, darling doll. Just you wait and see what a big fellow I'll come back soon, and what fine wages I will earn to keep you. Just remember, I'm fourteen years old tomorrow, and will be a man before you know where you are. Mr. Wright says I can earn an honest living anywhere.' You would believe Mr. Wright had you seen the tall, strong lad with his honest, open face and beaming eye, as he rose and gently helped his sister to her feet. "'Let's go home, doll. I think she is asleep, and I want to go and speak to Mr. Wright before she wakens.' Lifting the bundle of kindling wood as he spoke, the lad moved down the hill, followed by Dolly. One would think the very terrier knew of the necessity for silence, as he followed softly in their wake slinking back altogether as they came close to the wretched cottage. Wretched indeed, for it was environed with filth, even in the pure air that blew down upon it from the mountain. Into the gutter at the back were accustomed to be promiscuously thrown all the waste of a reckless home where a besotted head presided. Words would fail me to describe the debris that surrounded the back entrance and made foul every breath drawn in its vicinity. Old boots, old stockings, Old rags of every description mingled with rusty tools and dirty pots and bones and bottles, only too prominent, while the wretched, struggling vegetation of what had once been a thriving garden evinced the utter neglect of every useful industry. A shudder passed over the boy's frame as he deposited his sticks on a wet heap of refuse and chips and softly entered the kitchen. The dinner dishes still lay upon the table, with the cat holding high revel among them, the fire was out, with a great heap of white ashes littering the greasy hearth. On one side of the dirty window, a dirty tub stood upon a stool with a heap of half-washed rags in its soiled water. The washing had been abandoned in its very earliest stages. Where was the washerwoman? Dolly peeped into the untidy, unseemly bedroom, and saw her stepmother as she had too often seen her before. Mrs. Kemp was lying on the outside of her unmade bed in all the abandonment of filthy intoxication. She was a bloated woman of about fifty, and the soiled and torn dress she wore was black, and made with a little train that draggled on the floor as she lay. Dolly sighed a little, and then went out to kindle the fire and gather the dishes together in a rusty tin dish. When she had done so much, she looked over toward the mountain, and saw Bob making his way quickly up the track toward Mr. Wright's, with little Topsy bounding before him. It was evening, and the sun had dipped behind the top of the mountain. Across the ascending path, the tall trees were casting long shadows from a rift through which the sun broke beyond the spur of the hill. In this streak of soft sunlight, to the right of the track, stood the humble slab hut of a woodcutter, and in front of it, feeding a shaggy dog, was a tall old man with white hair and bowed shoulders. At the boy's quick approach, the shaggy dog barked loudly, but soon recognising friends, greeted joyfully both Topsy and his master, while the old woodcutter smiled pleasantly at the lad. "'Hello, Bob. Is this you? I didn't think to see you so late in the day as this. And I had no notion of being here now till an hour ago, Mr. Wright, but what I always expected has come at last.' I'm going to bolt tonight, sir, and I couldn't go without telling you. 
"'What has happened, my boy?' the old man asked gravely, as he laid his hand on Bob's shoulder. "'Oh, the old thing, sir. She insisted on me going for beer, and I refused, as I promised my stepfather I would. Then she beat me till she fell. I am determined to go.' "'What will Kemp say?' "'He will not care. You know he is getting worse and worse every day himself. He spends most of his time at Comstock's when he's not at work. And when he comes home, the rows are awful. You know the baby is dead, Mr. Wright. He was buried yesterday. And the boy's eyes filled with tears, which he was ashamed of, and which he turned away to hide. Yes, I heard it. And I heard too, Bob, that she let it fall and killed it. It's true, sir. And I must go, for if I don't get back before she wakes, she'll try to kill me too. These are hard words, my lad. I know. I know. But what can I do? And at last the boy burst into a passion of sobs and tears. If I stay here, they will neither let me work or go to school, and I will get as wicked as themselves. Sometimes I get so angry that I feel as if I could strike her. And then there's poor Dolly. I must get work and take her away. Where do you think of shaping for, my lad? To Pleasant Joe's, Mr. Wright. You know he was camped for a long time upon the hill behind us, and he was very good to me. He's taken up a selection at Tarrasome Creek, and I know he'll give me work if he can. Well, God bless you, my boy, and remember that you'll never thrive without his blessing, which you can only get by doing right. It's very hard on you to be homeless through a parent's folly, but try, for all that, to feel pity for your poor mother, bad as she is. I do pity her. If I could do her good, I would stop through all, but she won't let me. Be kind to poor Dolly when you can, Mr. Wright, won't you? And write sometimes, won't you? I'm no great fist at the pen, Bob, my boy, but I'll do better than write. If anything goes wrong, I'll walk over to the creek and see you. It's only a matter of twenty miles by the cross track. Yes, sir. I know the track well, and it's full moon. Good-bye, sir. Wait a bit, lad. Wait a bit, and the old man drew from his pocket a soiled chamois bag tied with a bit of whipcord. You know it's little I have to give you, but your own father could not have been more willing to share with you. Your boots are not fit to tramp in, and the road's rough over the mountain. Go down to the store tonight and buy yourself a good strong pair of lace-ups and a warm scarf. Take it, lad, take it, as the boy drew back from the offered little pile of shillings. You would vex me if you refused. "'and you know you can save up and pay me when I come over to see you. "'God be with thee, lad.' "'And the good old man turned suddenly into his hut "'and shut the door behind him. "'Bob stood still and looked at the money pressed into his hand, "'then down at his worn boots, "'and then at the closed door between him and his friend. "'The lad's generous heart swelled with emotion, "'but he judged the kindly action justly, "'and turned his face homeward, "'ran down the track with the money firmly gripped in his hand.' The light was fading quickly, and as soon as he had come within sight of his wretched home, his heart beat more easily, as he saw it still lightless, for he knew if his unfortunate mother was awake, a candle would have illuminated the painless window. "'I'll have time to get the boots,' the lad thought, as he turned toward the store, "'and if I don't meet father, all will be right.' He peeped anxiously into the bar of the public house as he passed, and breathed more freely as he saw no Kemp there and then he ran into the store as though he was doing wrong. Ten minutes after, he emerged with a little parcel in his hand and ran safely up to the brow of the hill behind the cottage, where he hid his treasure in a tuft of grass, and then bounded down the hill to his desolate home. Dolly was standing in the darkened door as he reached it, and greeted him joyfully, but in a low voice. "'Is mother not awake yet, Doll?' "'No, and I'm afraid to waken her, Bob. But tea's all ready.' "'Did you see father?' she asked anxiously. "'No, he's not at Comstock's,' and the poor girl gave a sigh of relief. "'I wish I dare waken her,' she said. "'But I'm afraid.' A pitiful state of affairs this, but, alas, there are, unfortunately, too many such homes, even in vine-growing Victoria. Bob rapidly related to her all about his visit to write the woodcutter and its results, and then he whispered, I think I'll venture to waken poor mother, and save her a row if father comes home. If she does hammer me, it will be the last time, 
and I can stand it once more. He turned into the dark kitchen and struck a light. While the match was burning bluely up, and the greasy wick of the poor tallow candle catching light faintly, the poor lad's heart was full to bursting. After all, she was his mother, besotted and almost lost to womanhood though she was. She had once been far different, even in the lad's memory, and now he was leaving home, perhaps never to see her again. Would she care when he was gone? With the candle in his hand he entered the room where the woman's loud snores resounded stertorously. She lay in the heavy sleep of deep intoxication, with the hand that had struck him last hanging, swollen, over the bed. The boy bent and kissed the hand softly, and then he gazed for a moment into the unconscious face. It was bloated and red, and growing shapeless, yet there still remained traces of feminine beauty. Her hair was dark and wavy, in spite of its tangled disorder, and the hidden bleared eyes had once been as brightly grey as Bob's own. A bystander would even then have caught a likeness in the sleeping face to the open, handsome countenance of the boy. But it was such a likeness as a fallen angel must have borne, after his dark rebellion against his Maker, to the pure spirit he had represented in the forever lost paradise of God. "'Mother! Mother! Awake!' the lad whispered softly in her ear as he shook her gently. "'Father will soon be home. Do waken up.' Perhaps her sleep was out, or perhaps it was the light of the candle in her eyes, but the woman opened her eyes suddenly, and fixed them upon her son with that dazed, stupid look of inquiry which is often seen in the face of the awaking drunkard. Soon she recognised the face and lifted her hand suddenly to strike, but as Bob drew back from the helpless blow, a something in his face struck even her obtuse vision, and she drew back her hand suddenly. Was there, could there be any hidden communion between the minds of this lost mother and her innocent child, or what feeling dictated the softened look and tone? "'What is the matter? Did I hurt you that time?' "'Oh, no, only a little, mother. But father will soon be home, and I was afraid he would catch you in bed.' "'Curse him!' she cried with a total revulsion of feeling, and with a string of more revolting anathemas. Who is John Kemp that I should slave myself to death for him? Let him wait on himself, as many a better man has before him. I have a good mind to knock you down for rousing me out of the only comfortable sleep I have had this month of Sundays. Put the candle down and clear out of this. She staggered to her feet, however, and, with open and disordered dress, lifted the lid of a box that stood near her bed. There was a bottle there, the contents of which were sweet to the diseased palate of the hapless woman, and when she went out to the kitchen it was with a staggering gait that swayed the grease from the unsteady candle in broad drops over her trailing and torn skirt. Bob and Dolly were both standing at the table as she emerged from her bedroom in the manner I have described, aware, by bitter experience, how little hope there was of a peaceful supper, the two children were seizing such viands as the table afforded. Bob had hurriedly stuffed some bread and meat into the pocket of his jacket, in hasty anticipation of his journey, and as well as he could in the darkness, when a well-known and dreaded footstep crossed the threshold. John Kemp was a low-sized, dark-complexioned man of fifty, with a vicious light in his deep-set eyes, and a slouching way of walking with his head bent forward. As he entered the door and saw the tottering figure of his wife, he stopped short, and his hard-knotted hands clenched fiercely against each other. Mrs. Kemp turned an angry face toward the doorway, and, in an effort to set the candle on the table, dropped it, and left the room in darkness. Amid the noise of breaking crockery and foul language, the brother and sister fled into the garden. "'I must go, doll. I must go,' Bob cried. "'If he catches sight of me, I won't get another chance. Goodbye, Dolly, darling.' "'And don't forget, Mr. Wright. He will tell you about me. Don't cry, dear. I'll soon be back.' He kissed the sobbing girl fondly, and as the light once more broke through the open door, he darted up the hill with panting yet light steps. But little Topsy was before him on the summit. He had snatched his parcel from the grass as he passed, and paused now to look back upon the house he had deserted. The moon was behind him, round and pale, and the lad's long shadow fell upon the grass before him. The sweet silence of a calm and beautiful night was broken only by the loud and fearful quarrelling in the cottage he had left. 
the light still streamed from the open door, and, as he watched longingly, he saw his mother pass it toward her room again. Poor Bob heaved a great sigh and turned away. When should he see his mother again? If fear had not lent wings to his feet and strength to his young heart, he would have sat down there on the brow of the hill and wept for his despised home and his forsaken mother. But he daren't go back now, certain as he was of a terrible beating, should poor Dolly have been obliged to divulge his intention of running away. Still, he thought regrettingly of his humble bed when he looked forward to the lonely and dark track he was entering. Ah, poor Bob, you are not the first who has bitterly realised, when only too late, what it is to be lonely and homeless. Once upon the path, however, with the soft moonbeams filtering through the whispering branches, and little Topsy joyously trotting along by his side, or bounding aside in the bush to sniff suspiciously at some hollow log where the bandicoot might dwell peacefully, the lad's spirits rose, and his heart seemed lifted of a heavy weight. How inexpressibly quiet was this lonely bush, and how sweet were the whispering leaves of the old trees! If one could live for ever in such a place with no one to scold or row, and only Dolly to talk to, and Topsy to hunt possums and kangaroo rats with, how nice it would be! Something like these were the poor boy's thoughts as he trudged along, though unanalyzed and unarranged. When Bob had gone a couple of miles, he sat down and put on his new boots. It was too warm for his woolen scarf, so he tied it round his waist and fastened the old boots carefully to it, in his want of worldly goods, valuing even these tattered bits of leather with their old twine laces. Then he made himself snug on the log, and taking out his supper, began to eat and share with the eager Topsy. He was not afraid of his stepfather's pursuit now, for he remembered that Dolly did not know his destination, so he could not, even with the worst abuse, disclose where he had gone. He was a brave boy, our Bob. Never once on the long road did he shrink or falter. Once, when the way was more than half past, he turned aside, and curling himself up snugly against a log, with Topsy by his side, he slept the sleep of strong youth and fatigue. When he woke, the grey dawn was struggling against the dying moon, and, refreshed as a young giant, he sprang to his feet, and having shared his last crust with the joyous, sparkling Topsy, went on his way rejoicing. Now it was that he more especially remembered his old friend the woodcutter. As the birds began, one by one, to awake and twitter softly, he believed they were returning thanks to the great giver of life for a new morning to rejoice in and be happy. It recurred to him with a sensation of remorse that while Dolly had always simply bent her knees by her poor bed, ere she hurriedly put on her ragged clothing, he had far more frequently bounded out, half-dressed, to listen to the magpies gurgling as they walked and strutted on the dewy grass, or watch the rising sun light up the face of the grand mountain opposite his lost home. Poor doll, he thought. She will remember me when she says her prayers, and I will not forget mine again, and remember her. Now was not that as much a prayer in the sight of the great Creator as if the boy had gone down on his knees and cried out his thoughts in well-chosen words? I think it was, and would rather trust in the benefit of such an aspiration than have the longest prayer said on my behalf by a drawling, solemn-visaged, white-robed parson from the grand old Gothic pulpit. It was breakfast time when he at last reached the selection at Tarasim, and Pleasant Joe was so busy frying slices of mutton cut from a quarter which hung in the draught of a low-barked veranda that he did not hear the boy's approach. But soon the loud barking of a vigilant sheep-dog drew his attention, and the selector hastened to the door and threw up his hands in wonder as he recognised his visitor. "'My gracious me, Bob, is this yourself? Where in the name of all the saints did you drop from? Sure, and it's tired ye are, Bob, and little Topsy too. Come inside, lad, come inside and sit down. If you don't stop that noise, Jim, I'm sure, I'll kick you in your old carcage. The pleasant face and beaming eyes that welcomed Bob did not look by any means as if they belonged to a man from whom any animal's carcage was in danger. And well Mr. Jim the collie knew it, as, instead of ceasing his noise, he only turned his attention to his master and barked more loudly at him. It was only when Jim had been openly bribed by a chop from the hissing pan that he consented to be expelled and give Bob a chance to tell his story. 
He told it, poor lad, as he was eating the food which Joe piled on his tin plate, and while little Topsy was paying his addresses to a fine cold bone extracted from Joe's safe, which was an old case, slung from the rough rafters by some bits of stringy bark. "'And that's the way they threaded you, my poor boy. And you runned away to Joe. More power to you, Bob. And the mother's no better, nor Kemp. Bad cess to him. And White's advised ye, eh? Well, be aisy, my lad. While Joe has a bit, or a sup, or an old bark roof, yourself shall have the same. Work, is it? Be dad, it's lashins o' that you'll have anyhow. Isn't my back fairly broke, with thrying to lift them logs without any man's help at all? Honest, kindly-hearted, pleasant Joe. Leaving our Bob safely housed in such happy quarters, we must return to the home he had left. For some time, weeping Dolly was afraid to return to the cottage, and sat out in the garden listening to her father's bitter words and terrible threats. But at length her own and brother's name, called loudly and angrily, started her to her feet, and she entered the kitchen with trembling limbs and a pale, tear-swollen face. "'You lazy young wretch, set to and clear up this broken crockery, and do it sharp, or there'll be two murders in this house instead of one. Is that rip-bob gone to bed like his drunken mother? For two pins I'd haul him out by the ears, and mind you, if he's not up to get my breakfast by cockcrow, I'll choke him.' and leaving the poor child trying anxiously to repair the effect of his violence as best she might, the wretched being stomped down to his favourite haunt at the bar of Comstock's. Dolly's task accomplished as well as she could, she took the candle into her stepmother's room, and covered the sleeping woman with the bedclothes, ere she crept to her own bed, after blowing out the light and leaving the candle on the table, where her father expected to find it on his return. She shared with Bob a little lean-to behind the house, built so carelessly of slabs that there was scarcely two you could not have put your hand between. The side of the house, against which this frail erection was built, was the only place close and draughtless, but even in that there were chinks in the weatherboards against which the girl lay, through which she could see streaks of light from the kitchen when a candle burned there. The forsaken child crept to the side of Bob's bed, which was opposite her own, and, kneeling down, laid her arms on the rough covering, and her face upon her arms. It was impossible to repress her tears as she felt that cold and empty bed, and thought of the darling brother she had lost. But, oh, how glad she was, poor unselfish child, that he was gone. Thinking of her father's awful face when he said there would be two murders in the house instead of one, she rejoiced that Bob had escaped. Ah, John Kemp, did you dream that your idle words were prophetic, and that your own child was thanking God humbly for her immolation as she knelt under the wretched roof you had desecrated, and would yet more terribly desecrate? In the early morning Dolly was astir and made the fire and hung on the kettle. As she kindled it with some of the bark she had gathered on the hillside, and Bob had carried home on the previous evening, her tears fell so heavily on the weak flame as to threaten its extinction. When again should she enjoy happy confidences with dear old Bob, with the fair pretense of gathering morning wood on the quiet hillside? Alas, Dolly, never again, until the everlasting morning breaks on the everlasting hills. "'Where is that lazy villain?' cried Kemp, as he stamped toward the door on his way to Comstock's for his morning draught of poison. "'Isn't he up yet? By the heaven above me, I'll drag him out quick!' and with a volley of vile oaths he dashed into the children's room and saw the empty bed. "'Where is he? Where is he, I say? If you don't tell me what he's up to, I'll shake the life out of you.' It would not be hard to do, for as he seized and shook the child roughly, she turned pale as a leaf and staggered like a reed. Something in her face struck the man. Had he, after all, some human feeling? And he loosened his grip and stared at her. "'What's the matter? Speak up!' "'You're hiding something, doll. Where is your brother?' That word opened the fountain of the girl's half-broken heart, and her tears fell like rain. Amid sobs that seemed to rend her bosom, she forgot all but her grief at the loss of that darling brother. "'Oh, father!' she cried. "'Oh, father! Bob's gone. He's never been in bed all night. Bob's bolted.' "'Bolted?' "'Yes, father. He's run away.' "'Mother beat him, and he's gone away. 
we'll never see him again a slight noise behind kemp made him look toward the bedroom door standing in it was his wife with her torn trailing skirt dishevelled hair and unfastened gown just as she had laid down on the previous night the expression of deep though evanescent feeling he saw in the face of the woman had a most revolting effect on the unfeeling wretch he burst into a harsh laugh <laughs> that's the best news i've heard this ten years he cried a blessed good riddance of bad rubbish i say missus just you try your hand at giving me a hammering maybe i'd bolt too you'd like that wouldn't you and he turned out of the door with an uncommonly pleasant for him expression on his face if the loss of her son made any impression on mrs kemp she said nothing and it must have been evinced in a firmer determination to drink than ever dolly was the messenger to comstock's now and many noticed how the sensitive girl felt the humiliation twice on such an errand she had met wright the old woodcutter and wept as he patted her shoulder with an assurance that bob was all right and would come to take her away before she knew where she was in the meantime be a good girl my dear he would add try to help bob's mother and your father's wife and never forget to say your prayers so went on six comfortless weeks in drinking and quarrelling and bitter recrimination until came at length one terrible night long remembered in the neighbourhood of the mountain kemp had been drinking heavily and neglecting his work as a very natural consequence and had been discharged by his employer instead of turning over a new leaf his discharge only made him frantic and while his credit lasted more desperate in folly than ever matters were in this state when one day toward afternoon mrs kemp sent dolly down to comstock's father is there said the girl pleadingly i don't care if satan is there was the retort angrily what do i care for your father i wish he was in blank go at once you hussy and if you value your bones don't let the grass grow under them big dirty feet of yours dolly went for she dared not say no but she was womanly enough to feel bitterly that taunt of the viragos about her poor bare feet if they were big she could not help it and how could she keep them clean paddling about the dirty house in the dirtier yard half a dozen times a day she had to encounter decently dressed girls on her way to comstock's who sneered at her tattered dress and bare feet but if she was tattered and barefooted whose fault was it and bitterly the child clutched the bottle that she would like to have smashed to atoms against the stones at her feet poor tried dolly trembling she slipped into the bar for she guessed her father was there she was not mistaken kemp was there in the centre of a noisy lot of men himself the loudest and the noisiest of them all when his eyes lighted on dolly his dark face deepened into a scowl and the frightened child shrunk back all at once however to her great surprise a look of cunning hypocrisy replaced the anger in his visage and he smiled grimly as dolly hesitatingly placed the bottle before the landlord eh doll he said is the old woman hard up for a drop eh well it's not often i shout for her but she's been washin and i don't mind for once landlord fill it up at my expense and he dashed some coin upon the counter dolly went away wonderingly for she had never before known her father to do such a thing on the contrary all his fierce invective and violent threats had been levelled against her stepmother's use of liquor she gave mrs kemp the bottle most reluctantly for well too well she knew what would be the certain result was your beauty of a father there the woman asked yes mother ah i'll be hung for that villain yet and she violently gesticulated her fist down toward the hotel hung for him yet how dolly pondered over the words she had so often heard from her poor father's lips i'll be hung for you yet he would hiss hoarsely between his teeth during their awful quarrels i'll be hung for you yet and the words somehow rang in dolly's ears all the afternoon as she tried to finish some of the woman's half-done work what a dreadful thing it must be to be hung somewhere she had seen a picture of a man hanging by his neck over the heads of a great crowd and it now recurred to the child with a shudder hung oh heavens if her poor father should be hung could she ever live to see or hear of it oh no oh no near the time of setting sun dolly went up the hill and sat down with her face toward the mountain just on the spot where bob and she used to sit when the morning wood had been gathered 
for of course it had happened as she knew and feared mrs kemp was dead asleep under the evil influence of her curse kemp had not been home all day it was not his present wish to have any quarrel with his unfortunate wife so poor dolly went up the hill and sat down with her face to the grand old mountain and the low sun to think of bob and wonder if she should ever see him again dolly was changing fast and every one of the pitying neighbours saw what the parents eyes did not open to observe she was growing thin and pale and the large grey eyes were growing larger and brighter with each passing day the girl missed her darling and only companion and was lonely unto death she was hopeless too as well as comfortless and what unto young or old is a deadlier draught than that which is drank from the cup of despair she sat so long there in her favourite attitude with her hands clasped over her knees and her eyes fixed dreamily on the darkening face of the beautiful mountain that she started to find when she looked down toward the cottage a light in the doorway with hasty feet the child ran lightly down the hill she had prepared the evening meal before she left so everything was ready for her father's supper he did not however appear to have returned for the supper was untouched who then had lit the candle left that full bottle so very conspicuously on the table the fact was that kemp had returned in the growing twilight he had slipped up the hill with that bottle hidden under his coat he had supper in the hut of a mate and now barely remained to place the bottle where his wife could see it and light the candle that she might not fail to do so when she awoke how thoughtful and how generous had john kemp become all at once poor patient dolly sat on the doorstep till late but no father came and no mother awoke cold and tired and chilled with the night air she at last crept to bed and fell quickly asleep no doubt the girl had fallen asleep with a nervous uneasiness of the burning candle and mrs kemp's helpless condition for she started at the least sound twice she awoke and peered through the crack near her bed and the second time she saw her stepmother sitting by the table pouring something out of that dreadful bottle with one hand and holding some bread and meat in the other which she appeared to be eating dolly lay down again with a helpless sigh for what could she do save ask the great god to help and pity her poor stepmother a darker night never fell under the mountain they were holding high carousel in comstock's but as it was long after twelve the doors were shut there was not however a policeman nearer than three miles and he was little likely to trouble them for any breach of the liquor laws being a considerable law-breaker himself in that way kemp was the centre of a noisy lot in the bar parlour but he was uncommonly quiet that night at last when the party were desperately engaged at car playing for stakes they could ill afford to lose he watched his opportunity and stole out in hopes he should not be missed up the hill toward his wretched home he hastened stumbling often in the darkness yet more from excitement than anything else for he had trod the path so often as to make every stone on it familiar to him when he reached the cottage and paused at the still open door he could hear the sound of his wife's loud breathing so close to him that he wandered and peeped in before crossing the threshold the sight john kemp saw was a pitiful one yet strange to say he uttered a low chuckle of satisfaction mrs kemp had fallen from her chair and was lying on the dirty floor which was of worn and uneven bricks the candle was burning low and the long wick flickered its uneven light over the upturned face and loose scattered hair lying across it one hand was extended and close to it lay the broken bottle while the other was clasped on her breast when ten minutes after john kemp hastened down the hill there was no light in that cottage and strange gurgling sounds were breaking the silence of the darkness the third time dolly woke it was at the sound of the wretched woman's fall and she was rising in bed to get up and see if she could help to raise her when she heard her father's foot on the floor what passed during the next ten minutes dolly saw as with parted lips and horror-stricken eyes she peered through the chink god in heaven help the child cowering down in her wretched bed with trembling limbs that she feared would betray her and great drops of perspiration standing on her white face she listened to the awful sounds in the pitchy darkness a gasping gurgling noise with the sound of steel falling upon the bricks and then such struggling of booted heels upon the hard floor dolly dared not move 
she did not know her father had gone, and every moment expected he would lean over her to see if she slept, or had, indeed, witnessed that deed. God in heaven help the child. He did help the innocent one. She fainted. They had not missed Kemp at Comstock's, so deeply were they interested in the result of their gambling. He sat down among them and joined in. If his hand trembled, no one observed it, and the drink was near. At last, his mate threw down his cards with an oath, and said he was done with it, that he was cleared out of every blessed sixpence. "'Never mind, old fellow,' Kemp said, as he also rose to his feet. "'I'll shout, and we'll go home. Better luck next time.' "'I'm blessed if I dare venture home,' cried the man, whose name was Widgeon. "'The missus would kick up such a row, and I'm not fit to meet it. I'll stay here till morning. Comstock wouldn't have you, man. Come on up with me.' "'If you're afraid of your missus, I'm not afraid of mine, and you can have a nap on the sofa.' "'Was that true, John Kemp? If you really had no fear of your wife, what made you tremble so that your very teeth chattered as you neared the door? Why, when you reached it, did you feign to pick up an axe that you had stumbled against, and send Widgeon inside to strike a light? "'She's sure to be sound as a top, and won't hear you,' he said. "'Yes. There was no doubt about it.' Mrs. Kemp was sound asleep, and would not hear Widgeon as he crossed the doorway and struck a match. While it was slowly kindling, he moved toward the table to look for the candle, carefully shading the match with both hands as he went. Before he had time to know what he was doing, he fell over some object on the floor. At the sound of his fall, Kemp's heart seemed to stop suddenly, and his feet to be rooted to the ground. "'What the deuce!' exclaimed the man, as he disentangled his feet and arose. But he knew Mrs. Kemp's habits, and at once guessed that she lay on the floor in a state of intoxication. He struck another match and lit the bit of candle, which he then lifted and held over the prostrate woman. The trembling Kemp heard an exclamation, and then Widgeon's footsteps as he came to the door, into which Kemp feigned to be entering. "'Come outside. I want to speak to you,' Widgeon said pushing his acquaintance back. "'Come outside.' "'Can't you speak inside?' Kemp blustered. "'I'm not henpecked like you. Come inside and say whatever you have to say.' Widgeon drew the willing enough man back, and spoke in a low tone. I wonder who he was afraid would hear him. "'I want to speak to you of the Mrs. Kemp. I'm afraid she's sick.' "'Ha, <laughs> ha! As if that was anything new, man. Yes, sick of beer or gin.' "'Worse, Kemp. Worse nor that. "'Pluck up now, mate, and bear it like a man. "'The missus is dead.' "'Dead?' he repeated huskily. "'You're raven, Widgeon. She's only asleep. "'I've seen her like that often. "'Let me in, I say. I won't be held back.' "'He did it well, we must own, as he rushed inside, "'and, seizing the dying candle, held it over the dead woman.' If his hand trembled so that the unsteady flame flickered to and fro, who could wonder? And if he fell back against the wall, white and gasping, pray, what wonder? Was not his dead wife lying at his feet, weltering in her own blood? Widgeon looked round hastily and lighted a fresh candle that lay on the dresser, and then he turned with ready sympathy to the bereaved husband, who still shrank, gasping against the wall. "'Go outside, John. This is no place for you. I would have prepared you a bit.' but you wouldn't give me a chance. Kemp permitted himself to be led into the cool night air, and seated himself on a stone not far from the door, while Widgeon returned to make a closer examination into the condition of the corpse. Mrs. Kemp was lying on her side, with the evident signs of a hard death in her attitude. Her head was thrown back, and her throat severed from ear to ear. It was an awful sight, and the man Widgeon shuddered as he hurried away from it. John... "'I'm going down to Comstock's,' he said, laying a hand on Kemp's shoulder. "'Come on.' "'No, I can't go,' Kemp replied. "'The girl's here.' "'Oh, aye, I forgot. "'Twould be bad if she wakened. "'Well, I shan't be long, and we'll bring up some of the chaps. "'Keep up a good heart, mate.' No sooner had the sound of Widgeon's footsteps down the hill ceased to be heard than Kemp rose hurriedly and went round the house to the back. He dared not go through the front, for he should then have been obliged to step over it. So he went round the back and into the little room where his child lay sleeping. Poor Dolly had hardly roused from her faint, only to fall into a heavy sleep, 
peopled by terrible dreams in which she moaned and muttered and struggled. Kemp knew that there was often a bit of candle in an old candlestick on the box that served as a table for the children, and, with a trembling hand, he struck a match and lit it. Then he turned a quick glance over his shoulder, ere he looked at the sleeping girl. Kemp was reassured. Dolly could not have slept so, had she suspected, much less known, what lay inside. But as he bent over her, and saw the damp face and white muttering lips, his face grew grey with fear. Even as the trembling of this awful fear entered his very heart, words broke in almost a scream from the girl's lips. "'I'll be hung for you yet! I'll be hung for you yet!' The young man staggered back as though he had received his death blow, and the candle dropped from his hand. In the darkness that was now so terrible to him, he dared not remain, but he managed to stagger out and round the house again, and stand on the brow of the hill where he might first hear the voices and steps of approaching companionship. What could the girl have meant? Whatever could she have meant? She was sound asleep, and she was dreaming just now, and she had often heard him utter the threat to the dead woman. But just now, what could she have meant? Was it possible she could have seen anything? Had the dying woman managed to call? But no, it was impossible. A timid, nervous child like that could never have lain down and slept after such a sight. He might reassure himself so far, but, after all, what had she meant? I'll be hung for you yet. Oh, heaven, what an awful fear, hitherto forgotten, grasped at that wretched man's heart, as he, for the first time, felt the danger of his position. If Dolly did know, if his life was at the mercy of a weak, timorous, conscientious child, he clutched at the band of his shirt nervously, as it seemed to choke him. But nonsense, he had planned all safely, and all would be well. Widgeon ran nearly all the way to Comstock's, forgetting, in the awful news he carried, the steep, stony nature of the path he trod. The company had not yet separated, and as he burst among them, his white, terror-stricken visage and trembling frame drew all attention to him. "'I say, Widgeon, what's the matter?' the landlord asked. "'Has the missus been beaten you, or have you met a ghost on the way home?' "'For heaven's sake, give me a drink!' he cried, and seized a glass pushed toward him by one of the men, which he drained at a gasp. "'The old woman has clawed Widgeon,' one bantered. "'I can see the marks on his face.' "'Don't chaff at such a time, mates,' cried Widgeon, as he set the glass down and wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. "'An awful thing has happened up at Kemp's. I went home with him to get a shakedown, and we found Mrs. Kemp lying on the floor dead.' "'Dead?' many voices cried in consternation. "'Yes, and the worst is, she's done it herself. Her throat was cut from one ear to the other, and the knife she did it with lying close up against her on the floor.' "'Comstock, send a man for the police. "'We don't want to get into no trouble over it. "'And which of you will come with me to keep poor Kemp company?' "'How did he take it?' asked one of the volunteers. "'Very bad, poor chap. "'I wanted him to come down with me, but he wouldn't, "'as the girl might wake and be frightened.' "'And so the men went up the hill to the man who stood out there, "'almost dazed in the darkness, "'yet with the sweet breath of night blowing over him from the grand old mountain.' which yet he could not see. He could hear, though, voices in the whispering leaves and rustling grass, and every one of them said, I'll be hung for you yet. All the township was in an uproar early next, or, indeed, the same morning when day broke, at the quickly disseminated news, and it so happened that Wright, the woodcutter, was down to get a bit of tea and sugar for his breakfast, and was overwhelmed with trouble for his young friend Bob. I'll keep my word to him, he said to himself. I know Comstock will lend me his horse and spring cart, for he often gets my dray, and I'll go over to Tarrasome Creek and bring the lad back. He'd never forgive me if he didn't get a last look at his mother. By the time we get back, I dare say they will have put her right, and she won't be such a sight for the boy. God help him to look at. So, in less than an hour, the kind old man had left on his way to Pleasant Joe's. The buzz of many voices roused Dolly from the kind of lethargy in which she had lain, and she started up in the terror of half-remembrance. One glance through the boards showed her many faces, and one awful object yet lying among them on the floor, and, with a subdued cry, she bounded from her bed, 
and put on the few poor articles of attire which formed her whole dress. No one that saw her could doubt that the night's awful experience had nearly killed the child. Every joint trembled, and her face was of the hue of ashes. Her poor toilet completed, she fell upon her knees, helpless and wordless, by the side of Bob's bed, and, if any one thinks that her father in heaven did not hear the unspoken prayer for help in that child's heart, let him or her go to church and pray for themselves. In this attitude she was found by a neighbouring, kindly-hearted woman, who had come to remove her to her own home, and who, in much trepidation, Kemp had ushered into the little lean-to. "'Dolly, dear, get up,' the woman said softly. "'You are coming home with me. Get up, like a good girl.' Dolly raised her white face from Bob's bed, and looked at the speaker. In the glance, however, she saw her father's figure at the door, and with a cry buried her face once more in the bed. Kemp's face flushed hotly, but he controlled himself and spoke quietly. "'She's fretting for Bob yet, Mrs. Scanlon. She's always hanging about his bed. Let me speak to her by herself a bit, and she'll go quietly enough with you.' Following this hint, the woman left the room, and then Kemp's whole appearance changed. "'Get up out of that!' he whispered between his set teeth. "'Get up quick, or it'll be worse for you.' Dolly rose like a machine, and looked with such horror in his face that he felt as if the child's eyes were daggers aimed at his very life. But that very life was at stake now, and maybe at the mercy of this shrinking girl, and he must not quail. "'Look here,' he said in a horrible and significant tone. "'Look here, my girl. If you happen to know anything you hadn't ought to know, or happen to see anything you hadn't ought to see, You'd better keep your tongue quiet about it, or by I'll cut your throat too. Look at me and answer. Look at me, I say. She couldn't look at him, poor child. Not that she was afraid. She was past that. But that she saw last night, when she saw him. Instead of looking at him, therefore, she turned her face farther away. But insensibly, as the uppermost thought worked to her lip, she muttered softly, I'll be hanged for you yet. Kemp staggered back, astounded. "'The girl's mad,' he cried. "'She's mad by—' "'No, she's not. She's only dazed with grief,' said Mrs. Scanlon, as she marched past him and drew Dolly into the open air. "'She'll come with me now, Dolly dear, won't you?' As she passed her father, the girl cast one quick look up into his face and left him. Poor, little, helpless, trembling girl, though she was, stupid with terror, it was as though an accusing spirit had looked into his eyes with horror and loathing beyond expression, and that spirit, the spirit of the murdered woman, for Dolly had her mother's eyes in common with Bob. Leaving this painful scene, follow me now to good old Wright's destination, and see what Bob has been doing all these weeks. Save that he had at first missed Dolly sadly, they were the happiest weeks his young life had known. Joe was so kind to him, and little Topsy was so happy in the companionship of Jim and the chase of possums and bandicoots and kangaroo rats, not to mention snakes, of whom he was becoming an ardent enemy, that the days grew to seem like hours and the weeks like days. They worked short hours, but they worked hard for all that, and there were still long hours to play, in which Joe was perhaps the loudest and the happiest after all. There are not many men who keep the feelings of boyhood until pleasant Joe's age, but Joe was one of the happy few, and he had now the happy conscience of giving a home to a homeless lad, and of supplying to him the place of father and sister and mother. If there was one subject more than another upon which these two conversed longer, and agreed more entirely on, it was the subject of their several mothers. Joe's memory of home had also been a sad one, yet he had loved his mother with all the strength of an affectionate boyhood. "'Never desert her, lad,' he would say, "'for you can't repay all she did for you when you were unable to help yourself.' And Bob would answer, "'I will never desert poor mother, Joe. Don't be afraid. If she will leave that camp, she might be better. If she will come and live with me and Dolly when I am a man, perhaps she will be better. If it wasn't because of Dolly, I should wish she had never married Kemp, for I often used to think he made poor mother worse, Joe. Thus things went on at Joe's selection, until came one day that our Bob had cause to remember bitterly all the days of his afterlife.
Joe and he were clearing new land after finishing their fencing, and started from home after a good breakfast, and in one of the pleasantest days that had ever broke. How they laughed and shouted, to be sure, as the colony of laughing jackasses in the old peppermint tree behind the hut greeted them with their absurd chorus of morning rejoicings, and with what zest they tossed down their axes to join in the chase when Jim and Topsy started a hare and ran the poor fellow to his lair in the brush fence, only to be disappointed at last. Their footsteps made tracks on the heavily dewed grass, as though a fall of snow had lain upon it. Ah! Never again did Bob follow that same way, but he remembered the honest face and kindly smile of Pleasant Joe, his true and faithful and lost friend. They worked until noon, and then ate their dinner under an old gaunt tree, with crooked bowl, great spreading limbs, and scanty foliage. "'I'll have a tough job with this chap,' Joe said, looking up as he smoked his after-dinner pipe. "'But I guess we'll beat him afore night, eh, Bob, lad?' "'Before night, Joe? Why, we'll do him in an hour.' "'Where do you think he'll fall, Joe?' "'To northward, lad. "'But we'll have to mind our P's and Q's, or he'll be on the fence.' "'They recommenced work refreshed, "'and as old Wright, the woodcutter, neared his destination, "'for it was that day so awful at the mountain, "'he heard the quick stroke of axes "'that guided him to those of whom he was in sad search. "'All at once he saw the top of an old tree totter and tremble, "'and then a mighty creaking preceded a crash "'that resounded like thunder in the forest.' Almost with this crash came a heart-rending shriek, and then wild cries for help in a youthful voice that Wright knew only too well. Joe and the lad had cut the tree until the practised eye of the selector saw it only required a few more strokes to overthrow it. Moving out, followed by Bob, he examined the lay of the branches with a critical eye. "'Stand well back, Bob,' he said, "'and call the dogs with you. That's an ugly branch up there.' He's got the heaviest share of the limb-wood, and might lurch it any way. But I think it will fall down the hill. Stand well back, lad. And the honest chap looked back over his shoulder, with axe raised, before he struck the final blow. He struck it, and moving slowly back to what he deemed a place of safety, watched it sway and totter and quiver like a dying thing. Then came the creaking as the tree bent, slowly at first, and then, as its great weight began to tell, with a startling suddenness, like the flicker of an expiring candle, or the last throw of a dying giant. Bob watched it falling in the direction Joe had anticipated, but all at once it gave a sudden lurch, and it was then that old Wright heard that awful shriek, ringing so terribly in the forest echoes that it was heard far, far away. Running down the hill with a speed you would not have believed him capable of, the woodcutter came upon a scene he was never likely to forget. Lying under one of the still quivering branches was poor Joe, one of the limbs lying upon his body, with the horrified boy wildly trying to lift the crushing weight. Oh, the awful face of the suffering man! Oh, the terrible despair in the lad's eyes! "'Keep up, Joe,' the woodcutter cried. "'I can free you in a minute.' And seizing an axe, he rained heavy blows on the limb, till at last it was cut, and the released tree rolled over and lifted its deathly arm from poor, dying, pleasant Joe. Alas, yes, but too plainly dying. "'Thank you, Wright,' he gasped. "'But it is too late.' And then the white face grew whiter as he fainted. "'Run down the hill to the hut, lad,' cried Wright, as he lifted Joe's head to his knee. "'And if there's a drop of spirits there, bring it up.' Bob never knew how he went. Poor unhappy boy, what agony and despair was in his young heart! It seemed to him that his feet were clogged with iron, while in reality he flew like the wind, as his panting heart told when he returned with the stimulant. A little administered between the white lips, and Joe opened his eyes. They fell first on Bob's face as it bent over him. My poor lad, he whispered pityingly, this is hard on you. Oh, Joe, what shall I do? "'What shall I do?' "'Be patient, my boy. "'There are more Joes in the world than one. "'Not one, Joe. "'Oh, not one!' "'And Bob's tears fell like rain on the dying man's breast. "'Come, come,' old Wright said. "'You mustn't be giving way like this. "'Cheer up, Joe. "'You're greatly better, "'and I'm just going to bring the cart down, "'and we'll take you to the doctor. "'Bob and me can lift you in nicely.' 
Joe shook his head faintly. It's too late, old mate. I feel it at my heart. But you can do as you like. Give me a little more of that brandy. I have something to say to you about Bob. When they had gratified him in this, he went on, brokenly. I have made a will, leaving the selection, and what, what I have saved to my lad here. God bless him. You will find the paper in my bunk, at the hut. You will see after the lad, right? Poor lad, Bob. And he gazed fondly into the weeping boy's face. Make yourself easy on that score, Joe, old boy. I will be a father to the boy if anything happens to you. But, please God, you'll be a father to him yourself for many a long happy year yet. Are you in any pain, mate? I have no pain. Now? At Wright's wish, Bob ran once more to the hut, and having brought out all the blankets, fastened up the hut as well as he could. Then he ran back as quickly as he could with the blankets, the dog still bounding before him as they had done in the happy morning that now seemed so long ago to poor Bob. They lifted him into the cart carefully, as though he had been a tender infant, and he seemed like a man in a dream, but with such a deathly white face. It was barely a matter of two miles to the township, and they drove so carefully over the grassy track that poor Joe was saved the least jolt. He seemed, however, to recognise the road, and as they neared the doctor's house, he made a faint motion which caused Wright to pull up. "'It's too late. I feel it. Bob, my lad, don't forget your mother, and—and and God bless you, and me.' There was a heavy sigh and a slight movement, ere good pleasant Joe was gone home. Bob did not weep now. He gazed at the face of his dead friend in an awed and stupefied way that filled Honest Wright's heart with pity. He got down and gently drew the lad after him. Joe is all right now, Bob, my boy. Always remember that. And don't forget Dolly, your poor sister. You are a man now, and you have a home to give her. Will you come home to the mountain at once, Bob, and see Dolly with me? Bob shook his head and pointed to the cart. What would you stay with him for, my poor boy? Don't you know there will have to be an inquest, and, and all that? You wouldn't like to see that, eh? The boy shuddered and permitted his friend to draw him a little away. But he shook his head still as he cried, I can't go. I can't leave Joe. He has been so good to me. Now it was that the honest old woodcutter recognised the painful necessity of telling the boy something of the awful state of things at the mountain. "'Listen to me, my poor lad,' he said, laying his hand softly on the young shoulder. "'You know I would not advise you wrong, and you know poor Joe got my promise to be a father to you. If I say to you that poor Dolly is in great trouble, and I think you ought to go to her at once, will you believe me?' "'In trouble? Dolly in trouble? What trouble?' And Bob lifted his swollen eyes and stared into Wright's face. "'In a trouble that will be yours too when you hear it.' Now, Bob, be a man. I came over for you today on purpose. Mother is dead, my poor lad. Don't you want to see her and comfort Dolly? Mother dead. And Joe had, with his last breath, told him not to forget his mother. Ah, poor, poor mother and poor Dolly. He burst into a passion of tears and laid his head on Wright's shoulder. Take me home. Take me home. Oh, mother! Poor mother! Take me home! Take me home! It was home at last, when mother was dead. While they had been speaking, kindly hands had lifted the township's favourite from the cart, and under the supervision of doctor and police, laid him in the hotel. As soon, therefore, as the horse was rested, Wright took Bob to have a last look at his friend, and the lad took the dead hand, whose touch chilled him and gazed through blinding tears into the calm, dead face. But Mother had taken Joe's place, and Bob thought to himself awfully, Will Mother be like that? Oh, will she be like that? Alas, no, Bob, my boy. Poor Mother was not like that. They left the township a sad quartet, for even Jim and Topsy, who shared the cart with Wright and Bob, seemed to know what was wrong. Topsy sat close to her master, 
as if for protection on approaching the old dreaded unkind home while jim coiled himself up where his dying and dead master had lain do you doubt that he knew what a loss he had sustained when they had passed many miles the lad thinking far more of home and dolly and his dead mother than of the quiet friend he was leaving behind him he suddenly asked wright what did mother die of mr wright the boy had been thinking of that last night when he had bolted and when he had gone in to bid farewell to the sleeping woman but the question struck the woodcutter like a blow he had known all along that the truth must be told by a friend else it would fall very suddenly upon him but now how should he tell it he asked for help in the stronghold of faith ere he replied you will have to ask god to help you now my lad for i must tell you the truth and then he paused while bob's face grew white and his lips trembled poor mother was found dead and it is supposed she killed herself oh groaned bob as he hid his face in his brown hands and was dolly there poor dolly yes dolly was there my boy and now you see how much she wants you eh yes bob saw how much dolly wanted him and he did not wonder at the kind words and pitying looks that greeted him as they alighted at the mountain they whispered let dolly tell him it will come better from her what had dolly to tell him the girl clung to her brother as though she would never again loosen her grasp but she shuddered when as they sat on the following sunny morning in their old quarters on the hill he asked her about mother's death dear doll how pale you look but i suppose it's that black dress who gave it to you doll mrs comstock dolly said they have been all very good to me why won't they let me see mother the lad asked with an awe-stricken look down toward the well-known cottage around which already twos and threes of men were gathering oh the inquest bob don't you know there must be an inquest it's to be to-day they will let you see her after what does she look like dolly for he was remembering the calm face of dear dead joe as he had seen it last poor doll shuddered from head to foot for she recalled the awful form that lay on the floor as she had seen it through the chink behind her bed did you see her dolly did you see poor mother oh how awful it must have been it was not like poor joe poor mother how did she do it dolly was it the drink the lad asked it in a whisper for he thought it almost disloyal to the dead to hint at her sin oh no oh no bob her throat was cut it was dreadful oh i shall never forget it and then to the bewildered boy's astonishment the girl's face grew whiter than ashes as she laid her head heavily against him murmuring i'll be hung for you yet the child had fainted again the men were still gathering round the door of the cottage and policemen's buckles glimmered in the sun while bob sat there supporting his sister helplessly until the fresh breeze revived her and she opened her eyes as she did so mrs scanlan the woman who had taken her away from her awful home on the previous morning came quickly up the hill with a strange consequence in her manner and a hard determined face what's the matter with dolly bob poor child she's very weak get up my dear you're all right now and you must come with me where the child asked with a terrified look as the woman raised her to her feet my dear you must attend the inquest as a witness i didn't like to tell you before but you needn't be afraid for i'll be with you dolly shook from head to foot and looked with her old bewildered look at the dear old mountain but no help was there and then she fixed her great eyes appealingly on her brother what do you want with dolly mrs scanlan if she goes i'll go i won't leave doll nonsense bob your sister has to go but there is no necessity for you to go who has a better right to go bob asked almost angrily where doll goes i go and that's enough about it seeing the lad immovable in his determination the woman was obliged to give in and with his sister's hand clasped close in his bob went down the hill it was piteous to see the two children approaching their home and some of the men drew back to let them pass but one of the policemen barred their passage until some instructions from a superior permitted their entrance 
the coroner was still seated at a table in the front room but the inquest was in reality over evidence had been given of the woman kemp's inebriate habits and witnesses had been called as to the amount she had drunk on that particular day widgeon had related how kemp and he had gone up to the cottage and how he had stumbled over the dead body in the dark the fact had been elicited that the body was not quite cold the jury had deliberated the verdict given committed suicide while in an unsound state of mind from the effects of drink when mrs scanlan and the two children of the dead woman entered the room in company with one of the constables kemp was standing near the table the centre of a knot of sympathising men when the little party entered if it had been possible for his face to grow whiter it would have done so but the trial he had gone through that morning had been an awful one yet he set his teeth together and glared with his eyes as they fell upon the children the constable whispered something to the coroner who resumed the seat from which he had just risen it appears gentlemen of the jury that our work is not finished constable smith tells me that some fresh evidence is tendered which may give a different colouring to this painful affair kemp looked into the horror-stricken face of his girl who shrank from him as if she had been struck and then he turned one quick glance toward the door between which and himself a policeman had quietly moved he felt choking the room appeared to reel around with him the noise of many waters to be in his ears only for a moment however when a fierce rage recovered him and as he again glared at dolly his nails clenched themselves into his palms the tendered evidence was mrs scanlan's she related how she had come to the cottage to remove dolly from the sad vicinity and how strangely the child had acted when her father spoke to her when he ordered her from the room her suspicions had been aroused and having listened she heard kemp distinctly threaten the girl with her mother's death if she split on him she had been trying to get the truth from her but vainly and firmly believed that fright had turned the unfortunate child's brain it is very sad my girl the coroner said kindly but it would be very wrong for you to hide anything you know about such an awful crime tell the jury all you know about it dolly looked at the gentleman as he spoke and then quickly into that awful face of her father there she read such horrors that her soul shuddered within her do not be afraid my child no one shall harm you tell the gentleman all you know i'll be hung for you yet gasped the girl as she clasped her hand over her eyes kemp knew his fate was sealed the gallows was before him a desperate and despairing rage possessed him and before one of the men guessed his intention he dashed forward and struck poor dolly a violent blow on the temple take that he roared as the child fell heavily on the floor i've promised it to you and you've got it and before he could be arrested he dashed through the open door and down the hill with a speed indeed of a man flying for his life so violent was the shock and commotion that he would undoubtedly have escaped had it not been for our brave bob the poor boy had listened with an awful horror to the story of his mother's murder as it fell from the lips of mrs scanlan and when kemp struck dolly he had darted forward when the murderer's sudden dash to the door nearly overturned him bob staggered recovered himself look wildly at dolly and then at the hill down which kemp was almost flying when an instinct came upon him that lent wings to his young feet he was the first with shouts of seize the wretch stop the murderer resounding after him kemp fled but bob was hard upon his heels far before the pursuing crowd and in such a line with kemp that the police were afraid to fire in case of hitting the lad bob pursued his mother's murderer kemp was making for barker's shaft down which could he succeed in escaping he could set a hundred men at defiance in the great drives and perhaps eventually escape up some of the many old sinkings everybody knew this hence the anxiety to seize him before it was too late he had slightly gained on his stepson when a slight rise in the ground showed the stronger young lungs bob was upon him had him by the throat and pulled him to the ground in a moment the wretched man was up again trying to shake the boy off with a volley of fierce oaths but in vain bob clung to him like a leech panting and with blows raining on him the lad hung on should the murderer of his poor mother escape no a thousand times no 
though he should die for it. Doubtless Kemp would have added another to the list of his crimes, but help was at hand. In another moment the murderer was seized and bound and handcuffed, and the exhausted lad raised by many hands and cheered with many approving words. "'Brave lad!' cried old Wright, as he met and wrung his hand. "'Thou hast at least avenged thy mother, and thou couldst do no more.' It was the brightest of afternoons, and the sun flooded the grand old mountain with a wreath of colouring. The breeze seemed to blow more sweetly adown it than ever, and it blew upon the white face of dying Dolly. She had begged to be carried to the old spot on the hill, and the faithful old woodcarter carried her up in his arms and held her on his knee. Bob's hand was in hers, her head upon his breast. She had lost all recollection of her father or his crime, and was thinking only of the everlasting hills to which she was going. "'I know heaven will be just like the dear old mountain, Bob,' she whispered. "'What are you crying for? Don't you like heaven?' Those were Dolly's last words. She slept home quietly as a child rocked in its cradle. Few of his age have had the unhappy experiences of our poor Bob, and they sobered him for life. Not, however, into that ascetic sobriety that makes a man a hermit or an unbeliever in the real enjoyment of life. Good old Wright went with him to live and die at the selection, and many a happy year they spent there in the society of Topsy and Jim. Aye, and the woodcutter lived to be called Grandad, and to nurse Bob's happy children on his knee, and every one of them, as they grew up, heard the story of Dolly, and Pleasant Joe, and Poor Mother. Never a word was said, however, about the murderer Kemp. He was hanged at Sydney, a trembling coward, and there were those who said that his last words, muttered fearfully under that awful cap, were, I'll be hung for you yet. End of story Section 6 of Stories from the Detectives Album by Waif Wanda, also known as Mary Fortune. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsty. The Fatal Cliff Professor Wilmot and his daughter Carla, more familiarly known as Charlie, lived in a capacious villa residence close to a favourite watering place on our bay, and with a grand view of the broad water of the said bay, that gives one at least a faint idea of the infinite ocean toward which you can look past Cape Shank from the position I write of. The professor, when I introduced him to you, was sitting rigidly upright in a chair, made to be lounged in, and he was looking, from over his spectacles and under his black velvet skull-cap, at Charlie, who occupied a chair at the same table near him, and who was, at this moment, leaning her eyes wearily on her left hand while the other dropped the pen it held to the page of an M.S. before her. Nothing could be more unlike a girl to be called Charlie than fair Carla Wilmot. There was nothing masculine or even hoyden-like about her petite, graceful figure, and nothing but intelligence and sensibility of temper in the broad brow, with its crown of wavy, sunny hair and the soft blue eyes and sweet, rosy lips. Her father's name was Carlo, and a fond young wife had insisted on her first and only babe being called Carla. Thence, loving tongues and laughing lips had dubbed the one household pet, Charlie, as the little feet began their patter. So it was, that to-day those who knew the professor's daughter well called her Charlie still. At this moment Professor Wilmot did not look too well pleased. His grey brows were bent as he gazed at the girl. She was a pretty enough picture in her fair, young and tasteful attire, to unbend the stiffest brow, but I suppose our professor did not see the picture in a good light, for his voice was slightly querulous as he asked, "'What is the matter, Carla?' Now the professor never called her Carla, save when he was composing and dictating to her some extra metaphysical paragraph of his forthcoming work, The Cosmical Structure of Plumo's Life, or when he was annoyed with her, so she hastily uncovered her face. I've got such a pain in my forehead and eyes, papa. The words I write seem running into each other. And no wonder. I'll tell you what it is, Professor. You'll have your daughter laid on a sick bed before you know where you are if you keep her tied down to this writing day after day. 
Carla's fair face flushed, and her eyes brightened as she rose to greet the visitor, while the professor stared at him as if he was one of the most unexpected, not to say unwelcome, visitors in the world. "'We didn't hear you, Dr. Bengerfield,' Carla smilingly said, as she laid her little hand in a strong brown palm out held to her. "'How the mischief did you get in?' the professor inquired rather sullenly. "'By the door, my dear sir, in the way visitors are usually admitted, only that, as I knocked twice, and got no invitation, I entered without permission. "'Papa is always glad to see you, doctor,' Carla said timidly, as Dr. Bengerfield seated himself. But the good professor was not, just then, in the humour to endorse his daughter's assertion. "'What do you mean, John Bengerfield, by asserting that I will have Carla laid upon a sick bed? Do you intend to insinuate that, in requiring her services for an hour or two daily, as my amanuensis, I am injuring her health? Bah! Stuff!' And the irate gentleman pushed his velvet cap more off his forehead, and took a huge pinch of snuff. "'I mean to insinuate nothing, my dear old friend. I mean to assert that Miss Carla's health is likely to be very permanently injured by the treatment you are subjecting her to. I wonder where your eyes are, sir. It is as plain as daylight that your daughter is suffering severely from her constant employment at your writing table. Do you suppose a young girl can enjoy such total deprivation of light and air and society?' "'God bless my soul!' ejaculated the astonished professor, as he sat still more rigidly upright, and stared wildly at the now blushing and trembling Charlie. "'I am not ill, papa. Indeed, pray do not be alarmed. But I confess, I should like to get the air a little oftener. My head aches almost continually of late.' "'Well, well, well, to think of this. Put on your hat, child, and go out with the doctor. I wouldn't have you ill for all the world.' Yet the poor man cast a piteous look at the unfinished sheet of manuscript on which poor Carla had been engaged, and where her pen had left a careless splash of ink when she dropped it wearily. "'Yes, Carla, do. Go and get ready. My trap is at the door, and I will take you for a drive.' The girl looked at the speaker with a grateful smile, and having kissed her father by way of compensation for the loss of her services for the time, left the room to prepare for her drive. When the door had closed behind her, the doctor laid his hand kindly on the professor's shoulder. "'Don't look so distressed, my friend. It will do your own brain no harm to have a rest, and I will make an especial hour for you tonight, and take Carla's place as secretary.' "'Will you?' and Professor Wilmot's face brightened. "'Well, that's kind now, John. But you don't think Charlie's really ill, do you?' "'No, no, only too closely confined. You must not forget how very young she is. She's twenty-one, Professor said thoughtfully. Why, John, this is the twenty-third of March. It is nineteen years this day since Catherine. And he covered his face with his hands. Carla is so like her, so like her. The words were lost in a groan, and the Professor's manuscripts were forgotten. Nineteen years are long enough to bury the dead, my dear old friend. "'John Bengerfield said softly. "'Don't look back so far. "'Here is Carla. "'Don't, pray don't let her see your distress.' "'The father was himself again, "'as fresh and blooming and bright. "'His fair girl left another kiss on his forehead "'ere she tripped away with the doctor. "'You can arrange the next chapter while I'm away, Papa, "'and I will make up for lost time when I return. "'You would have been doubtful of Dr. Bengerfield's veracity, had you seen the bright flush of health and happiness on Carla Wilmot's cheek, and the soft light in her blue eyes as the doctor gathered the reins in his hands, and his snug trap whirled along the cliff road. The sea air was fresh, and the sky aglow with sunlight, tampered by fleecy white clouds. On the beach the slow waves broke in ridges of curling foam, and above them seagulls disputed possession of some floating weed. The world looked very fair to Carla that day and John Bengerfield's handsome face was full of smiling sympathy as he watched her face. "'You enjoy this, Charlie?' "'Oh, yes, it is delightful. How much I am obliged to you for bringing me out. Where are you driving to, Doctor?' "'I am taking you to make a morning call on a lady, Miss Wilmot. What do you think of my temerity?' "'A call on a lady? Are you jesting?' "'No. Pray, don't open your eyes so widely. 
or I shall not dare to explain. Do you remember Rose Cottage? The little place where old Mr. Denby died? Yes, it has become almost a ruin, has it not? It has been done up and revivified and decorated until you will scarcely recognise it. A widow lady named Randolph has taken it and been placed under the care of your humble servant. Is she ill, then? Only a sort of general debility, I think. But my good friend Dr. S. of Melbourne has sent her to me for change of air and furnished me with all sorts of credentials, Carla. She seems amiable and lonely, and I am going to take you to call on her because I think you are in need of female society as much as Mrs. Randolph is. Do you think Papa will like it? Charlie asked uneasily. My dear girl, Papa will not trouble his head so long as we get him on with the cosmical structure of Plumo's life. And when Mrs. Randolph returns your call, she will fascinate the professor as she has done me. Carla looked up into the doctor's face and laughed as she met his smile, yet there was an uneasiness left by some word or look of his she could not have expressed in words. They soon reached Rose Cottage, a pretty, unpretending little home, embowered in climbing plants and with latticed windows within sound of the sea and mrs randolph herself received them with frank welcome under her little veranda she was a small woman in every way so slight and active of build that you wondered at the bleached hair under the widow's cap her mourning was plain but handsome and the eyes which gleamed through gold-rimmed spectacles seemed fresh and piercing carla took a fancy to her and gave the widow a warm invitation to return her call as soon as she could well how do you like it charlie was the doctor's first question on their return home from visiting the widow at Rose Cottage. Very much indeed. How nice it is to have an educated lady within visiting distance. She is very amiable, I am sure, and not so old as she looks. Do you not think so, doctor? Yes, the doctor thought so too, said she could scarcely be more than forty-five or so, and had an idea that family troubles had pressed very heavily on her health and spirits. Indeed, Mrs. Randolph had hinted as much to him. That evening was the beginning of a very intimate acquaintance between Carla and the interesting stranger. They were almost daily together, and before a month had elapsed, Dr. Bengerfield peered into the professor's study and saw the widow quietly seated in Carla's place, busily transcribing a folio sheet of the professor's great work. Carla was in the garden, and Dr. Bengerfield joined her. Well, didn't I tell you how it would be, Charlie? I peeped into Papa's study just now, and see Mrs. Randolph has quite supplanted you. Yes, wasn't it kind of her? the sweet girl said, as she gave her little hand to be pressed by the doctor's brown, nervous paw. I was getting my old headache, and she kindly offered to release me for an hour. You see, I am taking advantage of it. I don't like these headaches, the doctor said abruptly, and a shade came over the handsome, bearded face. Why? she asked innocently, as she offered him a fresh rose from a bunch she had just gathered. He took the rose and looked at the pretty face anxiously as he inhaled the perfume of the flower, but he made no reply, save the fact that he tossed the rose away as though it had stung him. What is the matter? Carla went on anxiously also. Do you not like my rose? It had a thorn in it, Carla. What do you say to another drive this afternoon? I should like it so much but i can't i promised mrs randolph to walk with her on the cliffs while papa is having his nap you will take me another day will you not yes what do you always go to the cliffs for carla you seem to have quite a fancy for that path i wish you wouldn't go there the doctor spoke quite irritably and carla looked in his face with wonder it was such an unusual thing for her old friend to show temper of any kind that she was puzzled first the rose and then this what could be the matter? You know there is no choice. I sometimes go on the beach, but there is no view there, and the cliff is much pleasanter. Yes, yes, never mind me, Charlie. I'm bilious, I think. Good-bye for the present. And he was gone. Carla listened to the fading sound of the doctor's rapid wheels, and then she re-entered the house. The professor was sound asleep in his chair with his handkerchief over his head. The folio was finished, and Mrs. Randolph had disappeared. Just at that moment, however, the widow appeared from the garden, bonneted and shawled, ready for their walk. "'Where have you been, dear? I have just been to look for you. Only just come in. 
How could I have missed you, I wonder? Shall we go for our walk now? It's a lovely afternoon. Yes, it was a lovely afternoon, and with the soft, fresh air blowing in their faces, Carla and the widow stood upon the cliff and looked seaward. White-sailed ships gleamed away past the lighthouse, with only the seeming illimitable sea beyond them, and big waves splashed heavily at the foot of the steep cliff on which they stood. The arm of Mrs. Randolph was locked in that of Carla, and as they paused on the short turf, the widow drew Carla forward, as if to peer down the dangerous height near where they stood. "'Oh, don't, please!' the girl exclaimed as she drew back. "'I never could bear to look down there.' "'Is it possible, my love? "'Now, I never should have believed your head was so weak. "'Did you always feel that way?' "'Yes, ever since I could remember. "'I suppose that is the reason Dr. Bengerfield objects to my walking near the cliff. "'Though, indeed, I do not remember ever telling him I felt so dizzy here,' she added naively. "'Does the doctor object to our walks, then, love? "'To my walking on the cliffs only, Mrs. Randolph. "'He spoke of it only to-day.' but he seemed put out about something. The doctor is a very old friend, my dear Miss Wilmot, and is deeply interested in you. Yes, oh, yes, he has been Papa's dearest friend ever since I can remember. Indeed, I believe he was Mamma's medical attendant as well as friend. And the soft voice dropped. There was a pause, and then, in a tone of deep sympathy, the widow asked, Do you at all remember your dear mother, my child? No, not at all. I was only two years old when she died. I have often tried to fancy what it must be to remember a mother, but cannot. I was too young. But you often speak of her. Dr. Bengerfield and your good papa often speak about her to you, of course. Never, Carla said, and I have often wished they would, but it seems a painful subject. And, of course, I could not wish to pain papa. Of course not, my love. "'but it seems a very sad thing to me "'that a child should be permitted to grow up in ignorance "'of the dear mother who bore her. "'It looks as if there was something to conceal.' "'It is not too much to say that Carla looked at the speaker in wild wonder. "'Conceal? What could there be to conceal?' "'Many things, my dear, which your innocent mind can have no conception of. "'You know something, Mrs. Randolph,' Carla cried excitedly. "'You are hiding something from me which I ought to know.' "'My dear child!' the widow exclaimed, and Carla stopped and seized her arm. "'Don't, I beg of you, don't excite yourself in that manner.' "'Why should I not excite myself, Mrs. Randolph? Can I not see that you are hiding something from me about my dear mother? Why can you not tell me? What is it that I must not know? Why has Papa or the doctor never told me what you know? My dear Miss Wilmot, I am grieved beyond measure that you should have got such a strange impression on your mind through any inadvertent word of mine, the widow said, with apparently deep concern. I assure you, I know nothing but what the common gossip of the place has informed me of, and you must be aware that, if your dear papa and his confidential friend have not thought proper to enlighten you, it is not my place to do so. Carla looked seaward again and relaxed her grasp of Mrs. Randolph's arm. What had happened since she saw the water and sky a few minutes ago to make earth and sea and clouds one dizzy whirl of horror to her? She put both hands to her head and cried out loudly, I'm going mad! And the widow's reply was a peal of laughter that awoke echoes among the brown rocks. The laugh seemed to sober the poor girl, and she stared into Mrs. Randolph's face with parted lips and bated breath. I cannot help it, my dear. To hear you, the petted heiress of Professor Wilmot, talking about going mad, simply because you have taken it into your head that some secret is being withheld from you, is enough to make any one laugh. Though doubtless there are many who would have been greatly annoyed, fortunately, however, I am possessed of a tolerable temper and can afford to keep it in this instance. I beg your pardon, Mrs. Randolph, the poor girl said submissively. I am afraid I have been very foolish, but I must ask Papa about this. "'About what, dear? Oh, about your dear mother. Well, if you wish, of course, but do let me remind you that your papa is an old gentleman and accustomed to quiet. If you excite or annoy him, no one could answer for the consequences. If you insist on an explanation, pray, ask it from your friend, Dr. Bengerfield.' Carla could not speak. 
she only turned her face homeward, and began, totteringly, to make her way toward it. "'Stay,' said Mrs. Randolph emphatically. "'Before you go, Miss Wilmot, let me remind you that you have no right to injure me by repeating my name in this matter. If you promise to mention my name in no way, I will make your promise in return. Should your friend the doctor refuse to satisfy your lawful curiosity, come to me and I will tell you your mother's story. I will not say anything about you, Carla said weakly, and then she went away with a sort of blind instinct that led her home. Once or twice she met old residents of the place, who, when she passed with her hand pressed to her forehead, turned to look after her and shook their heads. They had always been afraid of something for the professor's beloved daughter. But what could they have been afraid of? Carla went into her father's study. He had just awakened from his nap, and was carefully examining Mrs. Randolph's sheet of copy, spectacles on nose. "'She does it pretty well, Charlie,' he observed, without noticing his daughter's white and rigid face. "'But not like you, my love. Are you going to help me before dinner?' "'My head aches so, Papa. I cannot. I'm going to lie down in the drawing-room for a little.' Professor Wilmot lifted his head and looked anxiously after her, and he dropped the manuscript to the ground as he rose and rang the bell. It was answered promptly by his own man, who stared at the unusually agitated face of his master. "'Smith, put on your hat and go down to Dr. Bengerfield yourself, instantly. Tell him to come up at once and say nothing to anyone else. Mind, the matter is pressing. Tell him I am not well.' Smith executed his errand carefully and promptly and before half an hour had passed, the doctor was walking rapidly toward his friends. He walked with an anxious face, which the circumstances did not seem to warrant, and he went straight into the study without knocking. The professor was sitting bolt upright in his chair, grasping its arms, and his feet were actually on the precious folio sheets that bore the fair widow's calligraphy. "'What is it?' the doctor asked quickly, as he looked around for Carla. "'Oh, John, it is that headache. I am so frightened.' I never saw Charlie looking more like her poor mother. What shall we do? What shall we do? Where is she? Dr. Bengerfield asked abruptly, while a deep furrow grew between his brown eyes. Lying down in the drawing-room. Don't tell her, John. Don't tell her. I'll tell her nothing. And do be calm, my friend. I do not believe there is anything whatever the matter with our Charlie but your cursed writing, and he kicked the papers fiercely with his departing feet. The helpless old man looked down at the papers, but he hadn't the heart to pick them up, and presently, when his spectacles followed, and lay there at his feet, he stared at them with tear-filling eyes, and wondered what they were. Carla lay in a great chair drawn near a window, overlooking the cliffs. Even in her reclining position, she could see the spot where Mrs. Randolph had seemed to drop a shroud round her, and shut out the sunlight and the sea and the sky. She could only think, she could not weep she could not pray she could only dream that it was night and that she was longing for morning the sight of dr bengerfield however recalled all she feared and all she determined to ask him a hot flush mounted to the blue-veined temple and then left them paler than before what is the matter charlie he asked softly as he seated himself beside her and took her hand gently is it this detestable headache again no yes my head does ache but it's not that. She sat up and looked him steadily in the eye, and, strange to say, John Bengerfield trembled at meeting the eyes in which he had never before seen anything but the sweetest gentleness and affection. My head aches, but not as it used to ache. Do you know anything that ought to make my heart ache, Dr. Bengerfield? The doctor got pale now, but he steadied his voice to reply. I am afraid your head is worse than you like to acknowledge, Carla, or you would not speak to me thus. "'What has come over you?' "'What indeed?' she echoed bitterly. "'But you need not ask. You know.' "'I? How should I know what riddle you are driving at me?' he returned with feigned anger. "'If you wish me to understand, you must condescend to explain. What have I done that you stare at me with such accusing eyes?' "'You have hidden a secret from me all my life that I should have known, that I had a right to know. What secret about my mother have you hidden from me, Dr. Bengerfield?' Now the doctor's face grew hot and aflame. He got up and walked hastily to and fro, as a man who was debating with himself what to do. Carla watched him as he paced up and down the long apartment, watched him with rigid lips and panting bosom. 
At last he sat down and spoke firmly. If your poor father had heard the words you have just spoken to me, Carla, I believe they would have killed him. I have not spoken them to him. I have spoken them to you. Are you going to reply? See, I believe you are driving me mad. And again she lifted her two hands to her head. Now every fibre of Dr. Bengerfield's frame trembled, and his voice was unsteady as he spoke. Listen to me, Carla. As you value your father's happiness and your own, and mine, he added after a pause, I will tell you all you wish to know when you have duly considered if it is right to ask me for that we have hidden from you entirely for your own good. I do not ask who hinted this to you, but I know it was some enemy, whom I shall discover and punish if it be in the power of man to do it. Can you not consider what trouble you may be bringing on yourself by your curiosity, and be reasonable for the sake of all who love you? It cannot be unreasonable for me to know what all the world knows, the poor girl persisted, and John Bengerfield groaned aloud. I cannot tell you anything now, Carla. For heaven's sake, wait until tomorrow. As her friend rose abruptly and left the room, Carla fell back in her chair, and her eyes once more wandered to the fatal cliff. Her whole nature seemed changed, while her sweet gentleness gone. She was conscious for the time of no love for her father, no affection for her friend. She only felt a fierce determination to find out the story of her mother, which had been hidden from her, and there she sat and planned, while the doctor returned to the anxious professor. I don't know what to make of it, my dear friend. Colour is excited and anxious, and I am afraid she has got some hint of her poor mother's story. She really knows nothing, however, and I shall see that your housekeeper administers a strong sedative in a cup of coffee ere I leave the house. In the meantime, take no notice and go on with your work. He stopped as he spoke and lifted the spectacles and the neglected sheets, and as he laid them on the table, the writing caught his eye. "'Whose is this?' he asked quickly. "'The widow's?' And the professor nodded. Such a sudden light flashed into the doctor's eyes as they devoured that paper, as would have astonished you, and the professor too, had he noticed that the sheet was crumpled into his friend's pocket. Promising to return during the evening, he gave his directions as to the sedative to Mrs. Staines, whom he could fully trust, and then he hastened home. Dr. Bengerfield's house was a bachelor one. He had only Mrs. Kempson and Pat Corcoran, the latter being groom and doctor's man generally. No sooner had our friend reached home than Pat was summoned to his master's presence. Pat was tall and Pat was thin, but Pat had sinews of iron and was the best wrestler in the district. "'Shut the door, Pat, and come here,' said the doctor, and Pat obeyed like a machine. "'Pat, you are clever enough for anything if you can only keep from the bottle. Now, I have a very particular piece of business for you. Do you think you can promise to withstand it for a couple of days?' "'If it's the bottle, your honour means, sure, you know I can. When did I ever lave the horse without his breakfast or his supper or his bed? Bottle or no bottle?' "'Yes, I know that's right.' but what I am going to give you to do would be ruined by a word, and you know a glass makes you talk. When I tell you that Miss Carla's happiness is concerned in it, I know you will try. Indeed, no, I will, Martha. Try me. You know that Mrs. Randolph at Rose Cottage? Yes, sir. Well, I want you to watch her for a couple of days, and nights too. Find out where she goes and who she sees. Whatever you see or hear, let me know instantly. Yes, sir. Did you ever see her servant, sir? no why because she's the queerest old hag i ever seen sir she wears a black gown and a cap for all the world like none sir and her face is whiter than a chalk well never mind pat but attend to what i told you you need not mind about your duties here i shall get jack to come and do them for a day all right sir and pat scraped himself out Dr. Bungerfield sat long with that page of manuscript he had appropriated from the professor on the table before him. Some other documents he had taken from his desk, and with an elbow on either side of them, and his head supported on his hands, he studiously compared them. It was a fine head, the doctor's, broad and massive, and with a great crop of brown hair upon it, and there was the strength of a firm will in the square jaw. But there was an unusual vacillation just then in his face, and a great cloud on his bent brow. It is the same. There is no doubt of it, he said. The same, though changed. Oh, what a fool I have been. What a fool. And how blind. 
he got up and put away the papers and then in his old way when puzzled or annoyed paced the chamber to and fro paced it with an unsteady step and muttered words of little meaning save to himself some of them followed his thoughts to carla some to her father others to whom did they go with fierce anathemas under his breath poor charlie poor child what a blow for her yet can i keep it from her see how a man's folly hunts him down if my poor old friend had only taken my advice long ago perdition seize that vile woman evening fell and while its shades were lying low upon the misty sea the doctor returned to wilmot villa the professor sat again in his wonted seat to which he had returned after dinner he was glad to see his friend carla was much better she had taken a little dinner and retired to her own room she said her headache had quite gone and the professor thought his friend john had been mistaken in charlie's having guessed or heard anything she seemed quite cheerful and the fond father was jubilant retired to her own room who then was this wrapped in a mantle and with a hood falling over her white face that stole in the great evening toward the fatal cliff was it to inhale the sea air or let the cool night air play upon her burning forehead that poor charlie crept to the grassy brink of the cliff and looked down shudderingly to the treacherous waves below ah no her destination was rose cottage but an irresistible fascination seemed to draw her to the dreadful place though she dreaded and feared it beyond all earthly things it was with the very effort of desperation that she at last dragged herself from the spot and with a wild scream of the seagull in her ears fled towards rose cottage with the perfect rest of an amiable heart and immaculate conscience mrs randolph reclined in a deep chair drawn near a pleasant coal fire in the grate of her little parlour her cap was white and its broad weepers floated gracefully over her shoulders a shaded lamp stood on the pretty table behind her and her petite figure was the picture of rest and comfort but appearances are deceitful as we know and the widow was at that instant in a most uncomfortable state of mind she was all ears and anxiety listening so that the sound of a rising wind that moaned through the roses aggravated her as it impeded some other expected sound was this it a light quick step on the veranda and a timid knock at the door in an instant mrs randolph was on her feet and at the open door pray come in miss wilmot i have been expecting you expecting me the poor girl said as she followed the widow inside and almost fell into the seat offered her the hood fell back from the pale face and she sat and gazed with wild yet weary looking eyes at her hostess oh i knew you would come the widow cried with a laugh i was certain you could not resist the fascination of a private interview with your dear friend do not mock me poor carla said i am very unhappy mock you i how can you be so cruel as to hint at such a possibility but of course i knew our dear friend dr bengerfield would not give you the desired information and that you would certainly come to me for it you see i was right no he would not tell me but what he did say has only rendered me more anxious to know the worst i could not rest i could not sleep until i came did you visit the cliff on your way the widow inquired with apparent irrelevancy yes how did you know that i could not help going there no you could not help it my love mrs randolph said as she raised a fan between herself and the fire and stretched out her pretty feet on the fender and she shook her head with a strange smile as she spoke what do you mean oh mrs randolph you do not surely wish to torture me tell me all you know though it should kill me i am but a poor girl and you are no doubt a clever woman but what harm could i ever have done that you should so torture me carla clasped her hands as she spoke and bent forward to look pleadingly in the widow's face and she laughed the same laugh which had horrified poor charlie on the cliff harm to me my dear how could you but see i shall tell you the story you long to hear and then you will be at rest eh carla's breath came fast did you know my mother mrs randolph do not ask too many questions my love it might be dangerous but before i proceed tell me did you keep your promise did you mention my name to dr bengerfield no he knows nothing another question miss wilmot 
Do you know where and how your dear mother died? Here, of course, in the house where we now live. At least I have always understood so. You have been mistaken, as you will hear. Certainly, the last days of the first Mrs. Wilmot were passed under the same roof which shelters you, though she did not die there peacefully as she ought to have done. The first Mrs. Wilmot? Oh, Mrs. Randolph, you're mistaken. It is all a terrible mistake. My father was not married twice. He really was, my love, and the second time to a most charming woman, one of the sweetest and dearest creatures it has been my lot to meet in life. And here again the mocking laugh rose and tortured poor Carla's ears. How they have misled and deceived you, my child, and how very cruel it was of them. What could have been your dear papa's and the amiable doctor's motive for hiding even the existence of your stepmother from you? Existence! It is not polite to repeat words so, my love. Yes, I said existence, for that amiable stepmother of yours still lives, and is, I hope and trust, enjoying herself as well as I am at this moment. Carla fell back helplessly in her seat and gazed at Mrs. Randolph wonderingly. Was it possible, she thought, that this lady was mad? Did this account for her terrible words and strange laugh? And Mrs. Randolph read the thought in the innocent young eyes, and replied to it with a smile that was half a sneer. No, my dear, I am not mad. Madness is entirely in the family, but not, thank heaven, on my side. But I beg of you to let me tell you this story, and have done with it. It is getting late, and they may miss you at home. Do you know, my love, that sitting there with your white face and wild eyes, you remind me strangely of your dear mother? She had such wild eyes. Oh, you did know her. You have seen dear mamma after all. So you have discovered my secret after all, eh? Well, let it pass. It does not matter now, Mrs. Randolph returned with her disagreeable smile. Yes, my love, I did know her. She was about your age when I first saw her and she had the prettiest little baby on her knee, a little girl baby with blue eyes and fair sunny hair. I? Was it I, Mrs. Randolph? Carla asked with absorbing interest. Yes, my dear, it was really you. Well, to go on. Your poor mamma, beautiful as she was, not to flatter you by implication, my love, your poor mamma was afflicted with a dreadful disease that rendered the greatest care necessary and a young and pretty woman was engaged to devote all her time to the young wife. Well, my dear, I am sorry to say that in spite of all the care and watchfulness, your dear mother died, and your dear papa rewarded the nurse's devoted attention by making her his wife a few months after. Carla flushed and half rose from her seat, but controlled herself with an effort. Was this the secret they kept from me, Mrs. Randolph, that I had a stepmother? No, my dear. It was only one of the secrets. There were one or two more. Your mother's terrible malady was one, and its still more shocking results was another. What was it? What was the malady that makes you look at me in that awful way? Speak, or I shall go mad. Ah, just so, dear Miss Wilmot. That is why you remind me so much of your beloved but unhappy parent. See now how your eyes flash and your hands fly to your head. Your mother was mad, my love, and you are mad too. It is grievous, but very true. Carla rose and the mantle fell to her feet, and Mrs. Randolph rose too and faced her. In the young face was a terror and a horror beyond words. In the elder, a mocking, fiendish triumph, sickening to witness. Carla's hands were, indeed, gripping her temples, and her face was white as cut stone. I have told you two of the secrets, my dear child. Let me conclude with the third. Your poor dear Ma did not die in her home, for the very simple reason that one night, a night such as this it was, with a lonely cold wind sounding on the sea, she escaped from her keeper and threw herself over the very cliff you are so fond of haunting, my dear. Yes, she preferred the embraces of the cold sea to the knowledge of her own madness, and very sensible it was of her, don't you think so, Carla, dear? Madness is so terrible a thing. Such a shriek filled that room and rang out into the night, as few lips have omitted, as Carla turned and fled, 
out of the cottage and away with the speed of despair on the cliff road homeward or where mrs randolph uttered an exclamation of joy and ran to the door to look after the flying form of the distracted girl from the veranda she could just catch a glimpse of her slight figure in the starlight as she neared a turn of the road but to the widow's astonishment she saw a darker form speeding after the poor child with a speed that promised to overtake her soon who could this person be mrs randolph asked herself it looked like a man who was it possible might have overheard all or part of what had passed between her and miss wilmot the idea made the widow very uneasy and as she turned to shut the door she spoke sharply to her servant who was standing so close to the door of the parlour as to suggest the idea of another spy no wonder the strange appearance of mrs randolph's servant had attracted the notice of pat corcoran as her mistress turned suddenly and as it were caught her watching or listening she was standing like an image of galvanized death in an angle of the passage her face was of an unearthly pallor her hollow eyes strangely lurid her dress of black made without fold or pleat clung to her rigid angular figure a borderless white linen cap was on her head a white apron before her and a large white collar that was almost a cape lay upon her shoulders you would have thought her dead only that her eyes gleamed so and her fingers worked nervously as mrs randolph scolded her what are you doing here barton did i not give you strict orders to keep to your own premises this evening if i thought you presumed to watch or listen i should discharge you on the spot there are no candles the woman said like an automaton i must go to the store you shall do nothing of the kind i am going out myself and do not choose the cottage to be left as you have been so neglectful as to forget providing yourself with candles until this time in the evening you can go without light the woman moved towards the kitchen without a word of reply and mrs randolph stepped into her bedroom to prepare for her late walk it was not far by a cross path to wilmot villa but after her interview with carla was it likely the widow would venture thither ah few were aware of what that fair dame was capable on leaving his master pat corcoran made his preparations for keeping watch on rose cottage they were not many he simply put on a big muffler filled his pipe and stuck a whole fresh plug of tobacco in his pocket he would gladly have increased those preparations and looked longingly at a small tin flask that lay in the corner of an empty manger in the stable and shook his head discontentedly sorra harm a small taste of whisky would have done a poor chap agin them cork cliffs but i promised the master and it's for miss carla and so the honest fellow turned his face resolutely away from the manger and started for rose cottage it was not difficult to keep an undetected watch on that simple little place for the back fence was broken down in many places though the gaps were hidden by a great tangle of rose hedge the place was so small that the little kitchen was almost close to the hedge and there was not twenty yards between the hedge and the cliff pat amused himself by watching the movements of the strange servant for a long time as he hid in the hedge taking an occasional whiff of his pipe as he dared her unearthly appearance deeply touched the inherent superstition of his uncultivated irish nature the immobility of her white face the machine-like steadiness of her movements fascinated his eyes until a hundred memories of his native land made the sweat pour from his face was she a banshee or a witch would she presently dart the evil eye at him and wither a limb he would have given up whisky for a month to have fled home to safety in the doctor's stable but he daren't disobey a good master and get laughed at for his foolish fears how glad he was when it grew dusk and he could raise himself from his cramped position and venture to the front of the house without fear of being observed then it was that he almost met face to face miss wilmot on her way to see mrs randolph and learn the secret it was better that she had never known and then it was that knowing his master's deep interest in the young lady he got as near the veranda as he could so as to hear the sound of sneering and pleading voices both of which he recognised but when that fearful scream saluted his ears the front door opened so quickly that to avoid being detected pat had to make so sudden a retrograde movement that he fell flat on his back and lost some precious seconds ere he gained his feet again and ran after the young lady something was wrong he knew for there was fear and agony in the sound of that scream 
and unless under the influence of great excitement, Miss Carla would never rush in that undignified manner along the road. So the faithful fellow followed hard after, determined to keep her in sight till she reached home. Onward sped the half-maddened girl, with but one idea left, that she was the daughter of a madwoman who had thrown herself from the cliff. Insane blood was boiling in her veins. She knew it. She felt it. What would be better than that she should follow her mother and hide her secret over the cliff? Mad! Oh, God, have mercy upon her, for the world would have none. They would put her in some dreadful place with a horrible keeper, like Mrs. Randolph, to watch every movement of her growing insanity. She could not endure it. Death were a hundred times more preferable. Toward the fatal spot where her mother had died ran poor Carla, and the horrified Pat, who had expected nothing so awful as this, saw her nearing the cliff, and, hastening his own flying feet, seized her just as her intention was only too apparent. "'In the name of merciful mother, is it mad ye are, Miss Carla?' he cried. "'Yes, mad,' she said, as she turned a white, terrified face toward Pat, and then she fainted in his arms. "'Oh, Begora, what'll I do now?' Pat cried aloud. "'Here's poor Miss Carla, dead entirely, and the devil a soul here. "'If I take her home, it'll kill the old professor. "'Faith, I'll take her to the martyr, for it's himself that knows best what to do for her.' And so, raising Carla gently in his arms, he carried her to the horrified doctor, who was just preparing to start for Wilmot Villa, to see that the girl was still comfortably asleep under the influence of the opiate he fancied she had taken. Judge then of his dismay when her unconscious form was laid on his sofa by the voluble Pat Corcoran, from whose explanation he soon guessed that Carla had been to the vindictive woman of Rose Cottage and learned the secret her friends had judiciously hidden from her. Of course, his first efforts were towards Carla's restoration to consciousness, which he soon effected with the assistance of the old housekeeper, and then, when she had been placed in an easy chair and they were alone, she turned her weary eyes to his grieved face and asked, "'What is the matter with me, doctor?' John Bengerfield saw that the time was past for concealment, and he took the weak, trembling little hand in his own as if it had been a child's. "'My dear Carla,' you have been doing very wrong you have been visiting a vile woman who has told you a lot of lies oh i remember i am mad and the disengaged hand flew to her poor head you are nothing of the sort you are as sane as i am and if you should ever become mad it will be because you will not listen to those who love you was it not true then was my mother not mad and did she not throw herself over the cliff so far my dear charlie i am sorry to say she told you the truth the doctor gravely replied and it runs in the blood oh doctor you know it does now will you be calm charlie and listen to me your poor mother's insanity proceeded from an injury to her head after you were born so you could not possibly inherit it you know how nervous your father is because your mother was nursing you when her brain gave way he has always had an anxious fear for your health I must tell you all about it now, Charlie, though it is a painful subject indeed. Since that wretched being has wreaked her revenge on you, everything must be laid bare to counteract the effect of her lies. What revenge? she asked wonderingly. Don't you guess who she is, Charlie? I did since I saw her writing last night. Eighteen years have changed her, and she is disguised. But she is Louisa Carnaby, your poor father's second wife. "'Oh!' cried poor Carla, as she hid her eyes with her hands. "'The professor did a very foolish thing when he married that woman,' the doctor went on. "'But as he did it for your sake, you must not be hard on him in your thoughts.' The creature managed to persuade the professor that people were talking about her remaining in his house after your mother's unfortunate end, and as she had succeeded in attaching your baby self to her, with her own end in view, to prevent you from losing a favourite nurse, he was inveigled into a private marriage. A few months after that marriage, she was expelled from your father's house by me. How? With deep interest in her young, pale face. She was vile in every way, and I knew it. She was extravagant, and led our poor professor the life of a slave. At last I discovered that she had forged my name to a large cheque, and I made her disappearance for ever from Wilmot Villa, the price of her immunity from punishment. 
if she had dreamed that I should have recognised her, she would never have ventured here, but before twelve hours are over her head, she shall meet the punishment she deserves. Now, Charlie dear, the old woman will give you some wraps, and I shall drive you home. Just think of the consternation should your absence be discovered. Mrs. Randolph made a good many odd preparations ere she started on her excursion. One might think she contemplated a journey on the early morrow. Already had some trunks been packed, and now her toilet apparatus was consigned to a handbag, and a travelling dress and wraps laid ready at hand. Certainly a boat touched at the pier early on the morning of the following day, but if Mrs. Randolph hoped to sail with her, how dreadfully different was her fate. Professor Wilmot sat at his precious manuscript. He was preparing notes for the compilation of the seventy-fifth chapter of his great work, and was serenely happy. Charlie was, as he believed, slipping away her headache, and Dr. Bengerfield was coming to spend the evening with him, and do a few sheets of copying for him. All this was immensely pleasant. Judge, then, of the poor man's consternation when the door opened softly, and Mrs. Randolph entered the room. Now the poor man was the most amiable of beings, save where his great work was concerned, and although he disliked this woman instinctively, he gave no hint of such a feeling, since his Charlie had taken a fancy to her. In her presence he felt a chill, as if a cold wind from the sea were blowing into his veins, and the glitter of the widow's eyes through her spectacles was to him odious as the gleam of a serpent's eyes. He would rather have seen any one in the whole world than Mrs. Randolph that night, yet there she stood with the door shut behind her. The widow advanced glidingly to a chair, and seated herself almost close to the professor, so that the rays of the lamps fell full upon her face. "'You did not expect a visit from me this evening, my dear professor,' she said, in such an odd manner that he looked at her steadily over his spectacles, ere he replied, "'No, madam, I did not. But I presume you have heard of my dear child's slight indisposition, and have kindly called to see her.' She laughed in his face, throwing up her chin as she did so, in a manner so familiar that the old gentleman shuddered. He glanced at the door helplessly, looking for the entrance of some relief, and he grasped the seat of his chair as though to rise, and Mrs. Randolph repeated the laugh. "'I see you are beginning to open your eyes, my dear Carl. Where have they been all this time that you have not recognised your wife?' Slowly she took off the gold-rimmed spectacles, and put them in her pocket, as she went on. "'I am changed, I know, at least to the eye, but I assure you I am the very same at heart. Let me see. It is somewhere about eighteen years ago since you permitted your dear friend John to turn me out of this very room, and out of the house which was my home by right. You did not even settle a poor sum on me to keep me from the bitterness of poverty.' but with a few pounds in my hand, turned me out on the world for a simple indiscretion. Your friend, John Bangerfield, was indeed good enough to say that my talents were a fortune in themselves. Well, they did not bring me much, but they have brought me to my revenge on you and yours at last, Carlo Wilmot. Revenge! the professor gasped, staring at the author of his years ago trouble with a horror that seemed reflected in the spectacles that rested on his sharp nose. Yes, revenge. I have waited years for it, that the blow might strike harder. You idolise this soft-headed girl of yours, Carlo Wilmot. She is, next to your great work, the object of your dearest affections. Do you know where she is now? Do you know what I have done? I have told her the story of her mother's madness and death, and she has followed her over the deep cliff, your darling is being dashed about the waters of the bay for the sharks to eat, and I should like to see them doing it. With a gasping groan, the professor staggered to his feet. The poor old man's face grew ghastly as death, and his weak knees trembled beneath him. What he would have said or done, it is hard to say, but at that moment a strong hand was laid upon his shoulder, and John Bengerfield stood face to face with the triumphant woman. Do not believe her, my dear old friend. She lies as she has always done. Our Charlie is safe in the drawing-room, and you shall see her in an instant, when I have relieved you of this fiend's presence. Go, he cried, to the now doubtful woman, as he pointed toward the door, while his face was ablaze with passion. Go, it is night and dark, but I warn you that daylight will find you in prison. Let her go, John, 
the old professor said as he fell back into his chair let her go for i see death in her face and the lord himself will punish her something in the professor's prophetic words fell upon the woman's heart like a touch of ice with a look of fiendish malice she turned to the door and went out within there was warmth and comfort the pleasant lamplight the glowing fire without the bleak wind was growing loud and damp over the moaning sea and voices met her as she passed the fatal cliff unearthly voices of dreadful meaning they were what could they be saying had her life been all a failure then had it passed as a dream to end in darkness and death was crime hidden in every recess of her wicked life was it true that a day of terror would come when the past would meet her face to face and she should not be able to turn away from it bah away with those morbid fancies she had been balked of her revenge but her heart was iron still a light burned in the parlour of the cottage as she regained her home and the woman barton opened the door to her knock mrs randolph went in without a word and the woman followed her to the light rigid as ever but with a fierce light in her sunken eyes barton stood and glared at her now nervous mistress as she tossed her bonnet and shawl to the floor and then turned angrily toward her what do you want woman what do you stand staring there for have you got no light yet i want no light for the work i have to do was the stern reply nor do you there is no light in the grave coming as these unexpected words did so close upon the professors and upon the weird voices that had followed her on the wild sea winds homeward this awful hint staggered the woman's shaken nerves and she was speechless nor did barton's movements reassure her the woman was drawing the odd-looking cap from her head and shaking her long hair over her shoulders now do you know me louisa carnaby yes louisa carnaby knew her now and with a shriek of terror she shrank back from the resuscitated madwoman yes it is i you all thought me dead eh well i did not die when i threw myself over the cliff heaven floated me against a returning fishing boat and i was placed on a passing and outward bound vessel i had forgotten who i was and where i came from my own name was a forgotten sound to me i never knew it until to-night louisa carnaby when i heard your communication to my daughter yes you need not stare at me for your doom is sealed it was not for nothing that you told my carla her mother was mad i was ten years in a madhouse at kaleo and heaven directed me here to kill you with the bound of a tiger the speaker was on the terror-stricken woman with her long hair streaming wildly around her and the fierce flush of insanity in her eyes the mad woman seized her victim what chance had the unfortunate woman against the awful strength of that little bony form there were muffled screams and awful words but the wind blew them away seaward and they were lost in oblivion in accordance with the doctor's repeated instructions tom corcoran returned to watch rose cottage after he had driven carla home but alas for the vanity of human promises he did not return without that tin flask in the manger he was cold and truth to say hungry and it was very hard lines to stop two hours on that cold cliff without a taste of whisky to keep the cold out so he tasted until the flask of whisky was empty and then he fell asleep under the rose hedge near mrs randolph's cottage he never knew what aroused him but he did awake with a horror of he knew not what hanging around him with a bound he was on his feet in the strong wind that now blew in from seaward without waiting to think he started homeward making the best of his way along the cliffs up the face of the rocks a phosphorant gleam illumined the darkness it came from the breaking foam of the great rolling waves at the foot of the cliff as tom reached the spot where he had seized poor carla he saw two forms struggling on the verge and at last a scream that sounded like the despairing cry of a lost spirit to the last day of his death he believed he had seen an apparition mrs randolph was seen no more at rose cottage and the doctor concluded she had flown from his threatened arrest the landlord seized her effects for rent and no more was ever heard of the fascinating widow was it not well that to the day of her death poor tried charlie never knew the real termination of her mother's career wilmot cottage knows the professor no more and dr bengerfield practises in a faraway district strange to say he has got a fair wife now whom he calls charlie and an old gentleman in a velvet skull-cap and spectacles 
sits in the study and composes a yet unfinished but great work entitled The Cosmical Structure of Plumo's Life. End of story. Section 7 of Stories from the Detectives Album by Waif Wanda, also known as Mary Fortune. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsty. The Bell of Mount Battery. One of the darkest nights of late autumn had closed around the shadowy skirt of Mount Battery, and muttering thunder growls in the clouded west told of a coming storm. It was barely eight o'clock but the darkness was almost inky under the mount between the heavy shadow of the timber and the storm-curtained sky, and there was not a sign of life visible from Mount Battery to Corumba. Nevertheless, there was life not far off, in the very heart of the mountain, as it were, and at such an elevation above the surrounding heavily timbered country that it was visible in the daylight as an outspread map beneath them. Four men occupied a cave-like apartment, which was, on the night I introduced its occupants, cheerful with light and warmth these four men were a band of bushrangers long known in new south wales as tempest's gang and under their own chosen soubriquets of tempest rain snow and sunshine tempest was the leader a tall dark man of thirty-eight or nine with bent brows and a stern expression of countenance he sat at the rude table with some papers spread before him on it and the huge shaded lamp drawn close to them so that the shadow rested on his face the light on the papers. One slender but sinewy hand rested on the documents, the other on his knee, and on the latter was a slender gold ring that was almost hidden in the brown finger it encircled. At the great fire which burned in an angle of the rookie cave, two others of the gang were seated. One, a rosy-faced, smiling youth of less than twenty, with curling chestnut hair and sunny blue eyes, was busy cleaning a bright-barrelled fowling piece. As he worked, he sang or whistled snatches of songs and break-down dances, and his very feet seemed anxious to keep time to the music of his own laughing lips. The dress of this young man was of a very dandyish complexion. His riding boots fitted a small foot like wax, his breeches were white as snow, his Crimean shirt was of the finest texture, the loose collar falling over a carelessly tied and brilliantly coloured necktie. This was sunshine and he carried the light of his name in his young heart and on his rosy, laughing lips. The other man, who enjoyed the warmth and the blazing and cracking fire, was Snow, a quiet-looking man of twenty-eight, with his hat low over his forehead, and a face under its shadow inscrutable, not to say stony, in its expressionless calm. It was a handsome face, too, with dark eyes lighting it up, and a heavy moustache and beard shading it, but it was rarely that Snow let any one see how large and bright and intelligent his dark eyes were, and, as for talking, the almost continual pipe in his mouth was a ready excuse against an indulgence he rarely permitted himself. Rain was tall and slender and fair, the very youngest of the gang. He could not have been more than sixteen years. The lad looked sensitive and depressed, and, I might add, in such a delicate state of health that it was no wonder he had, from the first, chosen the place of cook and hut-keeper to the band, instead of a more active place in the exploits of his mates. Many days and hours he spent alone in the mountain cave, or wandering about the almost inaccessible upper heights of Mount Battery. Once, when volatile sunshine came on him suddenly as he was standing on a rock and looking toward the distant hills of Quarumba, he saw tears in the boy's eyes, and there and then christened him rain to complete the quartet headed by their leader, Tempest. This youth was busily engaged in putting away the supper dishes on the evening in question, but he did it with the languid air habitual to him. All at once Tempest lifted his head and looked toward the others. "'Boys, I have something very particular to say to you tonight. Will you all come and sit down at the table?' Sunshine jumped to his feet, and with his big eyes open wide in surprise and expectation, hastened to the table and sat down opposite his leader. "'It's the Corumba coach! I know it is!' he cried. "'Hurry, Tempest, or we'll be late. It's such a glorious night for it, too. Hark to the thunder!' Rain turned and looked toward Tempest half fearfully, yet doubting if he was included in the request of the leader. But Tempest beckoned to him and pointed to a seat close beside his own. 
so the youth moved silently and listlessly and sat down in the indicated seat snow coolly and silently knocked the ashes from his pipe put it in his pocket and with deliberation walked toward the table to complete the number four tempest shook his head at sunshine's suggestion and a faint smile gleamed in his swarthy face for a moment sunshine was notably the leader's favourite and could take greater liberties with him than any other member of the band would have ventured on you are wrong sunshine my business to-night is of a very different nature and then he ceased to speak for a little rain sat and stared dreamily at tempest snow crossed his arms on the table before him and looked down on the strong hands beneath his eyes i have been living ten years under mount battery tempest went on and it seems to me scarce so many months has the time appeared long to you rain rain flushed up and again grew pale as he stammered so long that i have a thousand times in every year wished i was dead a fierce gleam burned for an instant in tempest's eyes and a sneer curled his lips and you sunshine how has time sped with you oh jolly sometimes you know i long for the sea and a ship again but when we make a raid i enjoy it so much that i forget everything else but you know tempest we have been here barely three years yes i know it it seems but yesterday since i met you in snow nearly barefooted and very hungry tramping you knew not where when i offered you shelter and employment you accepted both have you regretted it snow bitterly replied the man called snow and he spoke calmly without raising his eyes but having accepted your offer i have tried to do my duty by the gang and you have done it tempest replied warmly i think i have but now that the subject is fairly opened up between us i will say something i fully intended to say before many days elapsed i am tired of this life tempest and want to give it up from something you said months ago i guessed as much the leader answered as snow lifted his calm eyes and fixed them steadily on his and to-night is the result of that guess boys it is my wish to break up the band sunshine dropped the fowling piece he still held in both hands to the table and started to his feet with an exclamation and then he sat down again and stared at snow who was about to speak i am glad to hear it was his reply to tempest we have been faithful to each other as outlaws we can be faithful to each other as free men tempest compressed his lips for only an instant something in the words did not please him i can trust you all he replied but his eyes fell unpleasantly on rain whose eyes were fixed upon him and whose lips were trembling like a girl's i have only one request to make that is that you keep the secret of our hiding place in vain the police have attempted to track us to our citadel in mount battery it is unknown to all save ourselves i may return here alone boys if the world i have left again turned its back upon me as it did once before i shall go back to sea snow said quietly i did wrong when i left my ship and still worse when i enticed this lad with me the speaker turned and laid his hard hand on sunshine's soft beringed fingers what an accusation his dead mother could make against me this day what could his living father say of his degraded name no one knows my name sunshine said warmly yet with a blush or yours or tempests or rains we do not know even each other's names but what harm if everybody did we have done no murder and no man or woman wrong we have stuck up escorts and mails eh well what about governments if they behaved as they ought to do there would be no bush rangers snow shook his head again at the illogical pleading but remained silent sunshine said tempest gazing with softened eyes at the youthful bushranger we are all pretty well off but my share is the greatest of our gains i shall be alone in the world will you cast your lot with mine and be a son to me in some other land than this i have a father of my own the youth replied in a low hesitating tone while his young face grew pale with emotion i shall go with snow he will tell me what to do snow grasped sunshine's hand and pressed it warmly ay lad the sight of thy face will make one old english home glad as heaven and he rose to his feet stay cried tempest turning angrily from sunshine we have yet to divide our stock and ascertain the intentions of our fourth member as far as i am concerned there will be no division of spoil snow returned firmly i will take as much as will ship me safely 
no more you may do with my share what you please and i think sunshine will say the same what for cried the boy haven't we earned it lawfully and then the youth laughed merrily at his own words never mind snow i don't want the money if you think it would bring no luck and he also rose to his feet you have found consciences at a late hour tempest said with sarcastic emphasis but be that as you will rain what shall you do when the gang is broken up you are too young to take the world on your own shoulders will you come with me as sunshine has refused yes if you will take me home the lad cried wildly as he got up from his stool and looked unflinchingly in tempest's face take you home how should i know where your home is boy i have told you often that i found you ten years ago sitting on the road between the mount and Corumba, and you said the coach had left you yes you told me all that but you told me a lie the boy said with such a strange fierceness for him that both snow and sunshine stared wonderingly at him i was only six years old when you brought me here but i remember more than you think and if you do not tell me where my home is i shall find it in spite of you do you think i do not remember my mother and a sister whom you remember too a pale rage grew stony in tempest's face and it was then when his lips were drawn back from his white teeth and his eyes flashed fire that you recognized the fierce untamable nature of the man ungrateful lying cur that you are he cried if i struck you dead at my feet you would only get your deserts for ten years you have lived in clover and from the proceeds of a danger you dared not share and now you turn on me with a lie on your lips to repay me it is no lie and you know it you know my home and you have had your own bad reasons for keeping me hidden here all these years keep your hands off me there is blood on them if a visitant from the grave had stood in the lad's place and looked at the leader of the gang with accusing eyes flashing from skeleton orbits tempest could not have drawn back with more unfeigned horror it was but momentary however as an intenser anger than before usurped its place with an accession of blood to his hot forehead he made a stride toward the young man whose face was pale as death and would have struck him to the ground had snow not quickly placed himself between them not while i am here tempest snow said quietly we are about to part let it be in peace besides a man would be ashamed to lift his arm against a weak boy like him tempest glared at the speaker for a moment as though he meditated letting the blow fall on him then with a muttered oath he turned suddenly and disappeared behind a curtain of sacking in the side of the cave it was his own sleeping place and when he emerged from it the bush ranger carried a heavy bag in his hand placing this upon the table he untied the string and its mouth with trembling fingers and emptied the gold contents upon the table the youth known as rain stood and watched the glittering coin like one entranced snow turned to the fire again while sunshine followed him to lean his back against the wall carefully and watch at a distance the movements of the leader tempest was dealing the sovereigns out as though they had been cards and as he added one and one to each four little golden heaps grew momentarily larger on the rough board there he said sternly as he rose and tossed the canvas bag to the floor there is every man's share duly counted he who doubts it can count for himself this is mine and this mine cried the lad rain as he swept the nearest heap to him from the table into his coat pocket if i did not earn it in the saddle i did it in suffering and every shilling of it will help me to find out my own home and your secret bushranger tempest what the leader would have said or done under this fresh attack from the excited youth it is impossible now to say for at that moment broke upon their startled ears the great boom of an iron bell it sounded so close to them that the rocky walls of the cave reverberated to its heavy toll yet it was heard and had often been heard before for many miles around the skirts of mount battery as suddenly as it had tolled it ceased tempest turned toward the sound and listened while sunshine darted to a small opening in the rock and drawing back a shutter looked out as he did so another sound penetrated the cave the sound of the low muttering thunder of a rising storm it is dark as pitch the boy said whoever can it be on such a night as this some one who knows the mount well surely shall i go down tempest no i will go myself the leader replied as he lit the candle and a lantern and went up a sort of rude staircase in the rock at a corner of the cave 
he soon disappeared behind the stonework and the others sat down and resumed their usual occupations tempest emerged into the open air on a rocky plateau some hundreds of feet above the level of corumba and he was met by wild blasts of wind that carried sharp cold rain into his face and nearly succeeded in extinguishing his light having secured his lantern under his coat however he descended by a tortuous and impeded path which ten years had made as familiar to him in darkness as in light and in a few moments stood at a sheer face of rock where a dark shrouded figure was dimly visible against the lighter coloured face of the rock who is it the bushranger asked as he threw the light of his lantern on the silent figure good heavens marjorie is this you yes said the woman you told me to come and i have come but how in the storm and darkness how did you find the bell of mount battery hark he added as a fresh blast and a peal of thunder seemed to shake the rocks it was madness for you to come here such a night as this what is it marjorie it must be something pressing what is it you told me your secret ten years ago ralph the woman said sadly and i promised to come when anything particular took place in one home how often have i been here she asked five times tempest replied anxiously yes five times once when he died ralph again when the news came over the sea and three times to warn you of treachery i have come the sixth time to-night to tell you that she is dying and is asking for you day and night for me ay for you the dying see clear she knows i could summon you though no mortal lips have told her in the flickering wind-blown light the face of tempest gleamed white as the face of a stricken man for a second he clutched his brow with one convulsive hand and leaned against the damp rock then he took the woman's hand and spoke you cannot go back alone you must wait for me i will go back with you come follow me you cannot stay here in the storm but your mates they will not mind we are about to disband thank god the woman muttered with fervency as she allowed him to lead her up the path he had just descended in a short space of time they stood in the cave and the three occupants of that subterraneous dwelling were staring at her wonderingly this is my foster mother tempest said addressing the others you may trust her she has known of my calling and the bell for ten years and would not harm me if her own life was the forfeit no she echoed though i would have given my life twice over to have saved the babe i nursed at my breast from leading as a man such a life as this tush cried tempest angrily move away from the fire boys and let her sit down while i get ready i must go down to quarumba with her the woman sat down and let her shawl drop from her grey head she was a woman of about fifty strong-looking and stern-faced with thin close-pressed lips and dark deep-set eyes she was comfortably attired and the raindrops on her thick shawl glimmered in the lamplight as she sat her eyes wandered to and fro curiously and first rested on the happy-looking face of young sunshine who with natural politeness had resumed the cleaning of his gun to avoid the appearance of watching the stranger not so rain he was at the opposite side of the fireplace and did not move when tempest spoke his face was half in shade and half in light the fire gleaming up at times and brightening the pale young countenance with unnatural warmth his eyes were fixed on the woman tempest had called marjorie fixed with an intensity of puzzled thought on the worn face surrounded with the plain cap border that rested on the plain bands of the woman's grey locks as rain gazed thus marjorie's eyes met his and the woman started as though she had been struck her dark orbs gleamed like lamps and her fingers clutched her shawl one quick look she cast toward the place where the leader of the gang had disappeared and then her hand slipped from her pocket a bit of paper why do you look at me so the boy whispered eagerly as he bent his pale face near her do you know me if you are he whom i think you are she answered in a low tone the lord of heaven be praised how long have you known tempest ten years hush here he comes we shall soon meet again and she thrust the paper into the boy's ready fingers the paper was only an envelope with marjorie cotton the lodge corumba written upon it and was evidently the discarded cover of an old letter when the storm broke that night on corumba a light in the drawing-room window of the lodge struggled out into the darkness through the interstices of the warm crimson curtains that fell over it 
Inside was every luxury in the shape of furniture, and there were two living inmates of the room. On a couch, drawn near the fire, was a young lady, so fair and fragile and helpless-looking, that it scarcely needed her many pillows and wraps and recumbent posture to tell of her invalided state. Her hair was black, and waving loosely over her broad forehead, made a strong contrast with the pallid hue of a most perfect countenance, and the eyes, that shone with an almost unearthly brightness, were so deeply sunk in the blue-circled orbit, that one could easily tell how long had been the illness which had thus brought Ina Vivian to the very border of the grave. Close to her, and opposite, so that she could gaze in the dying girl's face, sat a lady already in the deepest mourning, and with a close widow's cap over grey bands of hair. She was white, almost as the invalid, and a stern sorrow had settled in her worn face. Her eyes remained fixed on her child's face, but they were dry. Tears were an almost forgotten luxury to Mrs. Vivian. "'Hark to the thunder, mother! Oh, I wonder where he will lay his outlawed head this wild night,' Ina said as she laid her thin hand on her mother's. "'That she should still grieve for that ingrate,' cried the unhappy mother with bitterness that his sins against us and the roof that sheltered him from infancy should not have turned your thoughts as well as your heart from him in this supreme moment of sorrow for me. If he had been innocent, I might have forgotten him, mother. But what could I do save pray for the guilty all those sad, sad years? Hark! There is the bell of Mount Battery. What can it be, mother? What can it mean? She rose weakly on her elbow and turned toward the window to listen. The deep boom of the mountain bell, as it rang to Marjorie's touch on her visit to Tempest, was floating in on the growing blast. One, two, three, one, two, three, and then it ceased. Mother, tell me what you think it is. You know, my Ina, that people have listened for it many times during ten years, yet heard it seldom. There are those who tell of the supernatural under the shadow of Mount Battery. But though strict search has been made for the hidden bell, you know it has never been found, though many believe its tongue to be a mouthpiece for the bushrangers. Don't trouble yourself about it, my love. It has ceased. Lie down again and calm yourself. I have not many days to live, said the poor girl as she fell back with a heavy sigh, but I would give them for one hour with our lost Ralph. Ina! It is true, mother. You would not have a dying child of yours lie. At his door lies my father's death, but he has a son yet to give you, to comfort you when I am gone, and God might touch his heart through my lips, weak as they are. Oh, mother, do not weep. It will break my heart. For the poor woman had laid her white face on the end of the couch and was sobbing convulsively. It will do me good, my Ina. I have not wept since he died. But, ah, what foolish hopes you are entertaining. Did not Ralph slay the son as he had slain the father? I feel sure my brother lives, Ina replied softly. When Ralph came and told that story of the overset boat, and poor Alroy being drowned, I knew that he was not telling the truth, though he laid Ally's wet hat in your lap. I saw the falsehood in his face. Ah, uh, I knew that face so well, mother. He stole our Alroy to be avenged on us for my sake. Alroy lives, I am sure of it and somehow I feel that he hears the bell of Mount Battery every time it tolls. "'God grant it be as you say,' the mother returned. "'But you must rest, Ina, my child. Be still and rest.' Ina closed her eyes and fell asleep, with a happy smile around her pale lips, a smile that brightened as she slept, for she dreamt that her lost brother came home, carrying in his arms the hidden bell of Mount Battery that rang joyously as he laid it at his mother's feet. The dying girl slept long and soundly, and her mother thought her own sad thoughts without a movement, fearing to arouse her from so sweet a rest. The fire had fallen to a mass of red embers, but she would not move to replenish it, and when, at length, the door opposite to her was softly opened, she raised her slender white hand with a hush of warning, believing it to be the privileged Marjorie. It was not Marjorie, however, for the tall figure of a bearded man, muffled in a heavy cloak, stepped in, and closed the door behind him. The idea of bushrangers was the first that suggested itself to Mrs. Vivian. They were reputed to have haunted the fastnesses of Mount Battery for years, 
though their exploits of robbery had been performed many miles away but mrs vivian was not afraid save for the helpless girl who slept unconscious of her danger she rose noiselessly and went to meet the cloaked man her steps falling soundless on the thick carpet if you are come on any evil errand i pray you do not disturb my child she will not be spared to me many days now she pleaded in a low voice i am not come on an evil errand mrs vivian do you not recognize me the cloak was permitted to drop from the lower part of his face and tempest the bush ranger stood revealed before the widow she drew back and raised a hand between her and the hateful sight how dare you come here ralph vivian how dare you venture under the roof which sheltered you and which you have bereaved father and son your wicked hands have cost me and now my daughter is going the last victim to your selfishness and pride go ere i curse you an inexplicable pain shadowed the dark countenance of the outlaw as his eyes fell upon the face of the sleeping ina and his voice was strangely soft as he replied you are hard on me but i can excuse that have you forgotten that the blow which betrayed you and made me a murderer in the sight of heaven made me a homeless man of blood and a friendless outlaw never friendless ralph my cousin i have always prayed for you god has answered my prayer in sending you here it was ina who spoke she had opened her eyes suddenly awake as by intuition when her wish was accomplished ralph rushed forward and knelt by her side i came to see you ina they told me you were dying oh say that it is not true it is true ralph and i do not regret it what has my life been but a long scene of pain and grief through me he gasped with a groan as he buried his face in his hand to shut out the sight of the death-like shadow in the face beneath him alas yes my cousin all through you not a voice has been lifted in your defence not even mine for how dare i plead for the hand that struck my darling father to death do not forget the provocation ina he pleaded once more lifting his eyes to hers or that i did not mean to kill him you know it maddened me to be denied you whom i had loved from very boyhood and to be called a gambler and a liar by the man in whose care a loving mother had left me when she died besides ina my uncle struck me i blush to own it even now before i lifted my hand struck me in the face we were man to man that was all i remembered as i returned it i know all that ralph but your blow cost me a parent and made mother a helpless and broken-hearted widow yet you have done us a greater wrong than even that ralph how but as he asked the question the cold dark eyes refused to meet those of the dying girl your own conscience accuses you what need is there for me to speak it is for this i have prayed to see you and for heaven to soften your hard heart towards yourself and us ralph my cousin what have you done with my brother alroy in her eagerness ina raised herself on her thin arms and anxiously watched the changing face of tempest the bushranger i know he is not dead i have felt it for years oh ralph was it not enough that you should avenge yourself by murder without taking from my mother her last child not her last ina you and the strong voice faltered as the hard heart felt one impress of remorse i am dying she interrupted and mother will be alone and you have half acknowledged the truth with that plea oh ralph if you are not utterly lost as you will meet death one day and hope for mercy yourself be merciful to us and give mother back her son the sight of her nephew is so unbearable to your mother that she has gone he said coldly as he rose to his feet if it was possible that your dead brother lived how could she endure the sight of one who had breathed the same air and shared the same roof as the man she falsely calls a murderer falsely ralph yes falsely even a cruel law does not brand a man as a murderer who returns one blow with another i might have been arraigned for manslaughter had my blow stricken your father dead but it did not he lay in his bed for weeks yet you say i killed him he forgave me but your mother with a vindictive cruelty that ought to have been bosomed in a savage hunted me with hounds of the law until i had to make my home in the wilds and forego the faces of my fellow men if i could by lifting this right hand bring her a dozen sons and daughters i would rather it withered than raise one finger 
the dying girl fell back on her pillows with a weak sigh of bitter disappointment and as the bushranger's arm was raised in the fierce declaration i have written down the mysterious bell of mount battery boomed out once more on the stormy night air of all the hundreds who heard it around the mountain there was not one did so without a start of surprise or terror and at its toll the arm of tempest fell to his side while an expression of listening surprise usurped the place of rage and determination in his face farewell ina i must go he said as he bent once more and took the thin fingers in his farewell grasp with you goes the last tie that yet binds me to life farewell for ever ralph may heaven grant you a change of heart and purpose ere you look on the face of death as closely as i do now see he said there is the little ring you gave me fifteen years ago it shall go with me to my grave farewell my lost love for ever scarcely had tempest the bushranger and the woman marjorie left the mount than the storm increased in intensity and the dark thunderclouds sent down heavy showers of cold rain that swept the tree-tops in wind-blown sheets peals of thunder rolled among the muffling clouds too here and there rent with fierce and terrible flushes of pale light snow and sunshine sat by the fire discussing their plans for the future and had been so engaged for some time ere the absence of rain was observed where is rain at last snow asked looking around the cave in his bunk to have his cry out i suspect sunshine replied laughingly no and snow shook his head i am grieved about that boy long as we have been together his character is a mystery to me and i fear sadly he has met with wrong at the hands of tempest yes did you see how he fired up to-night i am hanged if i thought twas him but here he comes for goodness sake where have you been rain the boy addressed descended the rude steps by means of which the dwellers in the cave emerged into the outer world with a lantern in his hand his face was white and ghastly his clothes glistening with raindrops and his fair hair blown in tangles over his forehead where have you been i followed him he said abstractedly as he set the lantern on the table somewhere down there where they are gone is my home and he knows where it is if he does not tell me i will tear the secret out of his treacherous heart sit down and dry yourself boy said snow as he made room for him by his side you have been brooding here for years until i am sadly afraid your mind is weakened what object could tempest have in hiding you here ay what object but he knows did you take the lantern out on the mount yes but it would not show me the way he knows every step in the dark i have never been down and must wait for day i shall find it in the day you did a foolish thing to take out the lantern you know the bell rock can be seen from the track it would be a pity if now that we have decided on abandoning this lawless life your carelessness should bring the police on us it was snow who spoke and he spoke anxiously while as if to confirm his fears the bell of the mount once again rang out suddenly it was this peal which tempest had heard at the lodge as he bade his cousin ina farewell for ever sunshine and snow and even rain started to their feet and looked anxiously toward the stairs what can it be it must be tempest sunshine said but snow shook his head tempest would not ring he whispered he might be wounded or hurt and unable to climb higher but still the sailor shook his head as he took a coat from a peg and hastily donned it i will go down and reconnoitre hark someone shouts hello hello was certainly being repeated at intervals outside as snow hurried up the stairs but are certainly not in the tones of their leader who could it be that in the darkness and storm had discovered the secret of the bell snow carried no light and the darkness on the mount was so intense that he could not have seen a lifted hand before his face but the way was familiar to him each step of the rocky descent having been trodden by him during many a night of darkness before on this particular night however the storm was such that as he turned the corner of that plateau with the steep rocky face where tempest had previously met the woman marjorie the wind almost carried him off his feet until he had gained the shelter of a boulder here he paused and listened when the hello help here was repeated almost at his ear who is it needs help snow shouted 
However has a human being gained this elevation in this darkness and storm? You may well ask, replied the voice of a man. I don't know where I am, or how I got here, but it seems to me that I have travelled in such paths as few men have trodden before me. Surely you can give me shelter of some kind until the day breaks. Something in the tones of the speaker fell upon Snow's ears with a shock of surprise that was stronger than the staggering wind, and he did not instantly reply. "'Why don't you speak?' the stranger went on anxiously. "'You would not refuse the shelter of your roof to a dog on such a night, and there must be a habitation of some kind about. Or whence the bell? I am able to pay you for any trouble I may give you, though I do not carry about me sufficient to tempt any one to commit a robbery.' What could Snow do? If the voice was that he fancied he recognised, he would no more turn him away than he would put a knife in his own heart. Yet there was Tempest. What would he say to a stranger being entrusted with the secret of the cave, which had been so long a safe hiding-place? "'As you say,' he replied at last, "'it would be inhuman to refuse shelter on such a night as this, and so far from human habitation. Yet there are grave difficulties in the way.' I can judge from your language that you are a gentleman. Will you give me your word not to reveal to mortal the shelter I can give you if you are admitted to it? Ah, I am among lawless men, then. Yes, of course. I shall willingly give my word of honour to retain your secret. I am incapable of that ingratitude which stings the hand outstretched to assist. Give me your hand and follow carefully. And with the stranger's hand held closely in his, Snow remounted the dangerous footway, almost in the very teeth of the fierce, recurrent blasts that battled with them for every step. In the shelter of the rock passage, leading to the stairs, he paused and let the traveller's hand go. "'If you will stop here for a moment, it will be better,' he said. "'I must intimate the presence of a stranger to my mates.' And he quickly descended into the cave, leaving the gentleman in the sheltered darkness. "'Boys, it is a traveller who has lost his way, and I have brought him up,' he said. "'Up here?' exclaimed Sunshine. "'Why, you must be mad. What will Tempest say? You know he warned us that he might yet be glad of our hiding-place, though the band was broken up.' "'Sunshine, I know this stranger. I recognised his voice at once. He has given me his word of honour not to disclose anything we wish concealed, and one of his name never lied. My lad—' It is Captain Ingersoll. Captain Ingersoll? Oh, Snow, what shall we do? Nothing. Let us wait the course of events. Only be cautious. Even if we are recognised, you, at least, are safe. I would not accept a safety which did not include you, Snow, the lad said with a strange haughtiness, which Snow detected and seemed to admire, as an unusual smile brightened his placid face. Hush, I must go and bring in the wayfarer. Hark! What a wretched night to be without even the shelter of a cave! Rain had listened to this exchange of words in silent wonder, and watched with an unusual interest the descent of the unknown into the cave, which had been his home for ten weary years. Sunshine's face flushed hotly as he stood where he was, too proud to seek another position where he might have been less under the eyes of the man his friend had called Captain Ingersoll. But when the traveller stood before the fire, and shook the wet from his dripping hat, Snow turned slightly, so that his lean profile was only to be seen in the red firelight, and leaned one shoulder against the rough rock wall of the cave. The captain was a fine-looking man of about forty, in a riding costume with the addition of a loose overcoat, which had alone prevented his being thoroughly drenched by the rain he had encountered. His whiskers were slightly tinged with grey, his hair light brown. Even amid the discomfort, Consequent on his wretched personal discomfort, there was a sunny look of pleasant content in his handsome face, and a softness, not to say weakness, in the expression of his grey eyes. As Snow, still wrapped in the great coat and wearing his hat low, helped to divest his guest of the damp attire and replace it with dry articles from his own wardrobe, the gentleman gave some little explanation of his strange position. I reached S. on my way to Quaramba at noon today just too late for the coach, and finding no vehicle procurable, I determined to hire a horse and ride, my time being limited. Well, somehow or other, I got off the track under the mountain here, and when the fury of the storm broke, I dismounted with the intention of putting myself and the animal under the shelter of a rock. 
The result was he broke from me and bolted at the next flash of lightning. I don't know what I should have done had I not seen your light up on the face of the mount and made my way toward it desperately. By the way, was it you who rang that bell? No. You must have rung it yourself by accidental pressure in your scramble, Snow returned gravely. It has been a secret signal of our leaders, and we have your word of honour that it as such shall be kept by you. Certainly. Ah, it is the mystery bell of Mount Battery, then. You have heard of it. I have heard it once before tonight. I am captain of the ship Argonaut, and was up at Quarumba about six years ago to see my sister, Mrs. Vivian of the Lodge. I remember hearing it ascribed to supernatural influences. The Lodge? The exclamation was from Rain, to whom the name on that envelope, given him by the woman Marjorie, was of the deepest interest. Captain Ingersoll turned and looked toward the youth, who had seated himself near the table, and was leaning his elbow on it, and the look became a gaze of such intensity that the eyes of both snow and sunshine followed the stranger's. "'Who is this youth?' the traveller questioned. "'Surely I have seen him before.' "'Never, unless you have stood in this cave before,' said Rain. "'I have lived here for ten years. Thank heaven this is my last night in a place accursed of God and man.' Captain Ingersoll looked wonderingly, yet with genuine pity at the excited young speaker, and was about to speak when Snow put into his hand a glass of warm spirit to prevent any bad effects from his cold and wetting. Perhaps the simple act of hospitality recalled to his memory his promise to keep the secrets of his shelter to himself, or was it the sight of Snow's face that diverted his thoughts into a fresh channel? Snow had removed hat and coat, and stood before him calmly, with his usual face of thoughtful inscrutability. The stranger nearly dropped the glass he had just drained as he rose to his feet, "'Surely I must be dreaming,' he cried. "'All your faces are familiar to me. "'Why, you are John Caron, my lost mate.' "'Yes, and a deserter from the Argonaut. "'And this, heaven have mercy upon my senses, "'is this Percy Ingersoll?' "'Sunshine hung his head for a moment "'as the hot flush mounted to the roots of his fair curls, "'but in an instant after he lifted it defiantly to reply. "'Yes,' A deserter, too, from your Argonaut. Oh, foolish boy, for what? Have you never given one pitying thought to the poor father who so loved you, and who charged me, your uncle, with the safe keeping of his only son? What could I tell him when he asked me for the truth, that his son was a deserter from his ship, and a dishonour to his name? I have no name, the youth cried, and I do not claim yours. I am Sunshine, one of Bushranger Tempest's gang, and if you or my father do not own such relative, I do not ask you for a name. When you have been sheltered from the storm and fed, you can go and carry your news to England. Captain Ingersoll fell into his seat and buried his face in his hands, while Snow spoke firmly to the ill-disciplined youth beside him. Hush, Snow, do not add ingratitude to our other sins. And you, Captain Ingersoll, be lenient with the lad, for mine was most of the blame. I was stricken with the accursed gold fever and infected the lad. We were both mad, but I most of all. And the madness has cost me my own self-respect, a thing of more value to me than my prospects in life. I cannot plead for myself, but I can for the lad, Captain Ingersoll. The gang is disbanded. Take him with you ere it be too late, and let, at least, his share in my fault be forgotten. What do you mean by too late? the stranger asked quickly, as he raised his face. If you are released from your late career of crime against the laws, what do you mean by too late? I mean that we do not know, and have not known for years, the moment the police may be on our track. From their hands it would be too late to rescue your nephew. Let us go this instant, cried Ingersoll, rising to his feet and rapidly beginning to resume his own wet clothes that were smoking before the fire. If you, Percy Ingersoll, have one sense of duty left. Get ready to leave with me at once. You too, Caron. We will talk of it afterwards. But this young man, whose face is like an old dream to me, who is he? An innocent and unwilling member of our band, to whom our leader has done some great wrong. You will come with us, Rain, Snow asked. No, I will not go with you. I shall stay until Tempest returns, and wring the truth from him, or he dies. 
why should every one but me have friends and a name i have neither i shall wait for tempest in vain snow and the now subdued sunshine tried to argue and plead nothing but force could have removed the excited and vehement youth who with his usually pale face flushed with fever and his eyes flashing with fierce determinations repeated his declaration i will not go i will wait for tempest i am here rain what do you want of me every eye turned toward the late leader as he descended the steps and stood upon the floor of the cavern his face was haggard his tones low his air depressed and gloomy as he found his way in darkness and storm to his hiding place among the rocks at mount battery he had met death face to face in the seldom failing prescience of one over the thread of whose fate the scissors of atropos was suspended the fierce blasts that met him were unheard and almost unfelt he was in the summer of his youth at his fair cousin ina's feet with a love so untouched by sin in his innocent heart that it had survived to save him now at the dark river he was about to launch on what he had refused to the dying girl's faltering plea he granted now to the memory of a pale face he would never see again and the fond throbs of a heart that would soon cease to beat i am here rain what do you want of me what have you robbed me of i want the home and friends you stole from me i know you did the memory of a woman's face haunts me in my dreams who was that woman but my mother you have called me rain because my heart would not cicatrise but yielded pained blood at every fresh touch of your cruel tongue but i have another name what is it bushranger tempest tempest looked pityingly at the pale face of his ten years victim as he said softly poor lad and then he turned to captain ingersoll who watched him curiously and closely as he questioned is my face familiar to you captain ingersoll it seems so but i appear to be in a dream this boy's face seems familiar also who are you and who is he if you have done him wrong let your conscience plead for him disentangle him from your hideous life and restore him to the friends and home he dreams of i am going to do so look at me captain ingersoll i am ralph vivian it is a name that makes you shudder the love of one fair woman has brought me to this that woman was your niece and my cousin ina vivian what provocation i receive i leave you to learn too late but go now ina is dying go and take her brother alroy vivian to his mother as tempest concluded he laid his hand on rain's shoulder there alroy i have given you back your home and your name this is your uncle sunshine is your cousin your mother and sister await you with loving hearts if you will sometimes remember tempest forgivingly it will do you no harm and now go at once all of you i have had certain intelligence that the police are on our track and the locality of the cave discovered but you tempest we cannot leave you here snow said you look ill how can we desert you you must go when they come i shall be far away shake hands snow you know there is no blood stain there farewell farewell sunshine my lad god bless your happy heart captain ingersoll take them away ere it be too late his father's eyes look out of that boy's face and reproach me he sat down upon the seat he had occupied when dividing the spoil and three untouched little heaps of gold lay on the table where he folded his arms as a resting place for his head for a moment the pale face of the bewildered rain was turned toward his late leader and then the boy advanced softly to the table and laid sovereign by sovereign the fourth heap of gold again upon the table then he went quickly up the steps without looking back he was the first who left the cave ralph said the captain it is my duty to see to the safety of my nephew but i do not forget yours are you certain that you can yourself assure it quite certain was the murmured reply but tempest never raised his head or face from his arms I must go with my uncle sunshine whispered softly good-bye tempest but some day we shall meet again i always liked you tempest and some day i shall find you out again now the white face was lifted and tempest's eyes looked sadly into his favourite mates yes some day he said as he pressed the young firm hand only i pray god it may be long first my boy farewell snow was the last 
I have no friends, Tempest. Come with me. It would be folly to stay here if the cave is discovered. Let you and I seek safety together. It cannot be. Go and forget you have ever seen me, Snow. Thanks for your faithfulness, but it cannot be. I must finish my course alone. You are not contemplating suicide, Tempest, Snow asked. You would not be such a coward as that. No, I shall not do myself that crowning wrong, but I am ill, mate. There's a clutch at my heart that tightens. My race is nearly run. Go, my friend. To satisfy yourself, you may tell Marjorie at the lodge to come to me if you will. Farewell, Snow. And fully determined to return at all risks, Snow was the last who mounted to the outer air of the night. A storm had passed as Sunshine led their silent way down the mount, after a few words of explanation from the captain. Their destination was the lodge at Quarumba, and as they reached the more level ground, nothing was left of the wildness of early night, save the broken hurrying clouds over the face of a cold moon, and the moan of dying winds among the tossing branches of dripping trees. When Snow's form disappeared from the steps of the cave, Tempest's head fell once more upon his arms. The great fire fell in, blazed up, and dropped into a heap of glowing embers, and the natural damp of the cavern asserted itself as the dying heat gathered around the dying fire. Outside the clouds passed one by one, and left the cold moon's face unveiled, while the sighing wind barely rustled the trailing lichens on the Mount Battery rocks. The oil in the huge lamp burned low, and the shaded gleam flickered on the little heaps of gold and the disordered hair of the silent bushranger, who sat so still and heeded none of his silent surroundings. Did the lonely man think of his wasted life and the wrong he had done to his fellow men? Did the face of his dead uncle reproach him, or the bitter words of his widowed aunt make the end hard to bear? Or was Ina's face as he knew it ten years ago, and Ina's voice and loving words as he had heard it in his happy youth, the last of his memories ere he slept? Who can answer? Even I, who wander invisibly on the wings of imagination, can only tell that hours had passed, and morning was drawing near greyly, when suddenly, in deep reverberations, the strong tones of the hidden bell rang through the cave, not one, two, three, but a jubilant, continuous peal that ceased as suddenly as it had begun. Then the white, awful face of a dying man was slightly lifted, and a faint smile struggled with the growing stiffness upon his drawn lips. "'The bell of Mount Battery,' he murmured. "'Ina will hear that, and pray for Ralph.' And then the white face was hidden again. Yes, Ina heard it. She was lying on the couch where her cousin had left her, with her head on her mother's breast, and one hand of her recovered brother Alroy's in her nerveless clasp. Marjorie was weeping silently at the head of the couch. Captain Ingersoll and Snow stood at a little distance in sympathetic silence. Ina's eyes were closed. Her breath was low, but she murmured softly, "'I do not leave you alone, dear mother. You have Alroy.' And then came the sudden peal of the mountain bell, a long and joyous peal, ere it was silent for ever. "'The bell of Mount Battery!' the dying girl cried as she opened her eyes. May God pity and forgive poor Ralph. And then the soft eyes closed for ever also. Well, no policeman after all discovered the bushranger's well-hidden cave. It was Snow and Marjorie who, at early dawn, stole again up the mountain and found Tempest sitting as Snow had left him, but cold and dead. Had an inquest been held on the poor remains, there would have been a verdict of heart disease. But no inquest was held, and no one, save Marjorie and Snow, knew the place of his grave. They laid him softly on the sandy floor of the cave, where he doubtless sleeps well and untouched by the finger of the outraged law. Snow, as he walks the quarter-deck of Captain Percy Ingersoll's, late sunshine, ship, often thinks of tempest, and on stormy nights when the ship's two bells is rung out in the darkness, sunshine is reminded of the mountain bell, and will speak of it to his lieutenant. Do you think it is true that, as Alroy tells us, the bell is still heard when the night is dark and the winds blow? And Snow shakes his head at the superstitious belief, for he knows that with his own hand he broke the spring of the bell of Mount Battery, and let it fall into its rocky bed, where it may be rusting in silent decay to the present day. Rain and his mother have left Coromba, and found a home in England, where the faithful Marjorie is their right hand, 
but Alroy never fully got over the effects of ten years' crushing loneliness. He is still a moody and melancholy young man, with the impressions of his youth so strong upon him that he often starts from sleep at the fancied sound of the mountain bell, with cold dew on his face and the flutter of fear at his heart. End of story.